Part two, chapter twenty three of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty three The Crusades, AD ten ninety six to twelve seventy. The origin of the Crusades is to be found in the occupation of Palestine by the Mohammedan conquerors. The pilgrims from Europe cherished the warmest attachment to the sacred places. The Mohammedans not only now occupied them, but persecuted the pilgrims. The sanctuaries were profaned, and the venerated patriarchs thrown into prison. Christian merchants from Pisa, Amalfi, Genoa, and other rich Italian ports were fortunate if they escaped with their lives. The evil reports came back to Europe, and took practical form in military expeditions against the Mohammedans. These were called crusades because of the cross, crux, worn by the warriors. Peter the Hermit was the apostle of the first crusade. Pope Gregory the Seventh was the first, it is believed, who conceived the idea of sending from Europe an armed expedition, not only to punish the Mohammedan rulers, but to occupy the country and rule it as a Christian nation. His successors, Victor the Third and Urban the Second, indulged the same strong hope. All that was wanting was a popular leader, someone to fire the heart of Christian Europe. This man was Peter the Hermit. He had been a soldier under the Counts of Boulogne, but forsook his military career, made a journey to Palestine, and saw the indignities suffered by the pilgrims. Here he was aroused to great enthusiasm in favor of the conquest of the country by Christians from Europe. To Simeon, the patriarch of Jerusalem, who was comparatively helpless, the eastern emperor not being able to do anything for the Christians, Peter said, The nations of the West shall take up arms in your cause. Peter was true to his pledge. He returned to Europe, traveled through the German countries, and roused the people to a frenzy of indignation against the Moslem faith. He presented a singular spectacle. He was a dwarf, wore neither shoes nor hat, and rode through central Europe on an ass. His appeals were irresistible. The multitudes regarded him as the representative of a holy cause, and through him organized the First Crusade. The varied fortunes of the Crusades furnish a striking historical picture. We find a rich combination of light and shade. Peter the Hermit and Walter the Penniless were the humble organizers of the great movement. Some military leaders rallied to their standard. The best blood of Europe was burning with sympathy with Christians in their aspirations to kneel beside the Holy Sepulchre at Jerusalem and rule over the land in which Jesus had lived. Six different armies constituted the First Crusade. They numbered 600,000 people, who were led by Godfrey, Hugh the Great, Tanered, Raymond of Toulouse, and Robert of Normandy. This crusade, begun in 1096, resulted in the capture of Jerusalem within two years, with Godfrey of Bouillon as king of the sacred city. The next crusade was on a still more magnificent scale. The kingdom of Jerusalem was threatened. St. Bernard was the apostle. The kings became leaders. Louis the Seventh of France and Conrad the Third of Germany led 1,200,000 men against the Saracens. The great object was to reduce Damascus as a support to the kingdom of Jerusalem. It was a failure, and only the mere fragments of the armies reached Europe again. Saladin, the great Mohammedan chief, conquered Jerusalem in 1187, and this was the signal for a new attempt to rescue the holy city and the entire country. Germany under Frederick Barabosa, France under Philip Augustus, and England under Richard Cour de Leon, united in a great crusade. This was a failure because of division among the leaders, but they succeeded in gaining from Saladin one concession, namely the freedom of Christians from taxes and from molestation in visiting the sacred city. A fourth crusade, begun by the Knights of St. John, proved a failure. The Children's Crusade, organized in 1212, 
shows the extent to which the wild fanaticism of the times could go. Thirty thousand boys, united under the leadership of a shepherd boy, Stephen of Vendome, set sail from Marseilles for Palestine. Some of the vessels were wrecked, while the rest were driven ashore on the Egyptian coast, where the deluded boys were sold as slaves. The Sixth Crusade, under the direction of Frederick II of Germany, proved a success. Palestine was ceded to the emperor and became a Christian land. The Seventh Crusade lost all that the preceding had won. The Mohammedans recaptured the country. The Last Crusade was under the guidance of Louis IX of France, commonly called Saint Louis, because of his deep piety and high moral principle. Kebel, in his Christian Year, thus describes him. Where shall the Holy Cross find rest? On a crowned monarch's mailed breast. Like some bright angel o'er the darkling scene, through court and camp he holds his heavenward course serene. After his death, Edward I of England took the leadership. But this crusade also was a hopeless failure. The land was in undisputed possession of the Mohammedans. Europe was exhausted. The cause was lost. While the direct object of the crusades was not gained, there were important indirect results. First of all, it is likely that but for this important diversion to the Moslem conquerors, they would have invaded Europe in such vast masses as to gain a permanent foothold. The bravery of the Christians, their ungovernable enthusiasm, and their self-denial, as shown in the Crusades, proved to the Mohammedans the character of the foe with which they had to deal. They found that the Western and Northern Christians were far different from those populations of the Eastern Empire which they had easily conquered. The Crusades, with all their waste of men and treasure, seem to have saved France and central Germany and Scandinavia, and even Britain, from the hand of the Saracen. They arrested him, held him at bay, and inspired in him a healthy terror of the Christian soldier from which he has never been relieved. The positive benefits of the Crusades towards the development of the people are numerous. The old feudal system of private warfare had long been a curse to the empire. The knight, with his retainers, could make war on his brother knight. All of Central and Western Europe was torn up by this feudal and predatory system. The Crusades broke it up, and bound the people together by a common law. When the last crusader came home from Palestine, he found himself the member of a broad commonwealth, and not the head of a clan. The cruelty of rulers was arrested. The voice of the people was heard for the first time, and kings learned that there was a limit to their authority. Commerce took larger and freer shape. The far eastern countries were brought into close relationship with the western. Some new sciences, such as medicine and astronomy, were introduced into Europe. As a field for literature, the Crusades have inspired many writers in all subsequent times. As an aid for comprehending their spirit and the age in which they were organized, we may reckon Sir Walter Scott's novels, The Talisman, The Betrothed, and Count Robert of Paris, the scenes of which were laid in those heated times. End of chapter 23Part 2, Chapter 24 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 24 Arabic Philosophy. The literature of the Arabs developed in an extraordinary manner during the 11th and 12th centuries. With the 13th century, it went into decline. There was a strong bond of unity between the Jew and the Arab. They were both alike hostile to Christianity, and the monotheism of the Jewish system was a fundamental factor in the Mohammedan creed. When the Arabs conquered Spain, they gave prompt attention to education. The universities of Cordova, Seville, Toledo, and Salamanca became, through them, centers of thought, which affected not only the whole Iberian Peninsula, but extended to the remotest learned circles of Europe. 
the Aristotelian philosophy was particularly attractive to them. The Arab scholars caught up its threads, interwove them with their own oriental speculations, and produced a system of dialectics which Christian scholars were not slow to utilize. The Platonic system, with its warmth, had also its charm, and was interpreted with great vigor and skill. Algazel, who died in 1127 in Baghdad, was a learned Arab who gave proof of the speculative power of the Arab mind, even without the quickening influence of contact with European thought. In his Destruction of the Philosophers, he showed the glaring inconsistencies of philosophical systems, vindicated supernaturalism, and defended the inspiration of the Koran. His work was a skillful putting of the Mohammedan case, perhaps as plausible a plea for it as has ever been made. The Spanish transplantation of Arab speculation is to be found in the work of Top Hale, who died in Seville in 1190. In his Life of a Young Yokdan, he undertakes to show that true philosophy is not the product of education, nor of any force from the external world, but of an effort of the mind from its own resources. Averhoes, who died in 1198, by some in 1206, was the most gifted of all the Arab thinkers resident in Spain. He wrote against Algazel's work, calling his own book The Destruction of the Destruction of the Philosophers. He brought the Arab speculation out of the narrow affiliations with the Mohammedan system, and gave it a universal application. He held that true religion and a thoroughly logical speculation belong together, for the reason that the divine and human reason are naturally united. At the same time, he held that an affirmative might be theologically true and philosophically false, and vice versa. He was strongly opposed by Aquinas, and he was generally regarded with suspicion. His theories were provocative of skepticism. He expounded the philosophy of Aristotle and gave it a Neoplatonic coloring. His system was a grouping of the better elements in both Plato and Aristotle. The systems of Christian scholasticism were based largely on his speculations. End of chapter 24「Part two, Chapter twenty five of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty five The Hohenstaufens in Italy. The Italian rule of the Hohenstaufens is one of the most romantic episodes in European history. Frederick I, otherwise called Frederick Barbarossa, or the Red Beard, was a man of remarkable genius. Since the time of Charlemagne, he was the most gifted occupant of the German imperial throne. He sought, at the expenditure of much blood and treasure, to restore the imperial power over the Lombard cities. His whole aim was to crush out the uprisings of Italian freedom. He had fierce conflicts with the popes over his rights in Italy. He was a man of earnest piety, and he finally became a martyr to the deliverance of the Holy Sepulchre. He was drowned in the Caliadnus in Cilicia, 1190, while leading one of the armies of the Third Crusade. His son Henry married Constance, heiress of the Norman kingdom of Lower Italy and Sicily, often called the Two Sicilies. Thus the Hohenstaufen scepter shadowed the whole of Italy. Twice this Henry the sixth, 1190-97, tried to conquer this inheritance for himself. After several vicissitudes, his son, Frederick II, was crowned emperor at Aix la chapelle in 1215. On account of his extraordinary attainments and fine natural gifts, he was called the wonder of the world. He was far ahead of his time in the liberality of his sentiments, he gave profound attention to his dominions in Sicily. He had advised the settlement there of a colony of Saracens. The little affair was an outgrowth of the Crusades. Here he had a small army which stood ready to defend his cause. 
when he was crowned at Aix la chapelle he took upon himself the vow of the crusader his wife iolante was heiress of the crown of jerusalem and in twelve twenty eight he set sail for palestine here he was crowned king of jerusalem his possessions in italy were meanwhile in danger of being blotted out through the vigorous management of pope gregory the ninth gregory had excommunicated him ostensibly for delaying his departure for palestine but really as we believe to make him so unpopular with his people in the kingdom of the two sicilies that his rule could be terminated but here gregory failed he was compelled to acknowledge frederick as rightful ruler over the two sicilies however the struggles between frederick and the popes continued from year to year the popes used their utmost influence to weaken the force of the emperor not only among his sicilian subjects but in germany as well the fall of the hohenstaufens in sicily was only a question of time when frederick died the case was hopeless pope innocent the fourth declared that sicily was really a part of the states of the church and so took possession of it conrad the fourth left germany to take care of itself and undertook to regain the hold on sicily conrad died before the struggle was over and his son conradin found not only a slender hold on sicily but simply a mere tithe of the ancestral possessions in germany as his inheritance at first manfred a natural son of frederick took possession of the two sicilies and held them against the forces and manipulation of the roman pope what should the popes now do they followed one another in rapid succession but each one kept a careful eye on sicily they gave up the struggle at last because of the fidelity of the sicilies to the hohenstaufens and sold their alleged right to the sicilies first to england and then to france pope clement the fourth aided charles of anjou to take possession of the sicilian kingdom charles was crowned king after the battle of benevento in twelve sixty six when manfred was slain conradin now came down from swabia and appeared upon the scene he was defeated in the battle of tagliacoso and taken prisoner and put to death in twelve sixty eight this put an end to the german rule south of the alps the popes were once more at ease so far as italy was concerned it had been a bitter struggle though their rule was restored the intense hostility which it had engendered on the part of germany did not die out the german rulers never forgot the affair and in the later centuries lost no opportunity to put their bitter memories in practical form against the papacy it was well however for the future unification of italy that the progress towards nationality was not complicated by the presence of germany on her soil in their opposition to the hohenstaufens the popes were working for a higher end than they had in mind end of chapter twenty five part two chapter twenty six of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty six the jewish philosophy the development of jewish speculation was contemporaneous with the arabic being confined to the eleventh and twelfth centuries it was the old neoplatonism of alexandria coming to life again and reappearing with intense vigor in spain there was no special attachment to the old testament but a gathering into one of the various threads of plato and other greek thinkers and their interweaving with jewish theology the result was a heterogeneous theology made up of the old testament scriptures and the philosophical systems but with a warm sympathy with mohammedanism it was of so complex a nature that neither moses plato nor mohammed would have recognized himself in any one of its fundamental principles grammatical exegesis was one of the main departments of jewish philosophy the leading representatives were solomon isaaci of troyes aben ezra of toledo and the three kamehi of narbonne 
These men flourished between A.D. 1075 and 1232. There was nothing brilliant in the achievements of any of them, or of those who imitated them. But their critical tastes and the application of exact methods to the expounding of the scriptures were of great influence upon Christian scholars. There is reason to suppose that this school of Jewish thinkers, though far removed from the great centers of Christian learning, were influential on the later rise of humanism and the general awakening of a taste for the philological examination of the scriptural languages. Philosophical speculation was the other wing of the Jewish eagle in the medieval period. Here the Jewish thinker dwelt with greatest pleasure. His field was broad. All systems and lands were combined. Christianity, Greek philosophy, and Mohammedanism were a confused molten mass. These elements produced the later Kabbalism. Jehuda Levi of Andalusia, died 1153, had less sympathy with other systems than with the Jewish. His Book of Kosi was a romance. It represents a king of the Kosarians and a rabbi, Isaac Sanger, who conduct a dialogue. The outcome is a vindication of the Jewish religion. It is one of the ablest defenses of Judaism ever written. It has been translated into several languages and has been circulated in modern times. Its author was the greatest Jewish poet of the Middle Ages, and father-in-law of the greatest grammarian, Aben Ezra. Jehuda Levi was at once a poet, philosopher, and scholar. Maimonides was the most gifted Jew of the whole medieval period. He stands related to Jewish speculation, as Averroes does to Arabic, each supreme in his own field. There was a close bond of sympathy between them, the Jew was a disciple of the Arab. Maimonides was born in 1135 in Cordova. He mastered the Greek and Arabic systems of philosophy, and became an industrious author and profound thinker in many fields. Besides his devotion to philosophy, he was skilled in mathematics, astronomy, medicine, and Talmudic lore. He was an earnest and serious moral and religious character. His works were very numerous, in both Arabic and Hebrew. But his most influential book was of popular character, The Guide to the Perplexed. It was a well-planned attempt to reconcile Jewish theology and heathen philosophy. It has exercised a powerful influence on that liberal development of Judaism which has had such scope in modern times. End of chapter 26part 2 chapter 27 of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 27 the scholastic philosophy scholasticism derived its name from the monastic and catholic schools scholi it was a system of philosophy which emanated from these schools and gave color to the thought of europe from the 10th century down to the 16th it was based on the dialectics of Aristotle, and aimed to prove the truth of Christianity by the process of logic. Its history was varied. At one time, scholasticism was skeptical, refusing to admit as truth what could not be proven by dialectics. Again it became orthodox, and was a stout defender of the supernatural element. In the 13th century it reached its highest stage. Mysticism appeared in the 12th century as the competitor of scholasticism for the attention and endorsement of Christian thinkers. The two represented opposite tendencies. Scholasticism declared that the intellect must be umpire of truth, while mysticism held that the feelings are our highest judge of the truth. Scholasticism was to the Middle Ages what rationalism is to the modern period, what cannot be proved must not be believed. Mysticism bore to the same period the relation which Schleiermacher's philosophy of religion does to the German theology of the present century. The heart is the seat of all true theology. 
scholasticism had but slight bearing on the great spiritual movement which culminated in the reformation while the mystics were among the most powerful agents in preparing the way for luther the nominalists held that general conceptions such as man horse and the like are abstractions of the intellect derived from the properties of the intellect and possessing no existence beyond the intellect that they are logical conveniences of expression nominam mera voces nudi flatus voces mere names simple sounds the breath of the voice the system has its modern supporters in hobbes berkeley hume adam smith stuart and hamilton the realists held that general conceptions have an existence beyond the mere intellect of man that such general terms as man horse and the like have a real existence apart from the manifestations to our senses the nominalist believed for example that taking man as a general conception quote, humanity existed only in socrates plato phaedo and other individuals that the term was only an intellectual device for indicating the common properties characteristic of socrates plato and phaedo by giving them the general name man and thus embracing them in one class end quote the realist on the other hand believed that quote, before socrates plato and phaedo or any other individual man existed man as an abstract idea had an essential and immutable reality and that socrates plato and phaedo were men solely in consequence of possessing this ideal manhood end quote. between these two classes the nominalists and the realists the whole scholastic system was divided. Fulbert, who was Bishop of Chartres after 1007, was the first notable schoolman. His disciple, Berengar of Tours, started a controversy on the Lord's Supper. He held that the elements were changed, that Christ's body is present, but only in the form of bread and wine, and not in substance. The participant must have faith, for by this alone can the elements become effective. Berengar was opposed by Lanfran, whose views were condemned by the church at the Synod of Rome, 1050. Anselm, in his Why the God-Man, held that Christ made an active, vicarious sacrifice for the sins of the world. But Anselm does not declare that Christ endured the actual punishment for men's sins abelard represented the critical and sceptical element in scholasticism as to the schools he was a nominalist rather than a realist bernard arrayed himself against abelard and triumphed a modern compromise was effected between mysticism and scholasticism by peter lombard but the elements were too antagonistic to be of large or permanent influence the thomists and scotists were two culminating schools within the broad domain of scholasticism. Thomas Aquinas, the Dr. Angelicus of his age, taught in the University of Paris and died in the Cistercian convent of Fosca Nuova, near Terracina, in 1274. His summary of theology was an attempt to represent theology as a complete science. He held that revelation is necessary that the knowledge of God is, in a measure, intuitive in man, that redemption is relatively, not absolutely, necessary, and that baptism has regenerative power. He claimed that true theology is derived from the union of religion and philosophy. His system represented the orthodox element of the scholastic philosophy. The Scotists derived their name from the founder, John Duns Scotus, the doctor subtilis of his time he died 1308 while aquinas represented the augustinian theology and was a defender of the established doctrines of the church duns scotus followed in the footsteps of pelagius and represented the free-thinking wing of scholasticism he held that by our natural powers we can know the trinity that it was god's own good pleasure that there should be a redemption through christ but that God does not command good and forbid evil, because they are good and evil, 
they are good and evil because he has commanded and forbidden nothing is sinful or righteous in itself duns scotus gives large place to human merit after the semi-pelagian example johnson in his english dictionary suggests that our word dunce is derived from duns an achievement of his opponents the thomists raymond lully died thirteen fifteen was called by his contemporaries the doctor illuminatus he saw in the course of scholasticism only injury to the general cause of truth and aimed at a thorough reform he devised a plan for teaching the truths of the gospel and called his method the ars magna or great art he used certain letters to represent certain ideas his plan was a mechanical one and was designed not only to retain knowledge but to prove the truths of christianity he endeavored to construct a universal science which would prove an irresistible argument for christianity to heathen minds but he misconceived the emptiness of scholasticism and he could never get the church to carry out his projects he was of devout spirit and led a pure life neander says of him that he possessed the enthusiasm of a most fervent love to god a zeal equally intense for the cause of faith and the interests of reason and science lully had a consuming ambition for the conversion of the mohammedans and heathen and it was while preaching against islam in bugia a town in algiers that he was stoned out of the city by the arabs and left dying on the seashore he was picked up by a pious sea captain but on a june day thirteen fifteen he sealed with his death the great idea of his life to conquer islam not by the sword but by preaching some clear thinkers seeing no prospect of advantage to the church from the scholastics declared for the teaching of religion by the scriptures and not by pagan dialectics roger bacon of oxford died twelve ninety four held that the only relief from the wretched quibbles of the speculations of the times lay in a thorough study of the word of god robert founder of the sorbonne in paris wrote in defence of the same necessity for a close study of the written word hugo asanto caro died twelve sixty three likewise insisted on the study of the bible as the only solution for the evils of the times he wrote a postilla or commentary and concordance of the biblical books to him we owe the present division into chapters and verses the philosophic strife of the times had long been bitter and productive of little good both the nominalist and the realist had sought to find in the ancient philosophy some support but had leaned on a broken reed the air was filled with war cries the universities fought each other with a spirit not less hostile than that of the crusader when he marched to the rescue of the holy sepulchre heated authors hurled books and pamphlets at each other with relentless fury towns and villages circles of the learned and the ignorant and court and camp were divided by bitter quarrels on the force of logical definitions not since the theological controversies of the fourth century had europe seen such a picture of the warfare of syllables the only relief to the waste of words lay in the fact that it gave proof of the awakening of the european mind even scholasticism was better than inertia in time it had done its work luther with his strong broom swept away the thick mass of aristotelian dialectics and sowed instead the seeds of christian doctrine End of chapter 27part two chapter twenty eight of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty eight abelard and his fortunes of all the leaders in the great scholastic movement there is no one to whom so great a personal interest attaches as to abelard ten seventy nine to eleven forty two he gave promise at an early age of the remarkable abilities which distinguished his entire career 
and attracted the profound attention of all Europe. His first plan for life seems to have been the career of a soldier, but he soon devoted himself to theological studies, and here achieved such success as to astound alike his preceptors and companions. He left his home, where he had enjoyed the teaching of the famous Roscalin of Compiègne, and repaired to Paris. William of Champeaux was at this time at the head of an abbey of St. Victor, which he himself had founded, and stood in the front of the theological and philosophical movement which had concentrated in that city. He was the first to give to the schools of Paris a university character, and to admit the laity as well as the clergy, and foreigners as well as natives, to the privileges of the highest education within the walls of a school of the church. His liberal movement in this direction was the death knell of exclusionism in education, and the real preparation for the recognition, in all later time, of the rights of the poorest and humblest to all the wealth of science. Abelard placed himself under the charge of William, and developed with amazing rapidity. But in two years' time the young student differed so essentially from his master that he broke off his connection, and established the Abbey of St. Genevieve close beside his master's renowned Abbey of St. Victor. Abelard emptied the walls of St. Victor. The multitudes gathered about him. The eloquence with which he taught, the mastery of language, the skill in logic, and the magnetism of his personality, attracted a constantly increasing audience. To the multitudes who came from various countries, all Paris was as nothing. He was the one man for whose wisdom and example students from all parts of France, England, Spain, and even Rome itself, had come with eager search. The success of his teaching, and the decline of William's school through that success, awakened the opposition not only of William, but of his friends and sympathizers. To get away from the persecution, Abelard left Paris, went to Maloon, and began to teach with the same success which he had enjoyed in Paris. He went thence to Corbeil, and taught as before. Here his health failed, and he retired for several years to his native place, Palais, near Nantes. He then returned to Paris. From this time he devoted himself entirely to the study of theology. He left Paris and went to Laon, where he had as his preceptor, Anselm of Laon, the pupil of the celebrated Anselm. This man soon became unable to withstand the boldness of Abelard's ideas and the power of his eloquence, and secured his expulsion from Laon. Then Abelard returned to Paris and established a new school, which was overwhelmed in a short time by throngs of students. He was now at the head of the theological world of Europe. His students were devoted to him, and his opinions were accepted by his admirers as final. This school became the very center of education for such of the clergy of Europe as desired a thorough scientific training. Guizot says of its success, quote, In this celebrated school were trained one pope, Celestine II, nineteen cardinals, more than fifty bishops and archbishops, French, English, and German, and a much larger number of those men with whom popes, bishops, and cardinals had often to contend, such men as Arnold of Brescia, and others. The number of pupils which used at that time to assemble around Abelard had been estimated at upwards of five thousand. This man was now at the zenith of his power. He was employed by Flubert, a canon of the Cathedral of Paris, to be the private teacher of his niece, the rarely gifted Eloise. He had an improper relation with her, and his name was stained by the crime of which not even his bitterest foe could have had a suspicion. Desire of wine and all delicious drinks, which many a famous warrior overturns, thou couldst repress, nor did the dancing ruby, sparkling outpoured, the flavor or the smell, or taste that cheers the hearts of gods or men, allure thee from the cool crystalline stream. But what availed this temperance, not complete, against another object more enticing? 
what boots it at one gate to make defence and at another to let in the foe effeminately vanquished abelard married eloise but the affair was kept a secret at her request she was willing to suffer disgrace that his preferment might not suffer he now took the vows of a monk and entered the convent of saint denis while eloise took the veil as a nun in the convent of argentile he continued to teach and to write with broken spirit but with a multitude of admirers he was charged with heresy for certain remarks in his introduction to theology and at the council of soissons in eleven twenty one he was compelled to burn his book with his own hands he afterwards returned to his monastery of saint denis but left it and built an oratory in the name of the holy trinity which he called the paraclete at his death in the year eleven forty two he left his oratory to be conducted by eloise he gave a strong blow to the supremacy of the church fathers by his book sie et non yea and nay in which by paralleled quotations he shows their irreconcilable contradictions but he gave no concessions to sceptical writers here lay the most difficult point in the opposition by the ecclesiastical authorities to the direct teaching of abelard nothing could be proved save by inference against his orthodoxy while he assumed the unity of the divine being he held that there were diversities of his relations in which the divine persons consist he also affirmed a knowledge of god to be arrived at by the reason but he never claimed that this was either complete or accurate or independent of the full scriptural revelation his works consist of letters to eloise exposition of the lord's prayer exposition of the apostolic creed exposition of the athanasian creed book against heresies commentary on romans sermons introduction to theology epitome of christian doctrine and various works of correspondence the general effect of his teaching was to promote a critical and thorough method in the investigation of truth End of chapter 28part two chapter twenty nine of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty nine general literature the example of charlemagne in rescuing the elder popular myth of the franks from oblivion became very influential upon the popular taste poets vied with each other in tracing back the legends to their sources and recasting them in their own style the tendency was towards the marvellous and exciting a decidedly religious character was added in many instances to the purely heathen thread during the twelfth and thirteenth centuries the poets used the religious factor to a remarkable degree wolfram of eskenbach added religious poetry to his romantic verse his parsifal contains frequent allusions to the efficacy of the atonement and the excellence of the christian life the church had its warm eulogists in the troubadours of southern france walter of the vogelweide sang panegyrics to the holy virgin gottfried of strasbourg celebrated the glories of voluntary poverty and the longings of the soul for heavenly joy the taste for legend was closely allied to the historical spirit the treatment was far from orderly or philosophical the best of the histories were mere chronicles the whole of the thirteenth century was distinguished for its historical spirit arnold of lubeck died twelve twelve wrote the chronicles of the sclaves a work continued to twelve forty one by alberic of liege an important larger history was produced by matthew paris of england who died in twelve fifty nine chronological works were written also by martin polonus and william de Naugis of st denis france religious theatricals were employed to divert the people and at the same time to instruct the popular mind in some of the more dramatic portions of the scriptures the passion of jesus was represented with a realism which produced great popular effect 
multitudes thronged from distant parts to witness, in the open air, all the details of the crucifixion. These have disappeared, with the single exception of the Passion Play, which is still performed, every decade, in the Bavarian village of Oberarmagon. These theatricals were likewise used for a different purpose, to hold up the weaker side of the priests, and even of bishops and popes, to popular ridicule. The Feast of the Innocents was modeled after the heathen December festivities. The three Florentine poets, Dante, Petrarch, and Boccaccio, introduced a severer taste and elevated poetry to a dignity entirely new to medieval Europe. Dante's soul was stirred by the theological disputes and papal misdoings of his day. He saw the needs of the people and was their champion. He regarded the church as utterly fallen, its doctrines thrown into the background, and its holy functions performed by unworthy hands. He believed in God's final justice, and in his divine comedy, portrayed the certainty of rewards and punishments according to the deeds done in the body. His whole life was a tragedy, due to his heroic espousal of the cause of justice in church and state. He led the people away from the dark present to a beautiful future. Without knowing it, he was the real prophet of the better day of the Great Reformation. End of chapter 29part two chapter thirty of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty the great schools the decline after alfred and charlemagne was very marked the latter established fifty great schools throughout his dominions alfred organized oxford and spared no pains to make it the centre of anglo-saxon thought he enriched the foundations by securing from the continent the best possible teachers and the richest literary treasures. But schools suffered a fearful decline throughout the tenth century. With the eleventh century, however, there came a revival of literary taste, which continued until the fourteenth and fifteenth centuries. Some of the monastic schools now assumed larger proportions, and became, like Paris and Oxford, full-fledged universities. But the most of the universities seem to have taken their origin independently of both church and state. They were the popular creation of a taste for learning. Great teachers appeared in certain cities, and their fame attracted students from every quarter, and even distant countries. The teachers and the students were united by a common bond. Universitas Magisterorum et Scholarum, or the community of masters and pupils, became the origin of the general word university. At first, each great school was distinguished for its devotion to one science, as theology at Paris and Oxford, law at Bologna, and medicine at Salerno. In time, the university divided into four great faculties of theology, law, medicine, and philosophy. This division arose first in Paris, where the mendicant orders were proscribed by the other teachers in the university, and constituted themselves a separate faculty. This division in the faculties tended to increase the attendance of students. So great was the number that they constituted an important part of the population. The number ranged from 10,000 to 20,000 in some of the universities. They were divided, not according to the studies which they pursued, but the nationalities which they represented, and were called nations. Traces of this medieval division into nations and languages can be seen in the present German universities, especially the more provincial, where some of the clubs of students bear the names of the old tribal divisions. End of chapter 30 Part 2, Chapter 31 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 31. The Divided Papacy. The first great blow against the solidarity of the papacy was struck by France. Germany was now submissive to Rome, 
England was likewise brought into a docile attitude. Of all the great powers, France alone remained independent and continued disobedient. The traditional independence of the Gallican Church was a rich inheritance of the kings, and, while some were less exacting, others brought it into a prominence at once troublesome and threatening to Rome. Philip IV of France, 1285 to 1314, was of the latter class. He claimed to be head of the French Church, and rejected all interference with his royal prerogatives. Pope Boniface VIII, who ruled 1294 to 1303, resolved on a vigorous policy towards France. He determined to humble that country and make it fall into line with all the other nations of Europe. He found his match in Philip IV. The two were not unlike. Each was ambitious, selfish, and intent on perfect independence. France was at war with England, then under the rule of Edward I. Each of those countries had its strong and interested allies, on the side of England were the German king, Adolf of Nassau, and the Count of Flanders. On the side of France was the king of Scotland. Boniface saw in this great conflict an opportunity to follow in the great Gregory's footsteps and play the role of umpire. Edward, in order to carry on the war, had burdened his people with heavy taxes. Boniface boldly issued in 1296 a special bull the clericis lycos, in which he threatened Philip with excommunication if he levied such taxes. Philip replied indignantly with the words, The church does not consist alone of the clergy, but also of laymen. The freedom of the church is divided between the clergy and the laity. The pope saw that the subjects of Philip were in sympathy with their king. He was, therefore, powerless in his threats. He found himself deprived of his revenues from France, and feared most serious consequences. He accordingly resolved on mild measures. He hoped to conquer Philip by flattery. He even canonized Louis the Ninth, the grandfather of Philip. A truce was patched up between the two, each making concessions. Philip accepted the arbitration of Boniface, but as a friend and not as Pope. Boniface decided against Philip and in favor of Edward. This was the final blow to peace. France was defiant. Boniface, already advanced in years, now died. He was succeeded by an Italian pope who reigned but a short time. He, in turn, was succeeded by Bertrand de Gaute, who ruled as Clement V. This man, though he had been a favorite of Boniface, was already in secret relations with Philip, and had made pledges to support his policy against that of Rome. Clement, of his own choice, removed the papal see to Avignon in France, 1309. This papacy remained in France until 1377, or a period of nearly seventy years. In Roman literature, it is called the Babylonian Captivity. Gregory XI restored the papacy to Rome. The papacy during its French residence was frivolous and corrupt. It was the mere tool of the French court. Gregory dying, Urban VI was elected in his place, 1378. He was in the Roman interest. The French electors declared the election illegal and chose an anti-pope, Clement VII, who ruled in Avignon. This singular picture was now presented, two popes, each independent of the other, one ruling in France and the other in Rome, each hurling anathemas at the other, and each surrounded by a court, a full quota of cardinals, and an obedient clergy. It was a disgrace to all Europe. The quarrel was violent, immorality increased. The only hope lay in general councils but the popes wanted no general councils. Their hope to restore peace and prestige to the papacy lay in a personal government. But the reformatory spirit in the laity and a large part of the clergy demanded the general voice of the church as it might express itself in a council. A council was accordingly ordered to meet in Pavia in 1423. The place of meeting was changed, on account of a pestilence, to Siena, 
but there were only a few sessions. The representation was ridiculously small, and on account of the plea that so small a number of delegates could not represent Christendom, the Pope dissolved it. Seven years later, another council was called to meet in Basel. It was of a highly reformatory character. The Pope dissolved it by direct order. But enough delegates remained to carry on its work. The Pope afterwards recognized it, but removed it first to Ferrara and later to Florence. The delegates, however, acknowledged no removal. On the contrary, they continued their work, for which the Pope excommunicated them. The council, in return, deposed the Pope, and chose another in his stead, Felix V. This measure was fatal to the council. The delegates grew tired and disbanded. The outcome of all these troubles was the triumph of the papacy and the restoration of the old solidarity. The immorality continued the same as before. The last popes before the Reformation were no improvement upon their predecessors. The degrees of the reformatory councils were condemned. Superstition was the order of the day. Clerical offices were at the option of the highest bidder. Indulgences were sold throughout Germany. The people were neglected. The clergy seemed to think the church existed for their use and convenience. But the clock now struck for a new life. A strong voice from Wittenberg was heard. The old issues were dead. A new order was now established, and Europe had something else to think about besides the wrangles of schoolmen and the counterblasts of rival popes. End of chapter 31part two chapter thirty two of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter thirty two retrospect the condition of the european church at the close of the medieval period was in marked contrast with that at the beginning the uncertainty as to whether christianity could adapt itself to the universal spiritual needs of europe was now solved the east and the west changed places the east overridden by internal divisions and trampled by the saracen conquerors passed into an oblivion which has lasted until modern times and has been only in part relieved by the rise of the russo-greek church had the eastern church adhered to orthodox standards and preserved its spiritual unity it is not at all likely that its vast territory would have been overrun by the Saracens. On the contrary, there is every reason to believe that from Constantinople, Jerusalem, Antioch, and Alexandria, and other centers, the whole of India, China, Japan, and other Oriental countries would have been evangelized many centuries ago, instead of just now becoming great mission fields for Western Christianity to rescue from paganism. The transfer of universal interests to the Western Church was complete at the close of the Middle Ages. No questions were asked of the Eastern patriarchs. Rome held the power in its own hands until a stronger force, the Reformation, appeared in Germany. The stages of progress are well defined. From the 8th century to the middle of the 11th, the German peoples became evangelized and gave full promise of their future large place in universal Christian thought and life. From the middle of the 11th century to the 13th, the papacy grew into enormous proportions. There never floated before the mind of Julius Caesar or Trajan a larger empire than that to which Gregory the Seventh and other occupants of the Roman See aspired. The Saxon and the Latin Christian, at the end of the Middle Ages, confronted each other. The Latin represented the past, the Saxon, the future and the permanent. The force which destroyed the old and strong Roman conditions was titanic. The Saxon hammer was irresistible. The Germans of the North were kinsmen to the Saxons and the Angles of Britain. Wycliffe and Luther were from a common cradle of Teutonic honesty and liberty. The Roman conquest of Britain was political. The spiritual conqueror, in all later history, was still the Saxon. 
every triumph of religion and liberty in the england of modern times can be traced back to the teutonic element in the english race in the great advance of modern peoples the latin is inferior to the saxon in all spiritual upbuilding the sad moral condition of south america mexico spain italy and the jesuit missions in india and other eastern countries is a striking proof of what the world would be to-day had not the saxon been at the head of the world's greatest affairs the tree must be tested by its fruits we have only to examine the map of the conquests of the saxon christian and compare it with that of the latin christian in order to see where the honor of all great modern advancement belongs end of chapter thirty two end of part two part three chapter one of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain part three the reformation a d fifteen seventeen to fifteen forty five chapter one the heralds of protestantism the reformation like all great historical movements was of slow and unattractive development long in coming into notice it was equally long in finding its champions the cause was waiting for its men and when the need was supreme they appeared with heroic spirit great organizing genius and amazing power of endurance protestantism was an oak of young and vigorous growth in the first quarter of the sixteenth century but its roots lay deep in the soil of the fourteenth the reformation possessed two characteristics one national with all the individuality that might be expected of race and land the other cosmopolitan having general fibre and colour always the same whatever the country or people from norway to the alps and from transylvania to the bay of biscay the reformation has proved to be the chief turning point in modern history it is that great religious and intellectual revolution which marks the boundary line between the middle ages and the modern period the call for regeneration was deep and loud superstition had become interwoven with the pure doctrine of the gospel the morals of the clergy from the papacy down to the humblest monks had become corrupt the highest ecclesiastical offices were reached by vicious means the common people were purposely kept in ignorance against these evils ruinous at once to intellect and soul the reformers made their bold protest and called upon the people to rally to their standard their aim was at first a purification of the church within itself and by its own servants this proved a total failure the next step was to withdraw from the fold and establish an independent confession and a separate ecclesiastical structure this succeeded and the result is that vast and aggressive sisterhood of protestant churches which exists to-day in all the advanced countries of the world the pioneers of reform in religious life and doctrine were obscure and some of the very names have not become known to history but their work was heroically performed protestantism when it emerged from its seclusion and became a thing of the noonday had the great benefit of a slowly laid and solid basis but not all the predecessors of the successful reformers of the sixteenth century were unknown men some of them a few in each country which took its place in the community of protestant nations have become familiar names and belong in the same front line with the reformers themselves it is not difficult to account for the failure of those first workers for the religious regeneration of europe more than one generation is always needed to achieve a moral revolution a work that shall last for the ages requires a larger and longer sacrifice than a few calm toilers through a few decades the heralds of the reformation trod in new paths they labored steadily on without a single encouraging precedent and ran the constant risk of losing their heads an archbishop's voice could silence behind the bolted doors of the london tower 
the loudest protesting voice in Britain, while the mere roll-call of the Council of Constance could hasten even Huss to the stake. When the real reformers came upon the scene of action, especially in Germany, the risk of losing life was not so great. Charles V aped towards the Protestants the charity of Julian the Apostate towards all the faiths of the later Roman Empire. Hence, while Charles V was Emperor of Germany, he openly favoured moderate measures towards the Protestants. That is to say, all repressive methods must be adopted except death itself. In Holland, however, Charles V dealt out death with merciless hand. In his commands to his son, Philip II, in whose favour he abdicated, he urged him to spare no pains to uproot the new heresy. But there was a difference between his relation to Germany and to Holland. Of the former he was only emperor by election. Each country had its separate ruler, and the civil relations were in charge of the rightful princes. But Charles V was king over the Netherlands, having received that country by inheritance. Therefore, when the Dutch rebelled against the civil authorities, and declared themselves Protestants and Republicans, it was a revolution against his personal authority. He accordingly put to death the Protestants of that country without the least hesitation, while in Germany he never went so far as to claim such rights. In England the condition was still more encouraging for Protestants. Henry the Eighth not only professed their faith, but protected his subjects against all interference on the part of the priesthood and the management of the Pope. In sharp contrast with this general improvement in personal safety, during the progress of the Reformation, was that previous insecurity. The herald of reform was not safe an hour. He had no protector. There was no organization of sympathetic minds. Each earnest individual, who longed for the better day, became an object of suspicion, and, in due time, of bitter persecution. The shedding of blood for a slight offense, especially against the church, was an easy thing to bring about. The secret methods of silencing honest speech had long since grown into a fine art. The two kinds of reformers were happily blended in the foreground of the Protestant picture. The herald who cried in the wilderness was a fit companion of him whose coming he proclaimed. The former, because silenced for the moment, appeared to fail. The heralds of Protestantism taught their successors, by their own experience, what dangers to avoid and what were the true forces of success. Luther, for example, in the most delicate and difficult part of his career, his relation with the princes of Saxony, learned from the indiscretion of Savonarola, in his dealing with the Medici and the temporal government of Florence, that the reformer is never fully master of himself, and can never be the finally successful leader, unless he holds severely aloof from all political management, and confine his labors to the one work of religious reform. Luther saw that the moment the reformer turns aside from his work, he is in danger of forfeiting his entire mission. He has, in any event, lost his crown, the sublime unity of moral purpose. The Paris reformers planted the first seeds of Protestantism in France. In the reformatory councils, they spoke strong words for universal regeneration. The University of Paris, where they taught, was the scene of their hard, hotly contested, and unrequited labor. Peter de Ali, born 1350 and died 1425, contributed largely towards awakening a desire for a thoroughly new religious life in priesthood and people. His genius ripened early. He saw the vanity of the prevailing scholasticism, and applied its better qualities to biblical interpretation. He laid before the Council of Constance a plan for the reformation of the Church, which proved of no avail. He nullified his own work, however, and stained his otherwise fair fame by voting for the condemnation of Huss. He never withdrew from the Roman Catholic Church, 
and died in discontent with the evils which he failed to remedy his great service lay in the distrust which he created towards the papal authorities and in the dissatisfaction with the church which pervaded his sermons lectures and writings and which in time became a dangerous factor against the romanism of the land diaily made several excursions into the field of science and columbus was indebted to him for his idea of a western passage to the indies he stood high in the estimation of the church john charlier gerson born thirteen sixty three and died fourteen twenty nine was a disciple of diali he rose to great prominence in the university of paris and withdrawing from scholasticism aimed at the reconciliation of mysticism with christianity he laid great stress on the necessity of a pure religious experience, protested against the corrupt state of the church, and declared that the two rival popes, in Rome and Avignon, should be removed rather than that Christians should be compelled to endorse either the one or the other. His sermons, after he became pastor of a church in Paris, attracted large audiences because of his eloquence and his bold position for ecclesiastical reform he became an exile because of the opposition of the duke of burgundy and only in his later life in fourteen nineteen returned to france he resided in lyon and died in the roman catholic fold he saw but little fruit of his reformatory labors and passed away with only the hope that others might possess what he had striven in much sorrow and disappointment to attain he was a transitional character possessing the qualities of both the Romanist and the Reformer. For example, he did not recognize the Church and the Papacy, but the Bible as the only rule of faith, and the one to which all final appeal must be made. At the same time, he opposed the reading of the Bible in the popular language in the rural churches, and believed that all should submit unconditionally to the Church. Nicholas Clemange born 1360 and died about 1440, was a disciple of both Diali and Gerson, but he marked a great advance beyond them in reformatory spirit. He declared that the councils were superior authority to the papacy, that the Pope was inferior to the Council of Constance, and that the Bible had authority even over the Council. He boldly advocated the doctrine of the invisible church, and held that the church can only exist where the holy spirit is present he was an eloquent defender of the independence of the gallican church against the absolute rule of the papacy the paris theologians failed in their work and from very obvious causes they never withdrew from the roman catholic church or took steps to establish a separate ecclesiastical organization this has been a general cause of the failure of French Catholic reformatory movements, even down to our own times. When the final hour came, the Paris reformers hesitated to revolt. They halted, and did not take the one last step of departure from the communion which they could not love or approve. Besides this fatal mistake, the attack of the Paris theologians was not a steady, earnest, and specific progress. It was a sudden blast, and often repeated, but not an onward march. Some of the weakest points of Romanism were entirely overlooked by them. They expressed, for example, but little sympathy with reformatory measures in other countries. They belonged to the learned class, moved in that circle alone, and, unlike the German reformers, who also arose in a university, were without popular tastes and affinities, and had only a limited, though cultivated, constituency during their whole career. On the other hand, they planted the seeds of a permanent popular dislike of the prevailing order of things, and were the real and direct precursors of the brave Huguenots. The mystics of the fourteenth and fifteenth centuries arose as a spiritual reaction against the supremacy of the scholastic philosophy. Remotely, they were an opposing school to all the immorality and spiritual oppression of the times. They saw the injury inflicted on the church by the long and fruitless discussions of the schoolmen, 
and aimed to call back the christian mind to the sense of dependence on god the need of a profound religious experience and a contemplative and receptive attitude of the soul which awaits constant communications of the holy spirit the mystic attached too little importance to the written word and magnified the worth of merely spiritual impressions he was contemplative and rhapsodical and held himself constantly ready for new revelations intuitions were his second bible he did not regard monasticism as the solution for the spiritual dearth of the times neither did he think the best way to build up a new religious life was to separate from the church his thought was to preach to the people and awaken them to a sense of their needs and thus from the centre to reform the whole body of the church without disturbing the existing economy and order the mystic cared not who might be the pope of the hour or whether there was a pope at all he considered that personage a fine piece of ornamental work like a marble saint in a cathedral chapel but having no relation to the general architecture of the edifice the one concern of the mystic was the condition of the individual heart the religious life of the private believer germany was the central scene and native country of the most notable reformatory mystics master eckhart who died about thirteen twenty nine belonged to the dominican order of monks and produced a strong impression by his writings and preaching in favor of a purer religious life the general drift of his teaching was that the doctrines of the bible were the only truth and that this truth has its proper effect in the purity of the heart we reach purity by introspection god is in the soul we look outwardly when we should look within but purity must be deeply rooted in the soul for god will not enter where there is an unholy thought many of eckert's order pronounced him a heretic because of his fearless speech the three fundamental objections to him were his bold charges of immorality in the clergy his strong language against the worship of mary and against the power of purgatory to purify a corrupt soul john ruysbroek was born twelve ninety three he became prior of the monastery of grunthal near brussels and was the founder of the dutch mysticism he saw a universal sinfulness in his age priests and people alike overwhelmed and whirled on by the current of sin the prime source of the prevailing corruption was the impurity of the church and its incapacity to resist the temptation of gold and lust it was too far gone to save itself even the popes said ruysbroek bowed the knee to the god of gold the church had no healing power only god in the soul could deliver from sin ruysbroek was a twofold character contemplative and mystical on the one hand and on the other the practical and everyday reformer he had two constituencies his voice reached palace and hut with equal force henry suso born in swabia in 1295 took his name from that of his mother's family suess or Seuss, which he latinized into suso his early religious life was spent in self-torture and contemplation he lived in a thick gloom his thought was that only by the suffering of the flesh could god be pleased his close-fitting shirt of one hundred and fifty nails with points turned inwards towards his flesh was his favorite and royal robe he loved it better than the purple for sixteen years he tortured both soul and body by the hearing of towler in cologne he was admitted into larger liberty he became less ascetic and more a citizen of the world he called himself the servant of the eternal wisdom to whom he paid a lover's homage as to a radiant may queen he was passionately fond of music and when in ecstasy fancied himself in the midst of angelic ministers of his book the horologue of wisdom he said that it came to him in moments of supreme joy when he lay passive in the power of the high inspiration he summed up his whole theology in the following 
a meek man must be deformed from the creature conformed to christ and transformed into the deity the entire tendency of suso's teaching was in favor of religious reform his life was one long lament over the evils of his times for which he held the church responsible he declared of the popes that good government had departed from them and that they thought more of gold and the putting of their relatives into power than of the church of god and that the cardinals bishops abbots teachers monastic orders and secular clergy were corrupt and debauched and unworthy their places of honor he believed that his whole generation was so depraved that a reformation would be a very miracle of divine mercy he feared the miracle might never come his pleas were lamentations he was the jeremiah of the fourteenth century john toller born twelve ninety and died thirteen sixty one was a devoted disciple of eckhart he was more a man of the people than his master he spoke in plain language and often aroused the sensibilities to the highest pitch he excelled all the medieval mystics in his burning zeal his popular sympathies and his profound adherence to the doctrine of justification by faith in this last sense luther followed only in his footprints he was the most eloquent preacher of his times strasbourg was the chief scene of his ministry there was much realistic power in his preaching that often people were overcome and became insensible during the delivery of his sermons he taught that there are three stages possible to the heart nature grace and the direct shining of the divine spirit when this last and highest stage is reached the soul forgets itself and god possesses it wholly the human spirit is as molten wax in which the holy spirit makes its image Towler rebuked the priestly pretensions of his times and cried aloud for each man to think and feel for himself he declared the true priesthood of every christian man and insisted that the christ should dwell within us like some of his mystical predecessors whose language was too strong for the fashion of the times he was threatened with excommunication but he continued his preaching against the prevailing sins of the church without serious interruption and the authorities in rome were finally compelled to let him proceed as a person more dangerous to interfere with than to be at liberty the black death a violent plague together with the papal interdict rested upon strasbourg but tauler's preaching attracted the entire population diverted their thought and was the only relief to the sorrow and suffering of the people he declared that the troubles were a divine visitation because of the sins of the people and that only by repentance and a pure life could relief come his principal work was his imitation of the poor life of christ of all the mystics tauler was the nearest approach to a universal character real goodness like genius is at home in every age Towler was not only reverenced by the devout and zealous Christians of his own time, but stands out as a grand and towering figure in the spiritual world of all later periods. He was a striking example, in a dark age, of how far one man can lift up his generation and furnish light for even later ones. A voice as unto him that hears, a cry above the conquered years, to one that with us works. When the reformers arose, they immediately discovered in Towler a kindred soul, one in whom they found great joy, and who had contributed largely to herald their approach. He was but an elder brother to the groups in both Wittenberg and Oxford. Luther himself edited the Theological Germanica, supposed by some critics to have been written by Towler. Luther's own words would not suit Towler when he says, in his preface to the Theologia Germanica, that it was written by a German gentleman, a priest and warden in the house of the Teutonic Order at Frankfurt. But whether by him or not, it reflects his pure spirit and that of all the better mystics, and is singularly in harmony with Towler's preaching. 
Luther communed with Towler's writings as with a living and present friend. To John Lang he wrote, Keep to Towler. He gave his friend Spalatin this advice, If you would be pleased to make acquaintance with the solid theology of the good old sort in the German tongue, get John Towler's sermons. For neither in Latin nor in our own language have I ever seen a theology more sound or more in harmony with the gospel. The school of St. Victor was one of the marvels of the times. It represented, in organized and compact form, the aspiration of the age for purer thinking, for spiritual absorption, and for revolt against the prevailing ecclesiastical evils. Within eighty years of its founding, in the eleventh century, it could count its thirty abbeys and eighty priories. Its two most notable members were Hugo and Richard. They were at once speculative thinkers and spiritual mystics. They aimed to harmonize mysticism with scholasticism. These were but terms of the day for the two old, and still ever new, names of revelation and science. Both Hugo and Richard saw no antagonism, but held that each was the complement of the other. Hugo aimed to solidify and clarify spiritual thinking by logical methods. He disdained the rigid uniformity of the traditional creed of Romanism, and called for freedom and faith, and freedom in faith. He declared that there is an eye of the soul, by which we contemplate and see new truths, and by them attain to a blessedness of the soul and a peaceful trust in God. The common and natural faculties cannot see deeply. The spiritual sense alone is far-sighted, and able to apprehend, in the distant spaces, the spiritual truth. But we must guard against delusion. Not the fancy, but faith, can reveal it to us. Richard of St. Victor was a native of Scotland. In 1162 he became prior of the abbey. Ervisius was the abbot, and therefore responsible for the discipline. The morals in the abbey had been at a very low ebb, and Richard saw in them a picture of the moral prostration of his times, and the need of a new spiritual life. He regarded mysticism as the only hope of relief. But it must be a carefully adjusted, firm, and well-rounded system, none of your wild and absurd fancies of a disturbed brain. Build up mysticism on logical scholasticism, and you have what you need to cure the evils of the day. Thus Richard reasoned, and wisely enough. But when he came to touch the revealed truth, he lost his balance. He converted all scripture into a string of shining allegory and metaphor. He surpassed all the fancies of Origen and the Alexandrian school, and found in the Bible an illimitable realm of truth. No history or incident existed that did not mean far more than the letter said he made meditation the great theological basis. Contemplation was a height which could be reached by six steps, the uppermost of which is penitence. When the soul once stood on that, it was above the low steps of imagination and reason, and was lost in sublime ecstasy. The age was corrupt, thrice dead, and plucked up by the roots, and nothing could save it but purer morals, a return to better thoughts, and the coming back of the church to an unselfish and zealous spiritual life. The Brothers of the Common Life were an association of mystical minds who made it their aim to reform the church by a purification of the heart. They placed more emphasis on the regeneration of the soul than the outward organization of the church. They held that, if once the heart is right, the outward forms will soon assume right shapes. The whole life must be centered in the love of God, and then the heart will be sanctified. Thomas a Kempis belonged to this fraternity. His imitation of Christ has always been a favorite among both Romanists and Protestants, and has had the largest circulation of any book except the Bible. It has been translated into all the principal languages, and is known to have passed through three hundred editions. 
the friends of god were an organization of laymen which flourished in the latter part of the fourteenth century they were warm in their attachment to the roman fold and yet were alarmed at the evils which they saw about them in both clergy and laity this society was a strong proof that the moral declension of the times was seen and understood by devout minds among the laymen as well as by ministers of the gospel its members extended throughout western germany and the larger part of switzerland and contributed largely to prepare the way among the people for luther and his coadjutors nicholas a layman of basel and a convert through the preaching of tauler wrought in connection with them and was their most conspicuous representative among their members must be reckoned conrad abbot of kaisersheim the nuns of unterlinden in colmar and basel the sisters of ethelgal the knights of rheinfeld pfaffenheim and landsberg and the rich merchant ruhlman merswin the love of god was the one universal law which the friends of god insisted upon they declared that the church had closed its doors to the truth and that the only hope for their opening was a higher spiritual life tauler called the friends of god the pillars of christendom and the protectors for a while from god's just cloud of wrath holland was one of the earliest and most forward countries in which the spirit of reform was manifested the universities were the great fountains whence the protestant stream arose and from which it descended into the less educated masses john pupper born about 1401 took the family name of goch from the place of his birth a town near cleves and called himself john of goch he founded the priory of the canonesses of st augustine in mechlin in 1451 and for twenty-five years occupied the office of rector or confessor to the nuns he combined in rare harmony the spiritual and the practical he held that faith must precede reason for reason without faith is a blind and a false guide scholasticism is a mere logical play and must be fought by sound theological logic which draws its power from the written word of god the scholastic philosophy is false because it is not based upon the bible but on aristotle his whole theology has been strikingly summarized into of god through god and to god we derive all from him he is our father the giver and teacher of all good we should give to him our deepest love and supreme confidence all freedom is based on love and love is our best assurance of future blessedness john of goch's entire system of doctrine was reformatory a protest against the usual modes of laying down doctrine and a holding up of mere good works to contempt in practical life he hurled his strong lance against the sale of indulgences and the personal corruption of the clergy the mission of the early dutch reformers was very important they caught the spirit of the times and were bold and defiant in their protest against the immorality of their day if we ask why was it that holland gave such a prompt and cordial reception to the doctrines of luther and calvin the answer is the soil was fully prepared for the precious seed the dutch people had been taught by these early preachers of a purer morality that the time was fully come for a new spiritual order they did not know whence the light would break but the whole land was astir with a longing for it and an expectation of its speedy dawn hence when they heard the strong words from wittenberg and geneva they rejoiced in them as the fulfillment of their hopes to them the new truth was no surprise they had listened to their own prophets and believed their burning words end of chapter one part three chapter two of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter two the humanism of italy important general movements without connection with prominent characters 
were likewise in progress to hasten the approach of reform. Chief of these, in the field of intellectual progress, was the revival of literature, which took the name of humanism. The studies were purely human and literary, as distinguished from the theological themes which had long held sway in all the universities and learned circles of Europe. Great attention was given the Greek and Latin classical writers. Even down to our time, in some places, the literature and languages of Greece and Rome are denominated the humanities. This is especially the case in the Scotch and English universities. In the Italian Renaissance of learning, however, Hebrew also came in for its share of attention. Political events had a large share in producing this new turn of the world's thought. The great Italian poets of the 14th century had written on topics suggested by classical writers. Boccaccio depended on Greece for his material, while Dante and Petrarch drew their inspiration from Roman sources. As notable public teachers in Italy, who contributed largely to the development of humanism, not only in that land but in the countries north of the Alps, Chrysolorus taught Greek literature in Pavia and Florence, and John of Ravenna instructed in Latin literature in Padua and Florence. A further impulse was given to Greek studies by the fruitless attempt made at the Council of Florence to secure a formal union of the Greek and Roman Catholic churches, when the Byzantine emperor, John the Seventh Palaeologus, was present in person, and Bessarion, Archbishop of Nicaea, brought his plan for the union of the long-separated churches. The points at issue were of too serious a character for any return to a common communion. The most serious one was the papal primacy, which the Roman Catholics insisted upon, and which the Greek delegates accepted, but which the Greek church repudiated. But these negotiations, however vain so far as union was concerned, were exceedingly fruitful in sowing in Italy, and especially in the Roman fold, an ardent love for Greek letters, not only for the Greek of the church writers, but also for the productions of the purest Attic authors. Greece became, even to ecclesiastical scholars and students, an enchanted land whose treasures were suddenly thrown open for the enjoyment of the whole learned world. The capture of Constantinople by the Turks, in 1453, was the culmination of the great movements which brought about a love for the classic studies in Italy. It was, in fact, of more weight than all other agencies combined. The flight of Greek Christians westward amounted almost to a national migration. Large numbers fled to Italy, settled along the Adriatic coast, swarmed into all the interior cities, and soon began to be felt as a political and spiritual force throughout the peninsula. Rome, Florence, Siena, and all of the larger cities became the home of learned Greeks, who brought with them the classic treasures of their former country, and cultivated them in their new home with such zeal that the Greek writers, who had been in obscurity for a thousand years, were soon familiarly known to the Italians. Even before the capture of Constantinople, Greek scholars from the Eastern Empire had entered Italy. Between 1420 and 1430, George of Trapezium, Theodore Gaza, and John Argeropolis had taken up their residence in Italy, and after the capture there came a multitude, represented by such men as Constantine Lascaris, Demetrius Chocondylus, and Emmanuel Moscopilus. No branch of Greek letters was overlooked. Poetry, eloquence, art, and philosophy came in for full recognition. Each department had its enthusiastic representatives. What Bessarion and Gamastius Pletho accomplished in infatuating large numbers of Italians with the new mania for the Platonic philosophy was achieved by others in every sphere of Greek culture. The revival of the Latin classics came in as a competing factor with the Greek. The Italians were too jealous of the triumphs of their own immortal ancestors to permit the Greeks to monopolize attention. 
hence we find a great school of learned italians laboring earnestly for the re-enthronement of their writers of the augustan age gasparinus john arispa guerinus poggins laurentius valla nicholas prothes christopher laudinus and angelo politianus were representative of this class the italian princes favored the revival of both greek and latin letters the medici of florence from fourteen twenty nine to fourteen ninety two gathered about them the most learned men of italy and patronized every department of classic science and art their court was the most splendid literary centre of modern times in their gardens the princes of thought convened and held communion on all the great themes of science literature and art which were then agitating europe from the medician gatherings many young minds like raphael derived an inspiration for great work which afterwards took form in art and poetry and philology they constituted the literary exchange of the century the religious tendency of humanism in italy was purely negative the general spirit was not alone indifferent to christianity but positively hostile to it the influence of the medician court and even of the papacy was exerted simply to revive the classics and so put an end to the theological discussions which had absorbed attention there was no disposition to resort to the bible but rather to make the famous writers of the pagan times a substitute for the inspired authors of the scriptures skepticism was the craze of the hour even learned hierarchs considered it well enough at once to hold office in the church and observe a suspicious silence on the divine origin of christianity the expression is ascribed to leo x what little use the fable of christ is to us and our people has been known to all centuries whether the charge be true or not it is a fact that it expresses the theology both of italian humanism and the papal court of the fifteenth century erasmus who resided for a time in rome wrote in lamentation over the blasphemous expressions which he constantly heard from prominent ecclesiastics humanism elsewhere in europe was very different from that of italy so far as sympathy with evangelical religion was concerned north of the alps the taste for the classic languages and masterpieces spread with great rapidity but it was turned into a theological and religious channel and served to hasten the reformation the scriptures were studied with all that new interest which came from the revival of philological learning panzer relates that one hundred editions of the latin vulgate bible were printed between the years fourteen sixty two and fifteen hundred the first edition of the greek testament however which was printed was not edited by a sceptical humanist but by erasmus and appeared in fifteen sixteen hebrew received profound attention and hence the old testament became a book of minute and laborious study this new attention to the bible led immediately to a comparison of its high standard of morals and doctrine with the present fallen state of the church in both these fundamental departments the invention of the art of printing was highly favorable to the new intellectual departure and humanist works soon spread throughout western europe heidelberg and erfurt became centres of german humanism maternus pistorius of erfurt stood at the head of the german poetic group conrad muth of gotha led in the same direction and assailed the prevailing scholasticism with irresistible satire rudolf agricola of heidelberg was a profound scholar and turned his attention chiefly to the promotion of greek criticism he was a versatile character and was well worthy of guizot's eulogy a good painter a good writer a good poet and a learned philologist he died in fourteen eighty five john ruchlin of germany erasmus of rotterdam and thomas more of england were champions of the new humanism ruchlin's service lay in the department of hebrew studies 
he issued a strong protest against the prevailing neglect of the study of the old testament in the original hebrew his hebrew grammar 1506 was a masterpiece of learning and long remained the favorite textbook in that field throughout Europe. Erasmus confined his philological labors chiefly to the Greek, and was the principal promoter of New Testament studies for the first generation of Protestants in every land. He turned the New Testament, as one would a powerful piece of artillery, against the whole fabric of the ignorance, superstition, and immorality of his times his greek edition of the new testament enriched with notes and paraphrases constituted a scriptural arsenal for fighting the battle of the reformation thomas more was a friend of erasmus and became late in life an earnest literary worker for the cause of reform the chapter in his utopia which is entitled the religion of the utopians is a shrewd and correct picture of the corruption of his times and of the demand for a new order of morals and learning end of chapter two part three chapter three of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three the reformatory councils the councils of Pisa, Constance, and Basel were formal acknowledgments, on the part of the Roman Catholic Church, of the evils within its pale and the necessity of relief from them. The fourteenth century opened with a bitter controversy between the Church and the leading civil rulers. It was the old question of authority, whether Pope or King was the supreme head. The struggle centered in Pope Boniface the Eighth and Philip the Fair of France. In a bull issued in 1302, Boniface condemned Philip's declaration that the civil ruler is independent of papal authority. Thereupon Philip caused the arrest of the Pope, on the ground of his shameless life. The Pope was rescued, however, by his Italian supporters, and died shortly afterwards. His successor lived but a short time, and in 1305, the French Archbishop of Bordeaux was chosen Pope, and bore the name of Clement V. He was thoroughly identified with the French policy, and in 1309 removed the papal see from Rome to Avignon in France. This was the beginning of the Avignon Papacy, popularly called by the Romanists the Babylonian Captivity, from the light in which it was held as an ecclesiastical calamity, and from its continuance of nearly seventy years, 1309 to 1377. The whole period was one of great spiritual decline. At no time have the morals of the papacy been at a lower ebb. Meanwhile, the German rulers came into angry collision with the popes. Ludwig of Bavaria was a bitter opponent of the chains of the papacy. In Rome, and even throughout Italy, the divisions were very violent, and the whole papal structure was threatened with destruction. Gregory XI put an end to the Avignon papacy in 1377. Immediately after his death, the Romans elected an Italian pope, but the French elected a pope of their own who resided in Avignon. There were, therefore, two popes, one in Rome and another in France, each claiming the supreme authority, and each surrounded with his court and a college of cardinals. This papal schism lasted thirty years. Its effects were widespread, the entire Roman Catholic world being drawn into the strife. The only possible relief seemed to lie in a general council. The Paris theologians, with Gerson in the lead, were the principal agents in securing it. This council convened in Pisa in the year 1409. The rival popes were summoned to attend it in order to have their competing claims adjusted. Each feared for his position, and both refused to attend. Another pope was accordingly chosen, Alexander V. There were, therefore, at this time, three rival popes, all regularly elected, all claiming infallibility as the Lord's anointed vice-regents, 
and each fulminating maledictions upon his rivals and their supporters. The Council of Pisa failed of its end, for it was wrested from its original intent, that of reforming the church and healing its dissensions, into a contest of parties. The Council of Constance, 1414-18, to was called to heal the scandal of the three-headed papacy, which still continued, and to bring about reforms. All the three popes were called to the council, but only John the Twenty-Third, the successor of Alexander the Fifth, responded. John was a dissipated and accomplished rascal, but shrewd and full of makeshifts. He hoped to win his point by filling the council with Italians, but the council resolved to vote by nations, each nation having but one vote. Through the influence of Diaile, the decision was reached that all three popes should be compelled to abdicate, and that a new election take place. This program was carried out, and on November 11, 1417, Odo Colonna was elected as Martin V. This council is famous for the passing the decree that an ecumenical council, rightly constituted, has its authority immediately from Christ, and that therefore even the Pope himself is subject to it. It was also famous, or rather infamous, for condemning Huss to death. In the face of Diales and Gerson's hopes for reform, Martin, with true ecclesiastical prudence, prorogued the council. The Council of Basel, 1431-49, to was convened by Martin's successor, Eugene IV. It took the Constance program of reform as its basis of operations, and aimed at a thorough regeneration of the Church from its papal head to the secular clergy. The Pope was alarmed at the persistency and depth of the reformatory spirit, and declared the Council dissolved, and called another, first at Ferrara and then at Florence. But the Basel Council would not break up, even with the disadvantage of a rival council and the absent pope. The pope therefore issued his ban against the council, whereupon the latter removed the pope and elected a new one, Felix V, in his stead. But the disadvantages were too great for the Basel delegates to resist. They lacked cohesion, and too many of them were open to overtures from Rome. One by one its members slipped off, and in time it was compelled to cease for lack of numbers. It performed, however, an immense service. Its place of session, just across the Rhine from Germany, made it an object of profound attention throughout the freer Europe north of the Alps, while the evils which the council labored in vain to remove became more than ever a source of sorrow and of heroism in dealing with the universal spiritual declension. All these three councils failed of their prime object, but they revealed to the world the fact that no prospect for reform could exist in any new council. The only way open for improvement was now clear, the independence of the individual reformer. The personal conscience was compelled to fight, with single lance, for the revival of truth and virtue. It was the hour when the fate of modern times depended on the one man. End of chapter 2part three chapter four of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter four the german reformation martin luther from his birth to the retirement in the wartburg castle fourteen eighty three to fifteen twenty all the teutonic countries had been getting ripe for the great ecclesiastical revolt and central Germany now became the theatre for the Reformation. The popular mind was so fully ready that the only great need now was a man of sufficient courage, ability, and singleness of purpose to become the representative of his generation. Martin Luther responded to the universal aspiration for a leader to guide into new and safe paths. Luther was born in Eiselben, Saxony, November 12, 1483, 
and died in the same place february eighteenth fifteen forty six his father first a slate cutter in mora and then a miner in eiselben was a man of humble tastes and scanty means he belonged to the peasant class the boy martin in later life recalled the fact that his mother used to carry on her back the wood necessary for the comfort of the humble home in this son were combined the characteristics of both the northern and the southern german there were the calm judgment the solid sense and the sturdy valor of the colder blood of the north but with these he possessed a gentle cheerful and tuneful nature a sympathetic and social feeling which stood him in good stead in his later struggles as a boy he was fond of the village sports had an ardent love for his friends and as keen an antipathy towards his foes possessed a quaint and grotesque humor and innocent wit and to the day of his death took pride in his lowly ancestry and modest home his nature seemed to derive its very grandeur and ruggedness from the neighboring Harz mountains and its depth from the mines beneath his father's thatched cottage when the burden of his great mission was upon him and he was the trusted friend of princes and the learned he was accustomed to say i am a peasant's son my father grandfather and remote ancestors were nothing but veritable peasants but little liberty was granted to the boy of genius and destiny his parents made free use of the rod and thereby nearly spoiled their child the least indiscretion brought severe castigation his mother once punished him because of some trouble about a nut until the blood flowed in the years of his strong manhood when looking back upon this harshness he saw the mistake of his parents and said my parents severity made me timid their sternness and the strict life they led made me afterwards go into a monastery and become a monk they heartily meant it well but they did not understand the art of adjusting their punishments but with all the severity of the home these parents seemed to recognize the genius of their son they determined that he should have an education and designed him for the law in fourteen ninety seven he was sent to magdeburg in order that he might prepare for the university but the expense was too great for the means of his parents and he was removed to eisenach where he could live with relatives and attend school at less expense it was then the custom of the poorer scholars in thuringia to go about the streets and sing at the doors of the people for alms young martin needed such help and a wealthy lady ursula Cata, was so charmed by his singing that she took him to her own home where he had the advantages of an excellent teacher in fifteen o one he went to the university of erfurt one of the centres of humanistic learning in northern europe he here came in contact with the advancing learning of the times and was captivated by it neither mind nor heart had rest with great nervous power he went from one science to another and mastered each with a thoroughness and dispatch which amazed the professors the department which he made his specialty was philosophy on finishing his course and taking his degree as master of arts he bade the world farewell and in fifteen o five entered the augustinian cloister as a monk the resolution seemed to be instantaneous but his later confessions reveal the fact that he had been led gradually by certain providential experiences such as the death of a friend at his side by lightning to take this step he now subjected himself to severe discipline denied himself all comforts tortured his body and fasted and prayed to a degree that almost proved fatal to his life but he kept at his studies in this respect differing from his brethren who said if this brother studies he will rule us the words were a prophecy which was literally fulfilled in fifteen o eight luther was called to wittenberg as professor while in erfurt he had come to a knowledge of the bible 
and had seen the difference between the simple gospel and the life and practice of the church of his times. His mind was in doubt. He continued his ascetic life and waited for the light. The University of Wittenberg had been founded by Frederick the Wise in 1502, and, like Erfurt, was now alive with the new learning of the age. Here Luther had a field, the first of his life, for his remarkable powers. He carried with him the timidity of the monk, but the fire and magnetism of the master mind. He was so diffident that only the greatest persuasion could induce him to preach. You will kill me, he said to Stampitz, who had been the cause of his call to Wittenberg. I shall not go on with it for a quarter of a year. Luther had been in Wittenberg two years when he started on a journey to Rome. To one of his thirsting mind and religious fervor, such an opportunity was hailed with inexpressible delight. He had been doubting the practices of the church, but no thought of keen criticism had arisen in his mind. He was still the devoted servant of his order, the Augustans, and a firm and full believer in the one Roman Catholic Church. When he caught his first view of the Eternal City, he fell upon the earth, and, with uplifted hands, cried out, I greet thee, holy Rome, thrice holy from the blood of the martyrs which has been shed in thee. The scenes which now passed before his eyes had but little influence in strengthening his love for the Church. He saw too much ostentation and pride to satisfy his self-denying nature. While ascending the Scala Santa, or Pilate's staircase, as a reverent and penitential pilgrim, the words came to him, The just shall live by faith. He descended the steps, left Rome, and betook himself back to Germany. But he did not repudiate the authority of the Roman Church at that time. Coastlin says, the exhibition of ecclesiastical corruption which he saw did not at the time occasion any revolt in his mind. Luther was still a devoted monk, but had felt the power of a new life. He did not dream of separation from the church. He continued his lectures on the biblical books, and fascinated his hearers by the boldness and novelty of his views. His life now moved on without excitement or serious change for seven years. All the while he was growing in the confidence of the students and in fame abroad. His lectures were attractive beyond those of any one else, while his sermons, differing by their plain speech and direct presentation of the truth from the current preaching, were heard with an intensity of interest new in Wittenberg, or any other part of Germany, since the mystics. During this quiet interval a new indulgence was published in Germany, and the tickets of pardon were sold in the public places of the land. Between 1500 and 1517 no less than five indulgences extraordinary had been published, and put up for sale to any buyer. They were wonderfully successful. The money flowed in from every quarter. The cause of the indulgences was alleged to be for defense against the Turks, but it was a singular fact that it had to go by the very circuitous way of Rome and the papal treasure box. The bishops cried out, half in joy and half in complaint, against the weight of the silver, hundred weights of German coin fly light as feathers over the Alps, and no bearer of the heaviest burdens, not even Atlas himself, can drag such heaps of money. The sale of the indulgences aroused Luther's nature to a high pitch of excitement. He was now ready for his mission. He went over the whole case against Rome, as he saw it, and arraigned the church in a bill of charges, which he called his ninety-five theses. They were directed principally against the sale of indulgences, but they included the whole burden of Luther's soul. He insisted that the church taught the truth, but that there were excrescences which must be removed. On October 31, 1517, he nailed his theses to the door of the Schlosskirche of Wittenberg. Now began the storm which lasted until the day of his death. 
The theses were soon heard from in Rome, where the Pope wrote of him to the elector of Saxony as that notorious son of wickedness. He was ordered to recant, but replied, I cannot recall. He was ordered to Rome, but only wrote a respectful letter in reply to the command. He was summoned to a disputation in Leipzig in 1519, with Eck, where he attacked the doctrines of the primacy of the Pope, indulgences, and purgatory. The humanist Mosulanus thus described the young monk on this first great appearance before the world. He was of medium height. His face and whole body were as thin as a skeleton, caused by long study and much care. His voice was clear. His address bore every mark of great learning and acquaintance with the Bible. His bearing was friendly and attractive. He was full of vitality and calm and joyous amid the threats of his enemies, as one would be who undertakes great things with God's help. In controversy, he was defiant and incisive, as a theologian ought to be. Luther left Leipzig with a deeper determination than ever to continue his work. He still had no thought of leaving the church. He would be an obedient son and servant, and thought only of ever remaining in fellowship with the received faith. But he was carried on by the force of his convictions, and by some providential occurrences, in which indeed he seemed to have little part. He now struck the most vital blow of all. He attacked Rome in a new department. He wrote an Address to the Nobles of the German People, in which he advocated the suppression of nunneries, abolition of the interdict and ban, independence of the temporal power, and the denial of transubstantiation and other false teachings of Rome. This was rebellion, and shortly afterwards brought its natural punishment from Rome, excommunication. Luther said, I would regard the Pope as Pope, but they want me to regard him as God. He posted a notice on the church door, inviting the people to go out with him, in solemn procession, through the Elster Gate, and, in presence of the citizens, professors, and students, publicly burn the papal bull. This notice was observed, and, in presence of the multitude, Luther burned the bull on December 10, 1520. But Rome was even worse off without him than with him. Charles V had been elected Emperor of Germany on June 28, 1519, and it was now a serious question what position he should take as to the reform. He was a Habsburg, and therefore a rigid Roman Catholic, but he was also diplomatic, and was determined to do nothing that would endanger his political strength. He turned the matter over carefully in his mind, and, as at the Diet at Worms, April 1521, his election contract was to be signed, and such additional business transacted as related to the affairs of the church, he resolved, before the council met, that he would give Luther a hearing and condemn his doctrines. Luther was summoned to Worms, and promised a safe conduct. Before starting, he wrote to Spalatin, If his majesty calls me to account, so that I am ruined, and am looked upon, on account of my answer, as an enemy to the empire, still I am ready to come, for I have no intention of fleeing, nor of leaving the word in danger, but I mean to confess it unto death, so far as Christ's grace sustains me but I am certain that the bloodhounds will not rest until they have put me to death. His friends reminded him of Huss's death at the Council of Constance, but their remonstrance had no influence. He would go to Worms, though the devils were as many as tiles on the housetops. Every argument was used, threats were multiplied, but all to no avail. When he had finished his defense, he said, here I stand, I cannot do otherwise. God help me. Amen. Carlyle describes the historical significance of this occasion, and the importance of Luther's firm attitude, in the following words. It was the greatest moment in the modern history of men. English Puritanism, England and its parliaments, 
Americas and vast work these two centuries, French Revolution, Europe and its work everywhere at present, the germ of it all lay there. Had Luther in that moment done otherwise, it had all been otherwise. The decree of the Diet at Worms against Luther was as follows. Thus this individual, not a man, but one like the devil in human form, under a monk's cowl, has gathered into one noxious mass a number of heretics who have been long concealed, and hold most damnable heresies. And he has even devised some fresh ones, under pretense of preaching faith, which he has industriously made every one believe, in order that he may destroy the true faith, and, under the name and guise of evangelical doctrine, put an end to all evangelical peace and love and all good order. The sentence of ban and double ban was pronounced upon him and every friend and adherent to his heresy, and, after a certain date, May 14th, all persons were cautioned against harboring or protecting him, and he was ordered to be delivered up to the officers wherever found. When Luther was returning from Worms, and before the publication of the ban against him, some knights, at the instance of Frederick the Wise, took him to the Wartburg Castle on the heights above Eisenach, lest he might be captured by his enemies and possibly suffer death. He here lived as Junker George, Squire George, a sobriquet given him by the jovial knights. He used his pen vigorously during his eight months in Patmos, as he called his sojourn. No day was without its line. While here he translated the New Testament entire, and parts of the old. The New Testament was printed in September 1522, and did more than anything else to make the Reformation permanent. It went through sixteen original editions in ten years, so great was the thirst for the word, and the reprints in the same time amounted to fifty-four. Luther's Bible was translated directly from the Hebrew and the Greek, with wonderful clearness and force of style, and is a fairly faithful version. It almost created the German language, crystallizing it in forms of strong, pithy, and expressive speech. End of chapter 4part three chapter five of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five luther further labors and personal character fifteen twenty to fifteen forty six luther was now compelled to pay the penalty of every great reformer he had to shield his work from the errors of his friends karlstadt a firm adherent of the Protestant cause, began to think that Luther did not go far enough. He declared that the Reformation was still tinged too strongly with Romanism, and, at the head of a fanatical band, the Zwickan prophets, he made a fierce fight against Luther. Luther wrote to them from his Patmos in December 1521 as follows. This business has been undertaken in a harem scarum fashion, with great rashness and violence. I do not like it at all, and, that you may know it, when it comes to the point, I shall not stand by you in this business. You have set about it without me, and so you may see how you can get out of it without me. Believe me, I know the devil well enough. It is he alone who has set out to bring disgrace on the word." the fanatics would tear down every reminder of Romanism, the ornamentation, pictures, and everything else but the bare walls of the churches. They would make such a thorough work with Rome that not a trace would be left of the old order. They would destroy every work of Christian art, in sculpture or on canvas, wherever found. They turned prophets and saw visions. Luther, from his watchtower, saw the danger that threatened the whole Protestant cause, and was ill at ease. He would stay no longer in the Wartburg. Duke George was ready to arrest him, wherever he could be found at large, but Luther was willing to take the risk. 
his true friend the elector cautioned him of his danger from duke george but the reformer wrote back one thing i can say for myself if things are at leipzig as they are in wittenberg i would still go there even if it rained duke george's for nine days and every one of them were nine times as fierce as he he plainly told the anxious elector that he did not want his protection that there was no real protection in a ruler of such faith and that he luther would go under god's protection to wittenberg he kept his promise on march third fifteen twenty two he left the wartburg and proceeding without a guard reached wittenberg in safety the condition of things was alarming the zwickan prophets had frightened the reformers melanchthon was too weak in nerve to withstand their boldness he could not resist them and trembled for the whole protestant fabric the prophets declared that they had received special revelations from god to go even further than religious reform to resist all civil authority and set up a temporal kingdom when luther appeared in wittenberg it brought confidence to his friends and to protestants he was wise in every movement and did not even mention the names of the fanatics for a week he publicly preached against them but with consummate tact and as a result they left the city a disorganized mass the german peasantry had long been oppressed by the princes and had several times risen in revolt in the years fourteen seventy six fourteen ninety one fourteen ninety eight and fifteen o three they had rebelled against their rulers but were overcome and yet were kept down only by violent means the peasantry saw in the present religious convulsion another opportunity for revolt a league was formed in fifteen fourteen by fifteen twenty four the insurrection broke out publicly and by the spring of fifteen twenty five it was general the peasants were largely in the protestant interest they pleaded the bible as their justification in demanding liberty of conscience and freedom from civil oppression luther was now put upon trial in a new direction he studied the matter closely and then took the side of law and order but in an address to the princes told them of the wrong of oppression and cautioned moderation in dealing with the fanatics the peasants were fully conquered and their leader munzer was beheaded luther now addressed himself more than ever to severe literary labors he saw that his work needed consolidation he must instruct the people who were looking to him for spiritual guidance the munster fanaticism was proof of the great need of protestantism for the most judicious and safe instruction so by pen and speech he wrought with prodigious vigor through the kindness of friends his sermons and lectures were published immediately after delivery they were robust in style and consisted of strong and often homely speech the people read each word with the gladness that came from an immediate understanding his translation of the bible the strongest and most nervous and comprehensible ever executed went all over the land his principle in translation was contained in his own words for translating the bible we must have a pious true industrious reverent christian learned experienced and disciplined heart we must ask the mother in the house the children in the alley the common man in the marketplace how to speak german and put the language they speak in his own jaws as a specimen of luther's care that he might translate the bible into a language which the people might understand he had a butcher kill some sheep for him and tell him the names of every part in order that he might translate accurately those parts of leviticus relating to the jewish sacrifices he wrote his friend spalatin a request to give him the names and minute descriptions of all the precious stones contained in revelation twenty one as constituting the walls of the celestial city luther's works multiplied rapidly about one hundred and twenty separate writings appeared from his pen 
his smaller and larger catechisms became a household possession throughout german protestantism his thirty hymns were sung in palace and hut with equal joy the favorites were his martial hymn a mighty fortress is our god a bulwark never failing his christmas hymn from heaven above to earth i come to bear good news to every home his children's hymn sleep well my dear and the hymn of providence flung to the heedless winds or on the waters east luther's writings were born of the occasion he saw deeply and felt intensely he held himself ready to sing or speak or write as he perceived a need and felt an inspiration he thought in images and all his works abound in striking pictures to him the devil was no myth but a visible creature whom his own eyes had seen all too frequently hence he frequently addressed him as mr or madame devil luther's commentaries were practical expositions little space being given to philological discussions it was his habit to present the argument of a book in a full introduction and in language that the uneducated could understand his interpretations were crisp and strong declarations of the author's meaning he gave conclusions and but little of the process by which he reached them luther's personal characteristics were of a very striking character he was of ardent and impulsive nature and called things by the first name that came to him he was born for war and yet was always sighing for peace his element was the smoke and flame and violence of the hot battlefield yet strangely enough he thought himself very mild in language when a friend once expostulated with him on the harshness of his language against the papacy he replied in all seriousness on the contrary i complain that alas i am too mild i wish that i could breathe out lightning and that every word were a thunderbolt a hair-splitting theologian once quoted to him st augustine's reply to the question where god was before heaven was created that he was in himself and then asked the reformer what his answer would be luther replied he was building hell for such idle presumptuous frivolous and inquisitive spirits as you his opinions were very decided concerning some physicians alack for him that depends on physic when i was sick at smallcald the doctors made me take as much medicine as though i had been a great bull tis these wretches that people the graveyards though able cautious and experienced physicians are the gift of god those without fear of god are mere homicides i consider that exercise and change of air do more good than all their purgings and bleedings when i feel indisposed i generally manage to get around by a strict diet going to bed early and keeping my mind at rest in faith martin luther was as fervent as any crusader in the heat of conflict the time of prayer was his supreme hour every prayer was an importunity he would not think of silence much less refusal he argued with god and showed him how unlike himself it would be not to grant his petitions he caught hold of the very robe of the master and would not let go or rather he violently grasped the divine arm with both hands and held it until his prayer was answered he had the habit of recording his wants in the form of a catalogue and taking them to god in order as petitions which god could hardly be true to his own honour if he failed to answer he was overheard to offer the following prayer just before his appearance in the presence of the council at worms almighty everlasting god how terrible this world is how it would open its jaws to devour me and how weak is my trust in thee o thou my god help me against all the wisdom of this world do thou the work it is thine not mine i have nothing to bring me here i have no controversy to maintain not i with the great ones of the earth i too would fain that my days should glide along happy and calm 
but this cause is thine it is righteous it is eternal o lord help me thou that art faithful thou that art unchangeable it is not in any man i trust o god my god dost thou not hear me art thou dead no thou art hiding thyself o lord my god where art thou come come thou hast chosen me for this work i know it o then arise and work be thou on my side for the sake of thy beloved son jesus christ who is my defence my shield and my fortress i am ready ready to forsake life for thy truth patient as a lamb though the world should be full of demons though my body should be stretched on the rack cut into pieces consumed to ashes the soul is thine for this i have the assurance of thy word amen o god help thou me amen and then as if in soliloquy amen amen that means yes yes this shall be done when luther saw the great need of sustaining and building up the people who were following his leadership he devised wise plans for ecclesiastical organization in fifteen twenty seven he and melanchthon at the instance of the elector john drew up a plan of general visitation an order of doctrine and service was established parochial schools were instituted catechetical service was enjoined and full arrangements made for a complete ecclesiastical life at the diet of augsburg fifteen thirty the augsburg confession drawn up by melanchthon was adopted for the protestants of germany in the convention at smalcald the protestants formed a compact which was the basis of their subsequent civil and ecclesiastical unity the theological standard of the protestants was the loci theologici of melanchthon luther never undertook a systematic treatment of doctrine but committed this work to his nearest friend melanchthon who was a compliment to him in many other respects luther's private life was of a piece with his public career his labors before the world drew all their inspiration from his pure and simple home life in fifteen twenty five he married catherine von bora a nun of the cloister of nipchen and henceforth his home became the centre of his labours and the rallying place of friends his children were his loving companions in the intervals of his engrossing labours he would sing and getting new inspiration would again take up his pen walther the electoral chapel master who was deputed to assist luther in the arrangement of music for public worship thus wrote of him many a precious hour did he sing i have often seen him the dear man become so happy and transported in spirit that he could not get enough of it he knew how to say wondrous things of music luther was especially fond of having the students visit him and sit at his table he was always thinking of others and how he might instruct and comfort his engrossing labors bore heavily upon him his early ascetic life left an impaired constitution which he was never able fully to restore he went on a journey to assist in reconciling a difficulty between the mansfield counts and died from home but in the place where he was born he breathed his last after thanking god for the revelation of his son and for having given him the privilege of testifying for him before the world and the pope End of chapter 5「three chapter six of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six melanchthon and other german reformers philip melanchthon the friends and helpers of luther came from every class of all these melanchthon was destined to be of most service not only as an immediate co-laborer with luther but as a promoter of the general cause of protestantism he was born in breton south germany in fourteen ninety seven and was educated at forsheim heidelberg and tubingen 
when only seventeen years of age he became a professor in the tubingen university and began to attract attention by his remarkable knowledge of the classic writers he edited terence and other writers and threw a new light upon both greek and roman writers his fame spread abroad into other countries erasmus wrote of him the following what hopes may we not conceive of philip melanchthon though as yet very young almost a boy he was only eighteen but equally to be admired for his proficiency in both languages what quickness of invention what purity of diction what vastness of memory what variety of reading what modesty and gracefulness of behavior and what a princely mind to ecolampadius the same man erasmus wrote of melanchthon i have already the highest opinion and cherish the most magnificent hopes so much so that i am persuaded christ designs this youth to excel us all he will totally eclipse erasmus he was called to wittenberg as professor in fifteen eighteen and the same week began to lecture he produced a profound impression immediately luther heard him and was charmed by him a friendship immediately sprang up between them which was never broken until death terminated the union of twenty-eight years the annals of literature and theology do not furnish a more beautiful illustration of the manner in which a great work can be performed by the combined action of two men than we find in the case of luther and melanchthon there was no resemblance between them in quality of mind or temperament the one thing which they had in common was the great cause of reform and to that all other interests and gifts were made subordinate the labors of melanchthon were directed at once to the improvement of the methods of study in the university his students increased rapidly and soon rose to about twenty five hundred he insisted that the old scholastic philosophy was ridiculous and consisted of terms rather than ideas he urged the students to the fountainheads of truth and placed before them the bible as the only source of real knowledge he then entered into the strife concerning indulgences luther going before him and melanchthon following closely with his philological lore his fine logic and his marvellous unfoldings of scriptural truth the life of melanchthon was now so thoroughly identified with that of luther that it is difficult to separate the two they lived in the same town wittenberg they were in constant consultation each doing what he was most able to do and both working with unwearied zeal for the triumph of the cause to which they gave their lives during luther's stay in the wartburg melanchthon was sorely grieved he needed luther's martial spirit his strong will his quick intuitions as to the best measures to win new victories hence he wrote such words as these i feel the need i have of good advice our elijah is confined at a distance from us though we are expecting and anticipating his return what shall i say more his absent absolutely torments me on the other hand luther felt the need of melanchthon's calm spirit and among many other words of the same character he wrote from the wartburg for the glory of the word of god and the mutual consolation of myself and others i would rather be consumed in a blazing fire than remain here half alive and utterly useless if i perish the prophet of christ will not perish and you i hope like another elisha will succeed elijah luther however was sometimes out of patience with melanchthon's great infirmity despondency and wrote him the following in reply to melanchthon's gloomy picture of the protestant outlook let those who please talk against us but why are we to be always looking on the dark side of things why not indulge hopes of better times he compared paul's appearance with melanchthon's in the following words paul must have been an insignificant looking person with no presence a poor dry little man like master philip while luther was still in the wartburg he nevertheless longed for the society of his poor dry little man more than for all the robust men of the fatherland 
so when he returned to wittenberg and put the fanatics to shame and flight he wrote with great joy to a relative i am in amsdorf's house with my beloved friend philip melanchthon melanchthon's regularity in work was a marvel he was seldom known to miss a lecture from any cause on the day in fifteen twenty when he was married to catherine crappen the burgomaster's daughter he departed for once from his inflexible punctuality and posted on the roster the following release of his students from hearing him on paul's epistle to the romans a studiis hodie facit oti gradia philippus nec nobis pauli dogmata sacra legit rest from your studies philip says you may will read no lectures on st paul today year after year passed by and melanchthon was always at his post lecturing to the many students who had come from different countries to hear him if in the interests of the good cause of reform he was absent for a day or two he always returned to his post with renewed vigor his lecture room was his throne he was devoted to theological students and made them his trusted friends in his last illness he thought of them and wished when too weak to be dressed and deliver a lecture to them he died in fifteen sixty a short time before his death he wrote his reasons why it is better for the christian to die than to live the column on the right containing the blessings gained by dying and that on the left the evils avoided evils removed you leave your sins you are delivered from controversy and the rage of theologians advantage is gained you come to the light you will see god you will contemplate the son of god you will understand those wonderful mysteries which you cannot comprehend in this life namely why we are made as we are and the union of the two natures in christ no man appreciated melanchthon's character and work more highly than luther of his theological commonplaces loci theologici luther said for theological study it is the best book next to the bible melanchthon has no ground for fear of melanchthon's books as a whole he said i love his books better than my own he ploughs and plants and sows and waters with joy while i am only a coarse forester digging up the roots and tearing out the thorns melanchthon was the theological builder for the german reformation he wrote the two symbols of the lutheran church the augsburg confession fifteen thirty and the apology for the augsburg confession both admirable statements of doctrine and he presented the so-called saxon confession a declaration of the protestant faith to the council of trent fifteen fifty one the friendship between luther and melanchthon as a powerful factor towards the success of the reformation was only an illustration of a general fact there were other attachments not less charming the whole period of the planting of protestantism abounds in remarkable adjustments and surrenders of individual tastes and capacities for the achievement of a great end each man was as necessary to the rest as their joint work was necessary to the success of the whole movement it was a harmony of opposites and as complete a providential blending of diverse natures as the world had seen since the days of the apostles all temperaments and all classes of society were drawn upon to make the one harmonious picture of a young and vigorous protestantism some of luther's first and strongest friends were of the princely and noble class of the rulers we count no less than six who were devoted friends of the new movement for the liberation of the conscience and followed the leadership of luther namely george maurice frederick the wise john and john frederick all princes of saxony and philip of hesse while enjoying the full confidence of these men luther never faltered in the assertion of personal independence he never compromised a principle in fact he gained the confidence of the princes not merely by his valiant defense of the truth but by his candor towards them with the princes we must not omit to join two fearless knights as friend of protestantism 
Ulrich von Hutten, and Franz von Sickingen. These men offered Luther the use of their swords and a home in their castles, but he declined them both, saying that his was a spiritual conflict. In Luther's immediate circle, as co-workers with him, the scholars Justice Jonas, George Rohrer, Cruciger, Forster, and Bugenhagen stand next to Melanchthon. These men were mostly won to the cause of reform by the reading of Luther's writings, or the hearing of his lectures, or by his hymns, and, having once come within the charm of his person, became his willing co-operators in the various departments for which each was fitted. Bugenhagen was elected pastor in Wittenberg through Luther's influence, and was a powerful organizer of the new Protestant church in North Germany. Jonas was a professor in the university, and through his eloquence the city of Halle was led to adopt the Protestant cause. Lucas Cranach, the most celebrated German painter of his times, was an intimate friend of Luther, and through him we have accurate portraits of the parents, the entire family of Luther, and nearly all his friends and fellow workers. Cranach had a keen sense of the grotesque and satirical, and it was his pleasure to furnish woodcuts as adjuncts to Luther's stinging words against the abuses of the times. End of chapter 6「Part three, Chapter seven of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter seven: The Reformation in German Switzerland. The political condition of Switzerland was highly favorable to the introduction of Protestant ideas. The country was divided into cantons, or districts, an arrangement that had existed from early times. Each canton was, in a measure, independent of the rest, and yet was connected in a federation with all the others. While the Roman Catholic Church held sway over all, the people of each canton claimed the right of deciding what their confession should be. The spirit pervading all the cantons was that of civil liberty, and so, when the Protestant doctrines descended from the north, the Swiss saw in them a system of religion closely allied to their political traditions and preferences. Freedom in the state, as the Swiss mind saw it, was inseparable from freedom of conscience. In Zurich, the largest city in eastern Switzerland, the doctrines of the German reformers, and especially the works of Luther, took strong hold. The people, speaking the same language with the Germans, read the earliest Protestant writings with interest, while correspondence with the Reformers fanned the flame. Ulrich Zwingli was the leader of the new movement in Switzerland. He was born in Wildhaus in 1484. In his ninth year he went to Wesson, where he enjoyed the instruction of his uncle, the dean of that place. He was designed by his parents for the priesthood, and no pains were spared to fit him for his calling. In 1494 he went to Basel, and for three years was a student in the St. Theodore School. He then went to Bern, where the celebrated humanist Heinrich Wolfen introduced him to a profound knowledge of the classics. He then went to Vienna, where, having Latinized his name, he appeared as the student Congentius. In 1502 he returned to Basel, and, in addition to prosecuting further studies, taught in the Latin school of St. Martin. Weitenbach came to Basel as professor, and he entered a bold protest against indulgences. Zwingli came under his influence, and from that time onward it is likely that the seeds of Protestantism lay in his mind. In 1506 he became priest at Glarus, and remained there ten years. All the while he was an ardent student. He was enraptured with the new humanism, and yet he regarded it only as an aid to the study of the Bible. He wrote at this time, Nothing but God shall prevent me from acquiring Greek, not for fame, but for the sake of the Holy Scriptures. 
In 1516, Zwingli went to the celebrated Abbey of Einsiedeln, which is situated on a lofty mountain on the north side of Lake Zurich, and is still visited annually by many thousands of pilgrims. Zwingli, seeing the blind idolatry of the worshippers of the miraculous image of the Virgin Mary in that abbey, began to preach against the superstition. Zwingli awakened violent opposition in Einsiedeln. He was branded as a heretic, and yet was made by Pucci, the Pope's agent, the object of great attention and flattery. The hope was to conquer him by dissimulation. But Zwingli saw through the deception, and kept steadily on in his course. He did not remain, however, any longer in Eisedown, but moved to Zurich, 1519, where he was priest in the cathedral. Here his sermons created the greatest sensation for their freedom of utterance and evangelical tone, and were attended by multitudes from all parts of the country. Indulgences were just now sold in public in that city, and Zwingli proclaimed against them. Zurich was ready for the Reformation, and it was only waiting for a leader. The humanist circles were tired of the old darkness, and were eager for the light of the gospel. The uneducated masses were overwhelmed with the opposition of the Habsburgs and the priesthood. I wish, said Zwingli, that they had bored a hole through the Pope's letter, and hung it to his messenger's back, that he might carry it home. If a wolf is seen in the country, you sound an alarm, that it may be caught, but you will not defend yourselves from the wolves that ruin the bodies and souls of men. How appropriate their red hats and cloaks! If you shake them, out fall ducats. If you wring them, out flows the blood of your sons, brothers, and friends. Such language could not be tolerated. Maledictions were hurled against Zwingli. But he continued to preach, and the people thronged to hear him. He was fearless, scriptural, and discreet. He was now drawn within the circle of reformers, and at once became their head among the Swiss. He preached strongly against indulgences, mariolatry, clerical celibacy, and, indeed, the whole cluster of those perverted doctrines against which Luther was warring in the north. Mass was abolished in Zurich, and, one by one, the institutions of Romanism fell to the ground. Zwingli's sixty-seven articles committed him so thoroughly to the Protestant cause that no retracing of his steps was supposable. He was very busy with his pen. His choosing and freedom of foods, his Christian introduction, and true and false religion, were masterpieces of polemical literature. The simplicity of Zwingli's views of worship was a fundamental quality. His repugnance to Romanism was so strong that he resolved on a complete renunciation. He would have no pictures or organs or bells in the churches, or any reminder of the old faith. He was morbidly intense in his dread of all materialistic elements. He differed radically from Luther on the doctrine of the Lord's Supper, the German reformer holding to consubstantiation, while Zwingli regarded the bread and wine as only symbols of the body and blood of Christ. The two reformers came into open difference. A discussion was arranged, and they met in the castle of Marburg, October 1529, where each defended his views. No compromise was reached. Luther, with a piece of chalk in his hand, wrote in great characters on the table, Hoc est corpus metum, this is my body, and with this appeal to Christ's own words, by which to defend his belief in consubstantiation, the discussion closed. Henceforward, there was no agreement between German and Swiss theology on the Lord's Supper. Luther and Zwingli returned to their fields of labor, each as firmly intent upon the one work of reform, as though he did not differ from his brother on non-essentials in theological interpretation. Busser tried very hard to harmonize the Swiss and German differences, but failed completely. The Helvetic Confession, adopted in 1536, 
became the final standard of doctrine for the Protestants throughout eastern Switzerland. The religious conflict in the eastern canons became so bitter that it grew into an appeal to arms. Zurich, which had been included in the bishopric of Constance, threw off all episcopal allegiance, banished Latin from its churches, and burned the time-honored relics. Some of the eastern canons followed the lead of Zurich, while others remained firm to Catholicism. The result was a civil war. The Roman Catholic cantons were aided by the Pope, the Austrian Empire, and even by Spain, while France and England helped the Protestant cantons. In the Battle of Capel, near Zurich, October 11, 1531, the Protestant army was almost annihilated and Zwingli was killed. Yet a moral victory remained with the Protestants, inasmuch as they were allowed by the Treaty of Capel the free exercise of their religion in their own cantons, while restoring Catholicism in the five cantons. Basel was an important centre of Protestant movements in German Switzerland. The council which had been held there in the preceding century had left a strong desire for reform among the people. The university was a rallying place of minds intent upon the liberty of science. Erasmus lived in its cloisters for a time, and gave his scholarly energies to the good work. Hedio, Capito, and Rublin preached the new doctrines with energy and success. Ecolampadius, though a German by birth, became pastor of St. Martin's Church, and was the acknowledged leader of the cause in the city. In other parts of eastern Switzerland, the Reformation spread with amazing rapidity, and, in addition to Zurich and Basel, the cantons of St. Gall and Schaffhausen renounced allegiance to the Roman Catholic Church, and introduced Protestant worship and doctrines throughout their territory. End of chapter 7「Part Three, Chapter Eight of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eight: The Reformation in French Switzerland. The influence of the German reformers was felt more slowly among the French-speaking people of Switzerland than among those who spoke German. The difference in language made the work of indoctrination no easy process. The course of Protestant evangelism in French Switzerland was simple. An eastern current, setting in from German Switzerland, and a western one coming directly from France and entering by Geneva as a door. The two met in Bern, which city at once became a centre for the dissemination of new doctrines throughout the French cantons. After the Battle of Capel, the movement spread rapidly and went as far as Geneva, where it allied itself with the forces already in operation there. Very soon a strong Protestant party arose in that city, which was firm in the beginning, and never wavered until it gained a complete victory. Geneva had long been an object of the ambition of the Dukes of Savoy, an historical struggle later commemorated by Byron in the incident which suggested his prisoner of Chillon, an historical poem in which Bonavard tells the sad story of a long period of persecution for conscience's sake. My limbs are bowed, though not with toil, but rusted with a vile repose, for they have been a dungeon's spoil, and mine has been the fate of those to whom the goodly earth and air are banned and barred, forbidden fair." but this was for my father's faith I suffered chains and courted death. That father perished at the stake, for tenets he would not forsake, and for the same his lineal race in darkness found a dwelling place. We were seven, who now are one, six in youth and one in age, finished as they had begun, proud of persecution's rage, one in fire and two in field, their belief with blood have sealed, dying as their father died, for the God their foes denied. Three were in a dungeon cast, 
of whom this wreck is left the last. A religious convention was held in Geneva in 1534. Farel, who was the representative of the new doctrines, labored by speech and pen for their introduction. As in eastern Switzerland, so here, the people were their own rulers, and had resisted all attempts at absorption by ambitious princes. Popular meetings were held, where both Romanism and Protestantism were discussed freely. The doctrines of the Reformers spread, however, until the majority of the citizens declared in favor of them. Anton Froment and Peter Vire cooperated with Farel in prosecuting the one work which lay near their hearts. All the great Reformers had a prompt and subtle perception of character. They seemed to recognize their helpers by unerring instinct. One July evening, in 1536, a French stranger called on Farel, asked advice, expressed sympathy with the Reformation, and was about to take his leave and proceed on his journey. But Farel was so attracted to him that he invited him to spend a few days. This stranger was John Calvin. He was born in Noyon, France, 1509, and died in Geneva, 1564. He received an excellent education, and was thoroughly prepared for the practice of the law. His acquaintance with the classics was intimate. His first work, written when a young man of twenty-three, was a critical edition of Seneca's essay on clemency. He studied in Paris, Bourget, and Orléans. While in the last place, and about the year 1532, he came in contact with a German reformer, who told him more fully than he had known the great doctrines of the Protestants of Germany. Calvin resolved to turn his attention to theology, and to accept the doctrines of the new reform. In due time we find him going abroad. There was no peace for his soul, nor any rest for his body. He went southward, and for a time stayed in Agouyam, where, for a century, there lingered certain pleasant traditions of the quiet stranger, who studied hard by day and night. He left Angouillem, and knew not whither to go. In the preface to his Psalms, he spoke of this period of early uncertainty and anguish of soul. God led me about by so many circuitous paths that I could nowhere find rest. During 1534, he wandered about in many directions, conversing with the most cultivated people, and doing all that lay in his power to communicate a knowledge of Protestant doctrines. We now find him suddenly in his native Noyon, now publishing a little book, the Psychopenia, against the French Anabaptists, now halting a while in Paris, and now, with a good prospect of being cast into prison with the rest of the outspoken foes of the papacy, resolving to go to some hidden corner in Germany, where he could study theology in quiet. Of all Calvin's friends, only one accompanied him, Louis du Tillet. He was in full sympathy with him, and the two resolved to travel together and share each other's fortunes. The two fugitives had no easy task to reach the limits of France. A servant stole all their money and ran away. They reached Basel in 1535 in a penniless condition. But the Protestants of that hospitable city had welcomed Farel ten years before, and also, later, both Cop and Corneau, and now they welcomed with the same cordiality both Calvin and his friend. While here, he devoted himself with passionate eagerness to biblical studies, for he knew that the Bible underlay the entire Protestant fabric. He heard unfavorable news from France. The Protestants were thrust into prison, and their lives were in constant danger. They were without cohesion, guidance, or intention. Calvin resolved to write a theological system for their special benefit. He now conceived the idea of his Institutes of the Christian Religion, which he published in 1536, and which became the doctrinal standard for all the Reformed churches of the continent and Great Britain. 
Calvin had no great sense of relief when his book was completed. His work was published under the assumed name of Martianus Lucanius, and so retired had been his manner of living, and so timid his nature, that no one knew of his plan or who this new author might be. Probably to avoid discovery, as much as for any other reason, he determined to leave Basel. He, in company with his friend Dutier, journeyed to Italy and stayed a while in Ferrara, where Renata, the Protestant daughter of Louis the Twelfth of France, was Duchess. He then quietly returned to his native town, Noyon, and arranged the affairs of his now broken home, and left it forever. He took with him his brother Anton, who was in full sympathy with his views. He now turned his face towards Germany again, intending to make Strasbourg, or perhaps Basel, his permanent home. The war of this time, 1536, made his journey a dangerous undertaking, and, the way to Strasbourg being closed against him, he was compelled to go southward through Savoy. One evening, about July 1st, he arrived at Geneva. He expected to stay one night, and in the morning to proceed northward. Farrell was fascinated by his scholarship and spirit. Farrell invited Calvin to settle in Geneva, and take charge of the new Protestant church of that city. Calvin refused. He pleaded his youth, inexperience, constitutional timidity, and the need of continuing his studies in a place where he could have perfect quiet. He begged to be spared. But Farrell saw, in all these reasons, only the better ground why Calvin should stay in Geneva. He said, in great excitement, to him, You plead your studies, but, in the name of the Almighty God, I say to thee, God's curse will overtake thee if thou deprivest God's work of thy help, and seek thyself more than Christ. Farrell's threat accomplished what his persuasion could not do. The call of an hour lengthened into a visit, and the visit into a whole lifetime. The acquaintance between Farrell and Calvin ripened into one of those beautiful friendships with which Christianity has always abounded in its periods of throe and agony. By a natural gravitation of his genius, Calvin assumed the direction of the Protestant movements from Geneva as a centre. He was soon in charge of the civil administration of the city, and remained identified with the interests of its citizens until his death. Without knowing it, the group of Genevan reformers were rather waiting for guidance than following a settled policy. They were pausing for a leader, and now they found one in Calvin. To a man of less nerve and wisdom than Calvin, the work of organizing the Protestants of Geneva into a compact and aggressive church would have been a hopeless undertaking. He saw that the first need was a common platform of faith, a confession. In three months' time, the Genovese possessed their confession, in twenty-one articles. Farrell's name stood as the responsible author, but Calvin's exact style and strong spirit pervade every part. On November 10th, it was placed before the city council for adoption, and was accepted. Then came new measures, one after another, in rapid succession. A plan for popular education, a scheme of organization of the church in Geneva, measures of discipline and support, and a catechism. Civil regulations were shaped according to the new ecclesiastical constitution, and some of the regulations were severe and exacting in the extreme. The theologians were novices at civil legislation, but there was no want of Spartan inflexibility. The Libertines, a political party of Geneva, who were opposed to the strict life of the Reformers, and saw in the Reformation a restraint on the morals of the people, arose against both Farrell and Calvin, and secured their banishment. Farrell, after a stay of seven weeks in Basel, went to Neuchâtel, and thence to Metz, where, and in the neighboring Gores, he labored zealously for the gospel. Calvin went to Strasbourg, 
where he had once found a refuge from persecution at home. The two reformers were at once brought into close relations with the Strasbourg circle of Protestant leaders, Bousset, Capito, and Hedio. It was a happy company. Calvin calculated on a permanent stay there, for they saw little hope of the early rise of Protestant authority in Geneva. He took papers of citizenship as a Strasbourg resident, and later, in 1540, was married to Idolette von Buren, a lady in every way worthy of his confidence and affection. He became pastor of the French emigrant church, and, with his practical duties, was absorbed in his studies. In due time, the people of Geneva repented of their error in banishing the two reformers, for they found they needed them for the government of the city. Calvin was recalled, but, with true nobility of soul, refused to accept the offer unless Farel, his early benefactor, was also permitted to return. The same liberty was therefore granted Farel, though it is not known that he accepted the privilege. But Calvin was welcomed back to Geneva amid the rejoicings of the whole population. Henceforth, Calvin stood at the head of affairs and continued in that relation until his death. He belonged to Geneva henceforth, and Geneva to him. The organization of the Genovese Church was perfected in directions where it had proved to be weak. Calvin preached repentance, that the entire population should repent of their sins of many years, and begin to serve God anew. Viret became a powerful aid to him, and there was no want of strong and wise leadership. Laws relating to the clergy, the church, divine service, and schools were enacted, and there was no department passed by in the new administration under the direction of Calvin. A Protestant university was established in that city where young men were trained in the new doctrines of Protestantism. A theological seminary was organized in Lausanne under the direction of Viret, and strongly aggressive measures were employed to extend the work throughout the French cantons. The work left unfinished by Calvin at his death was taken up by Beza. His nature was different from that of Calvin. The latter had a broader mind, was stronger in purpose, and could have ruled a kingdom had he been born to an earthly crown. He was a master in the management of men, less by accommodating differences than by inducing men to accept his own views. His theology found its way into Germany, where it produced the Reformed Church, was taught in the University of Heidelberg, extended to Holland, formed the basis of the prevailing confession there, crossed the channel into England, exerted a marked influence on the new Anglican Church, ascended into Scotland, became the theological foundation of the Scotch National Church, came over to this country with the pilgrims in the Mayflower in 1620, and has had no small share in molding the faith of the people in the colonies and states and the territories which have grown from them. Beza, 1519-1605, carried on the work left unfinished by Calvin. He was a man of noble birth, trained for the law, of fine gifts, a scholar and a poet. In 1549 he was appointed professor of Greek in the Academy of Lausanne. He revived the sacred dramas of the Middle Ages, wrote a successful one himself, in which he cleverly contrasted Roman Catholicism and Protestantism, aided Calvin in his Commentaries on St. Paul's Epistles, and completed a metrical version of the Psalter. He made a notable defense of Protestantism before Charles the Ninth and a brilliant assembly of nobles and clergy in the Abbey of Poissy, near Paris, September 9, 1561. His great service to the Reformed faith, however, was rendered in his Latin version of the New Testament, 1556, and his edition of the Greek Testament, 1565, both fully annotated. The later editions of his Greek text were the main basis for the authorized version, 
and his Latin version also exerted a great influence upon the King James translators. The Second Helvetic Confession, adopted in 1566, became the formula of faith for the Protestants of all French Switzerland. It was in general harmony with the Augsburg Confession, but with more emphasis on the doctrine of election. The Protestantism of Geneva and other parts of French Switzerland exerted a strong influence on the cause in France. The intercourse was constantly maintained. The works from the Genevan press, and especially the tracts, were carried by tradesmen and others into most of the southern provinces of France, and aided largely in creating a French sentiment and giving courage to the rising Huguenots. Thus Geneva, which became a refuge for the fugitive Calvin and other French Protestants, became a fort which, for generations, and indeed down to the present time, has discharged its Protestant artillery against the very country which produced and drove out its best sons and daughters. End of chapter 8「Part three, Chapter nine of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter nine: The English Reformation, First Period, fifteen o nine to fifteen fifty three. The early attempts at reformation in England were in advance of those in any other part of Europe. To that country belongs the honor of having discovered the need of a universal religious regeneration in Europe. The beginnings of reform centered in Wycliffe, born about 1315. He was a student, and afterwards professor, in Oxford. His first position of hostility to the prevailing doctrines was his declaration against the mendicant monks, who went up and down the land, extorting money from the people, and preaching against learning and progress in every form. He issued several pamphlets against them, and called loudly to his countrymen to get rid of them. So signal was his service that he was promoted to a wardenship in Oxford, namely of Balliol Hall, or College. Four years later, in 1365, he became Master of Canterbury Hall, or the Christ College of a later day. Schemes were soon in progress on the part of Langham, Archbishop of Canterbury, to eject Wycliffe, and the Pope issued a bull to that effect in 1370. Wycliffe replied by a tract against the papal policy arraying itself in hostility to the nation. The king, Edward III, was already in revolt against the Pope, and took up the cause of Wycliffe, who was appointed a royal chaplain and rector of Lutterworth. Wycliffe gained a clearer view every year of the corruptions of the church, and preached boldly against them. He was summoned by the authorities of the church for trial for heresy, but the meeting ended in a violent dispute between the Bishop of London and the Duke of Lancaster, and nothing was done. He was indicted before the Pope for nineteen alleged heresies, and in 1377 the Pope issued no less than five bulls against him. A second time he was tried, and escaped through the sympathy of the people. The court, which was held in Lambeth Palace, broke up in disorder, but not without commanding Wycliffe to stop preaching and writing. But he was, if possible, more industrious than ever. He spared no evil that he saw about him, and hurled anathemas against willful pope and deluded priesthood. He died a natural death in his own house in Lutterworth. The same council which executed Huss, that of Constance in 1415, condemned the writings of Wycliffe, and in 1428 his dust was taken from the grave and cast out upon the Avon. The event gave rise to Fuller's lines, The Avon to the Severn runs, and Severn to the sea, and Wycliffe's dust shall spread abroad, wide as the waters be. Wycliffe's greatest service to the coming Reformation was, first, his translation of the New Testament, and afterwards the whole Bible, into English. 
it was the first attempt at reproducing any considerable portion of the scriptures into the popular tongue and was a new revelation to the english people the original of his translation was the latin vulgate a very faulty source but yet good enough to create a thirst for better things and prepare the way for the pure word between wycliffe and the reformers of henry the eighth's reign lay a period of nearly two centuries but through all those years the seeds planted by wycliffe never died no great interval passed without some bold spirit arising and saying strong words of protest against the errors of the times the age was not ripe as yet for organized effort the herald's mission must first be wrought out the political character of the english reformation was a striking feature from the outset in this regard the new movement differed from that in all other countries except holland while the people were fully ready for religious revolt the first organized rupture with rome came from the king henry the eighth the influence of his court was favorable to the cause not as a spiritual necessity but as a means of national independence then came the inflow of protestants from the continent many learned men crossed the channel and settled in oxford and cambridge and conducted discussions in favor of the reformation among them may be mentioned ochino peter martyr martin Bousset, paul fagius and tremelius but greatest of all the men from abroad was erasmus whose greek new testament found a ready entrance into england he settled in cambridge and taught there henry's grievance against romanism was purely personal he wanted more wives than rome was willing to grant him he had been married while his father was yet king to catherine of aragon the daughter of ferdinand and isabella and the widow of henry the seventh's eldest son arthur the king for political reasons chose catherine as wife for his second son and successor on the throne henry the eighth after a marriage of nearly twenty years henry the eighth resolved on a divorce from catherine and the disinheriting of their daughter mary his object was to marry anne boleyn but the question was how to get the pope's consent wolsey was deputed to do this work and to proceed in person to rome should the pope consent he would offend the emperor charles v who would be insulted by the divorce of henry from catherine should he refuse he knew that it would be an affront to england he chose the latter as by that course he thought he would have less to lose what should henry the eighth do he had made public his determination the religious revolt in germany proved to him that rebellion against the papacy was in the air of the age his own people were eager for reform so he determined to put away his wife disavow his daughter and make anne boleyn his queen this brought about an open rupture with the pope henry's real purpose was a national roman catholic church with himself as head but this proved an impossibility he saw there could not be two independent catholicisms one on the tiber and the other on the thames he was borne along by the current of his people and found himself finally compelled to link himself ostensibly with the new protestantism and yet in reality deeply in sympathy with the old romanism henry the eighth was a roman catholic in all but name and endorsement of the papacy he despised the lutheran doctrines and even wrote against them his book against luther was so fully romanist that it was hailed in rome as a powerful attack on protestantism and it even secured to henry the eighth from leo the tenth the title of defender of the faith luther however went on steadily he was master of his theme and besides refuting the positions of henry paid him the compliment of saying when god wants a fool he turns a king into a theological writer there was no positively settled policy on the part of king or parliament one day the roman catholics under the lead of cardinal pole and bishop gardiner had the confidence of the king and on another thomas cromwell and cramner were the stronger 
Parliament was the willing servant of a capricious tyrant, and at one hour was ready to revoke its work of the preceding one. As a proof of how nearly England remained Roman Catholic under Henry the Eighth, we may mention the fact that, at his dictation, in 1537, Parliament established the following six articles of faith. 1. Transubstantiation, or the real presence of Christ in the bread and wine of the Lord's Supper. 2. Sufficiency of communion in one kind only. 3. Illegality of the marriage of priests. 4. Obligation of vows of celibacy. 5. Propriety of retaining private masses. 6. Necessity of the confessional. It must be remembered, however, that, notwithstanding all these attachments to the old Romanism, the country was gradually drifting away from it. The old order was breaking up, the Bible was publicly distributed, and Protestant doctrines were gaining more friends every day. Colette, 1466 to 1519, and Sir Thomas More, 1480 to 1535, were the great influence in bringing about the revolution in the popular mind. The former had studied the classics in Italy and brought with him to Oxford an ardent love for the new humanism. He introduced expository preaching and a perpetual divinity lecture three days of each week in St. Paul's Church. His great object of attack was the profligacy of the Church, from the papacy down, through all grades of priesthood, as he had witnessed it in Rome. He cried aloud for the redemption of his beloved England. O oh, Jesu Christ, wash for us not our feet only, but also our hands and our head. Otherwise our disordered church cannot be far from death. Sir Thomas More was a student in Oxford when he imbibed the new learning, and became intimate with Erasmus and Colette. He was made Lord Chancellor of England on the fall of Wolsey, and was held in high esteem by the king. He strongly opposed Protestant doctrines, however, and could never bring his conscience to assent to the supremacy of Henry over the church. He incurred the king's displeasure by disapproving the latter's divorce from Catherine of Aragon, and absented himself from the coronation of Anne Boleyn. He refused to take the oath of allegiance to her as queen, and was sent to the Tower of London, and afterwards beheaded. He was a model of eloquence, purity of heart, domestic virtue, simplicity, and tenderness. After kissing his executioner, he said, Thou art to do me the greatest benefit that I can receive. Pluck up thy spirit, man, and be not afraid to do thine office. My neck is very short. Take heed, therefore, that thou strike not awry, for saving of thine honesty. Cranmer was, of all men of his time, most powerful in hastening the English reform. He erred in favoring the divorce of Henry and Catherine. He was rewarded by the king with the highest ecclesiastical preferment in his gift, the Archbishopric of Canterbury. But Cranmer was a pure and unselfish man, and expressed only his real convictions. When he afterwards yielded to Henry, so far as to pronounce his marriage with Anne Boleyn void, he was still the same pure man, but unwisely and irresolutely submitted to the pressure of the king. Cranmer became one of the regents of the kingdom after Henry's death. The young Edward, who succeeded Henry, was a Protestant, but he died early and was succeeded by Mary, a rigid Roman Catholic. The court was at once filled with men in sympathy with her. The reformers were now in danger. Cranmer, Latimer, and Ridley were thrown into the tower. Cranmer, in a moment of weakness, signed a recantation, but soon withdrew it. He, with Latimer and Ridley, was burned at the stake in 1556. His last words were, as he held in the flames the hand with which he had written his recantation, This unworthy hand, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. The publication of the Bible in the language of the people was the most powerful single agency in bringing about the English Reformation. Tyndale translated the New Testament, which was printed in Worms in 1526, 
and introduced into England, and circulated quietly over the country. Miles Cloverdale's translation of the entire Bible appeared in 1535. This was the first complete English Bible ever printed. Without bearing any imprint of place or printer, the evidence is strong, founded on the resemblance of types, that it was printed in Zurich by Christopher Freshover. Cloverdale also published several of the Psalms in verse with musical notes. The date is not known, but it was probably before 1538. The following was the way in which he set out his little book on its singing mission. Be not ashamed, I warrant thee, though thou be rude in song and rhyme, thou shalt to youth some occasion be in godly sports to pass their time. The following is his first stanza of Psalm 137. At the rivers of Babylon, there sat we down right heavily. Even when we thought upon Zion, we wept together sorrowfully, for we were in such heaviness, yet we forgot all our merriness, and left of all our sport and play. On the willow trees yet were thereby, we hanged up our harps truly, and mourned sore both night and day. Matthew's Bible appeared in 1537 with the royal sanction. Cranmer's translation of the Bible had, likewise, the royal approval, and was powerful in gaining many minds to the cause of reform. In addition to the scriptures, other writings were circulated, as formularies of doctrine and the public services. Among these must be mentioned, the Ten Articles, the Bishop's Book, the King's Book, and the King's Primer. Then comes Erasmus's Paraphrase of the Scriptures, which, in 1547, was placed in the parish churches. In the same year, the first Book of Homilies went out, with the royal approval. In 1549, the First Communion Office, Cranmer's Catechism, and the First English Liturgy, or Book of Common Prayer, were issued. In 1552, the Second English Liturgy, or Book of Common Prayer, was ordered for use, while in 1553, the Forty-Two Articles of Religion and the Larger Catechism were approved and enjoined. At Henry's death, Protestantism in England still continued to be an uncertainty. Much had been done, but no fixed state of things had been reached. Protestant influences were permeating the masses, and this was the most hopeful sign. Both the king and his subjects had rejected the pope's supremacy. The people had become acquainted with the Bible, and many now possessed copies in their own tongue. The monasteries had been suppressed, and their vast wealth secularized. A visitancy to arrange services and preach Protestantism was ordered throughout the kingdom. Religious formularies were made binding upon the people, and all the ecclesiastical offices were filled with Protestants. But Rome was still watchful for the opportunity of restoration in England. It was too fair a land to lose. Besides, there was a powerful party at home which was eager to restore the old order, and, by so doing, to bring itself to power and wealth. End of chapter 9「Three, Chapter Ten of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Ten: The English Reformation, Second Period, 1553 to 1603. There was great uncertainty as to the succession to Henry the Eighth. On the occupant of the throne depended largely the question of Protestantism in the British Isles. Henry had left three children, Mary, whose mother was Catherine of Aragon, Elizabeth, whose mother was Anne Boleyn, and Edward, whose mother was Jane Seymour. It was now a question as to whether Mary, Elizabeth, or Edward should rule. The result proved that each one wore the crown, but who should first wear it? Henry the Eighth and Catherine had been divorced, and hence that ruled out Mary. Anne Boleyn was condemned to death, and that was a declaration that her child, Elizabeth, was illegitimate. 
against Edward no such objection could be made. His mother died a natural death, too early and too young to be cast away by the king. All England was divided into parties. The friends of Edward were shrewd and bold. They won at last, and seated the boy on the throne in 1547, when he was only ten years of age. There was a protectorate over him, the first protector being the king's uncle on his mother's side, Edward Seymour, Duke of Somerset the second, Dudley, Earl of Warwick. In addition to these men, who were Protestants, and gave a Protestant direction to the administration, Cramner was the constant and practical adviser of young Edward. In due time, England was brought into strong Protestant sympathies, and special efforts were employed to indoctrinate the people in Protestant principles. An improved catechism was used for popular instruction, the Lord's Supper was administered in both kinds, and the Mass, clerical celibacy, the worship of images, and the invocation of saints were abolished. The Protestant ascendancy was marked by cruel repression. Many Catholics, and the more radical Protestants as well, were put to death. Edward the Sixth died in 1553. There now arose new troubles about the succession, and it was a question as to whether a Protestant or a Romanist should wear the crown. The strongest party would again win, and this time it was Mary's friends. Mary had been a sufferer on account of her Roman Catholic faith. The daughter of Henry the Eighth and Catherine of Aragon, she carried to her new position the bitter memory of the injustice done her, and a determination to restore the land to the faith of her mother and her remote Spanish ancestors. A formal alliance with Spain was brought about through her marriage with Philip II of Spain. No pains were now spared to bring into force the old order. Parliament hesitated, but its members, finally fearing for their heads, tamely submitted. Power was restored to the ecclesiastical courts, to depose and punish as they might judge best. No less than 16,000 clergymen were deposed from their positions. Strict celibacy was enjoined on every pastor. The oath of royal supremacy was no longer required. The English language was banished from the public services, and the Latin restored to its old place. All the old ceremonies in use before Henry were brought back again. Protestant teachers were ejected from the universities. A commission was appointed to suppress heresy, and martyr fires were kindled in various parts of England. A low estimate of persons burned places the martyrdoms at two hundred. The number would have gone to thousands had not many leading reformers fled to the continent. Strasbourg, Zurich, Geneva, and other places became their homes, where they established services in the English language, and waited until the time might come when they could return home. Elizabeth succeeded Mary in 1558. She was gifted with rare caution, strong will, and a quick and accurate perception of character. She was a devoted Protestant, and immediately set to work to complete the interrupted fabric of reform in her dominions. The country was desperate because of material reverses, England was losing at home and abroad, and the people were ready for any change. Roman Catholic rule had proven its inability to make them prosperous and happy. The Queen at once recognized Protestantism as the national faith. The Articles, and the Second Book of Homilies, were adopted in Parliament and Convocation in 1563, and Protestants were placed in charge of all the churches. The exiles came home from the continent, and were among the most zealous in promoting the work of reform. The independents were a growing class of people who believed that neither Henry nor Elizabeth had broken fully from Rome. They looked upon the elaborate ceremonial, the episcopacy, the use of robes, and the mild observance of the Sabbath as wretched remnants of the evil times, and would do away with all such reminders of Antichrist. They refused to adopt the new order, and would establish one of their own, in harmony with the example of the Genevan church. Elizabeth took strong ground against the independents. 
variation from the established order, either to the side of Rome or of Puritanism, was punished with torture or death. The Act of Uniformity was enforced in 1563, and this was the first stroke of separation. By this act, two thousand clergymen, some of them the most learned and pious in the kingdom, were driven out of their churches and homes. Lords Burley and Walsingham endeavoured in vain to secure a compromise. The first English presbytery was organised at Wandsworth, and was the practical beginning of all the non-conforming bodies of England. But, despite all the internal divisions of English Protestantism, the Reformation became a fact under Elizabeth. Her long reign brought to England material prosperity, but still more, a strong and enduring Protestantism. The most important event of the English Reformation, in its relation to America, was the rise of the Brownist sect. Robert Brown, born about 1550, was a student in Cambridge. While there, he adopted Puritan views, and became a warm advocate of them. His followers went by the name of Brownists, and were alike firm in their hostility to the Church of England and to Romanism. The Brownists were persecuted, not so much by royal order as by the ecclesiastical courts. Unable to circulate their writings or hold public services, they fled from England and organized a church in Amsterdam and afterwards at Leyden. In the latter place, John Robinson was their pastor. They resolved on leaving Holland and set sail for the New World. They landed at Plymouth, Massachusetts in 1620 and became the chief factor for the civil and religious development of the colonies and the United States. Holmes, in his Robinson of Leyden, thus pictures the hour of their departure. No home for these, too well they knew the mitred king behind the throne. The sails were set, the pennons flew, and westward ho for worlds unknown. And these were they who gave us birth, the pilgrims of the sunset wave, who won for us this virgin earth, and freedom with the soil they gave. End of chapter 10「Three, Chapter Eleven of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven: The Scotch Reformation. The Scotch reformers were of sturdy type, like their own rugged hills. Their country was not as yet under the English crown, but was a separate kingdom, divided into fierce and warlike clans, and ruled by the Stuarts a royal family in full sympathy with Rome. The bishops and the rulers were in close league to resist all Protestant encroachments. The new doctrines, however, did cross the Tweed, and were adopted there in various parts of the country. Cardinal Beaton was appointed leading inquisitor, and he did not hesitate to kill heretics, and even burn at the stake George Wishart, one of the most celebrated preachers and devout Christians of the time. Patrick Hamilton was the first Protestant leader. He was for a time on the continent, and, though the movement was hazardous, he returned to Scotland to carry out the cause that lay near his heart. He was not long permitted to preach and teach the new doctrines. He suffered martyrdom, and his followers were left without a guide. Mary Stuart was the daughter of James V, King of Scotland. Her father said of her, The kingdom came wi' a lass, daughter of Robert Bruce, and it will gay wi' a lass. His words became a correct prophecy. The country was under a protectorate during her minority about nineteen years. Through this period, the drift was constantly towards Protestantism. The Scotch had imbibed the Calvinistic doctrines and were growing firmer in their attachment every year. Mary, on her reception as queen, caused great offence to them. Her French confessors and courtiers gave extreme Roman Catholic colour to the very first days of her reign. Knox expressed the deep feeling of the people when he prayed, Purify, O Lord, the heart of the queen from the poison of idolatry. 
release her from the bondage of Satan in which she was brought up, and in which, from want of true teaching, she still remains. Mary's life was not blameless. In 1565 she was married to the Earl of Darnley. A disagreement took place between them, and, the Queen being attached to an Italian, Rizzio, Darnley headed a conspiracy which murdered him. Darnley himself, according to the general opinion of the Scotch at the time, was put to death by Bothwell, at Mary's insistence, through the combined method of strangling and the explosion of the house in which he lay ill. Shortly afterwards, Mary married Bothwell. The people had endured her rule as long as possible. The illustration of Romanism in the rule and life of their queen was enough to make the whole land thoroughly Protestant. The revolution broke out with great violence, and Mary fled to England. She had been invited by Elizabeth, and, when the invitation was accepted, Elizabeth showed her hospitality by throwing her into prison. Mary hoped that, Elizabeth having once been declared illegitimate, she might lead the Roman Catholics of the country to revolt against Elizabeth's rule, and herself become Queen of England. But Elizabeth was too shrewd to allow such a plan to succeed. Mary was tried and put to death in 1587, and Elizabeth became practically Queen of both England and Scotland. Mary's revenge came, however, after her death, when her son succeeded Elizabeth, as James the Sixth of Scotland and James the First of England. John Knox was Hamilton's natural successor. He began just where his predecessor had left off, and very soon the Scotch Protestants felt the power of his genius. He was born in 1505, and in 1542 publicly proclaimed himself in Edinburgh as a reformer. His studies had been leading him thither for some time, but from the moment of his public renunciation of Romanism, he never wavered. His heroism was as intense as that of Luther. He felt, and therefore he spoke. He was degraded from his office as preacher in St. Andrews, and sent to France, where he was subjected nearly two years to hard labor in the galleys. As soon as he was released, he promptly returned to Scotland, and preached the doctrines of the Reformation with great eloquence. When Mary, Queen of Scots, ascended the throne, he fled to Germany, where he established himself in Frankfurt on the Main, as one of the three hundred Protestant exiles. He became pastor of the little colony of English refugees. From there he went to Geneva, where he imbibed from Calvin himself the Calvinistic type of Protestantism, he was burned in effigy in Scotland by Mary's order, a very harmless proceeding on her part. In 1558 he published his First Blast of the Trumpet Against the Monstrous Regiment of Women. The Protestants formed an organized body and bound themselves to resistance by a covenant. The country became involved in civil war, and when peace was restored, Queen Mary had six interviews with him and, though moved to tears by his eloquence, afterwards caused his arrest on the charge of treason. But the court acquitted him. He was fearless in all his work. His life was in constant danger, but he at no time hesitated to preach and teach the Protestant doctrines. He died in Edinburgh in 1572. By the time of his death, the triumph of the Scotch Reformation was complete. It was the victory of the people, under the leadership of a brave and true man, against the combined forces of a queen, a court, and a powerful nobility. The Scotch reformers did their work so thoroughly that it was never necessary to do it over again. They had written their protest with their own blood, and it stands to this day. End of chapter 11「three chapter twelve of short history of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst this LibriVox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve the Reformation in the Netherlands the union of the Netherlands under the Spanish crown was a firm bond with the old order of monarchical and hierarchical despotism 
Charles V, King of Spain and Emperor of Germany, received the country as an inheritance from his grandmother, Maria of Burgundy. The Dutch had always been distinguished for their love of freedom, and, even as far back as the Roman period, Julius Caesar was compelled to annex Batavia to his dominions, less as a conquered than as an affiliated province. The same love of independence still prevailed through all the medieval period, and expressed itself in both civil and religious life. The Brothers of the Common Life, a society which was founded in 1384, made it their chief aim to improve the morals of the people, and looked intently upon a thorough reform. Gerhard Grote and Florentius Radewin represented the order, and the Brothers' House in Deventer was a centre for both laymen and preachers to teach and preach, and send their evangelists through the country. In the two schools of Deventer and Herzogenbusch alone, there were, at one time, as many as twelve hundred students in attendance. When the news of the Wittenberg revolt from Romanism came, the whole country was eager for cooperation. In fact, in no land was there such a complete and popular preparation for the Reformation as in the Netherlands. Luther's writings were caught up with avidity, while his hymns were sung with fervor along the Dutch dikes, in the boats, and in the cottages of the whole country. The Reformation assumed a political character. The people were prohibited from adopting Protestantism, and were slaughtered for disobedience. Charles V's measures were cruel and unremitting, a course which he continued until his abdication. Even among the last words spoken, in the far-off Spanish monastery of Euste, to his son Philip II, he urged no leniency to his heretical subjects. So violent was the opposition to Protestantism, that the people were driven to revolution, and the Spanish army marched thither, under the cruel Duke of Alva, to reduce the people to submission. The Edict of Worms, the cruel order against all sympathy with the Protestant cause, was made binding upon the Netherlands. The Inquisition was established, and the fires of martyrdom blazed all over the land. To be known as a Protestant was certain death. Not less than one hundred thousand people were computed to have been put to death for professing the new doctrines. After Charles V abdicated, and Philip II, his son, succeeded him, there was even greater cruelty. After 1555, not a vestige of civil or religious liberty remained in the country. The Protestant nobility formed themselves into the Beggar's League, otherwise called the Compromise, by which they made it their object to overthrow the Spanish authority and establish Protestantism and national independence. They were derisively called beggars by their oppressors. They adopted the term for their entire league, wore plain clothes made of the coarsest cloth, and carried a wooden bowl hung to a wooden chain as an emblem of their simplicity and of their readiness to be called poor for conscience's sake. The Duke of Alva, at the head of the Spanish army, succeeded in conquering the beggars. But the peace was of only short duration. The seven northern provinces united in a league, the Utrecht Union, 1579, and in due time conquered the Spanish army. William of Orange stood at the head of the movement for national independence, and was succeeded, in 1584, by his son Maurice, who completed the work begun by his father. Erasmus, of Rotterdam, belongs in the front rank of reformers. He was the one cosmopolitan character of the times, and was Holland's greatest gift to the ecclesiastical scholarship of Europe. He did more than any man of the period of the Reformation to disseminate a knowledge of the New Testament. His pen touched all the lands which showed signs of awaking to the new life, for it was he who handed over to the Protestant cause the best and purest philological learning awakened by the humanists. He was born in 1467 and died in 1536. After a thorough training in the University of Paris, he went to Oxford in 1498, 
through the influence of Lord Mountjoy, one of his pupils, where he taught privately for a short time. Here began his attachment to Sir Thomas More, which was only interrupted by the latter's death. Erasmus went to Italy for further studies, and took his doctor's degree in Turin. He stayed for a time in Bologna and Venice, at which later place he published his first books. Henry the Eighth invited him to England, and while on his way thither he wrote his Praise of Folly, the most satirical work of the times. In this he makes Folly speak her own mind and boast of her silliness. The work is a picture of priestly superstition, ignorance, and corruption. Erasmus returned to the continent and dwelt a long time in Basel, where he enjoyed the friendship of Ecolampadius and Bear, then prominent reformers. He divided his time chiefly between Basel and England, all the while writing with great industry and spreading a knowledge of the New Testament. His chief works were his Colloquies, his edition of the Greek Testament, his paraphrase on the same, and his Praise of Folly. He was a profound and versatile scholar, and it was alone as such that he was important as a reformer. He was always hesitant about withdrawing from Rome, allowed himself to come into opposition to Luther, and had no clear conception of that firm and strong theological basis which underlay the Protestant structure. He placed much faith in a compromise, and had not that clear vision to see that such a course was an impossibility in a grave crisis of principle. One of the most unpleasant chapters in the history of the Reformation, abundant as it is in beautiful, lasting friendships, is the unfraternal relationship between Erasmus and Luther. There was a time of cordiality, but this gave place to coldness and even to bitterness. At the first, Erasmus held that Luther's course was right, only that he was too vehement, but he came to differ radically from his old friend. Doctrinally, they differed on the freedom of the will, Luther taking the Augustinian view in almost its full force. Besides, Erasmus hesitated to break openly with Rome, and so the distance between them widened. In the latter part of his life, in fact, Erasmus looked upon the Reformation as a calamity, and broke off all communication with the Reformers. Luther wrote the following of Erasmus, a proof of how unable men of genius often are to appreciate each other. I have cracked many hollow nuts, which I thought had been good, but they fouled my mouth and filled it with dust. Erasmus and Karlstadt are hollow nuts. Erasmus is a mere mammus, making his mows and mocks at everything and everybody, at papist and protestant, but all the while using such shuffling and double-meaning terms that no one can lay hold of him to any effectual purpose. His chief doctrine is, hang the cloak according to the wind. He only looked to himself to have good and easy days, and so died like an Epicurean, without any one comfort of God. I hold Erasmus of Rotterdam to be Christ's most bitter enemy. I leave this as my will and testament. This was harsh language, unjust towards Erasmus, and not at all in harmony with Luther's generous nature. But it was called out by the Dutchman's profound estrangement from the new reforms. Erasmus's great services to the Reformation consisted in his breaking the spell of priestly influence by the bitterness of his satires, and in the increased Bible study which resulted from the publication, 1516, of his fine edition of the Greek Testament. End of chapter 12Part 3, Chapter 13 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 13, The Reformation in France. The outlook for Protestantism in France was very favorable at the beginning. The conditions were such that no violent opposition could be expected, especially along the Seine and in the southern provinces. The seventy years' residence of the popes in Avignon had inflamed the people with a desire for a national Roman Catholic Church, 
and a corresponding hostility to Rome. The Gallican, as against the Papal Church, had long been a hope of French kings and people. There was abroad a spirit of dissatisfaction with the existing order, and an ardent craving for religious liberty and freedom from the despotism of provincial princes. There were six principal causes which led to this desire for reformation. The remaining influence of the early Paris reformers, which was still powerful in private circles, the religious fervor of the inhabitants of the Savennes Mountains in the south, the example of the heroic Waldenses in the Vandois Alps, the example and force of the Genevan reformers with Calvin at their head, the great work of the German reformers with Wittenberg as their center of life and force, and the literary spirit, or free tendency towards inquiry, which radiated from the university into every part of the kingdom. Nothing was more dreaded by the Romanism of France than the work which was done by the German reformers. The books of Luther found their way into France, and were translated and read extensively. By an order of the Sarbonne they were publicly burned in the year 1521, and violent threats were made against any French person reading them. Francis I, who succeeded to the throne in 1515, was a mixed character, now half Protestant, and again thoroughly Roman Catholic. In 1535 he was lenient enough to invite Melanchthon to a conference on religious affairs in Paris, a bait which that calm German was too shrewd to accept, gladly replying that the elector of Saxony refused permission to leave Wittenberg. It will add emphasis to the real meaning of this generous patronage of German scholarship when we remember that, in that very year, Francis I burned to death from twenty to thirty of his own subjects because they were Huguenots. The real danger to the Protestants came from a firm alliance between the authorities at Rome and the French throne. Francis I, whatever pleasant exterior he presented, remained at heart a bitter advocate of oppressive measures against Protestantism in his own dominions. But the Protestants, who in France were called Huguenots, proceeded to the work of evangelization and organization. In 1553, their first church was established and recognized, and the first pastor installed in Paris. They also had fifteen other societies in various parts of the kingdom, those in Meaux, Angers, and Poitiers being among the chief. But there was no cohesion between them. They were simply isolated Christian bodies, tired of Romish supremacy, and in thorough sympathy with the great Protestant cause in other lands. However, the scattered Huguenots soon coalesced, and in 1559 the General Synod of Paris met, and the Gallic Confession was adopted as the creed of French Protestantism. The Huguenots possessed a martial spirit. Many of them had a military education, and their fundamental error was their hope that, by political and martial measures, they might succeed in the end. The royal family was divided between Huguenots and Romanists. The Bourbons were with the Huguenots, and the Guises with the Roman Catholics. The subdued opposition came to violent outbreak. The appeal was to arms, and in 1561 the land was convulsed by a civil war which lasted thirty years. Three wars were carried on, and three times a peace was patched up. The third peace, that of St. Germain, in 1570, guaranteed liberty of doctrine and public worship to the Huguenots, with the exception of the residence of the court and the city of Paris. Catherine de' Medici became regent in 1560, her son, Charles the Ninth, being only ten years old. She professed profound sympathy with the Huguenots, but was only playing a shrewd game of deception. She was waiting for an opportunity to deal destruction on every side. The increase of Protestantism at this time was remarkably rapid. The Synod in 1559 had not only adopted a confession, which bore every mark of Calvin's hand, but had also thoroughly organized a Protestant church, 
with a provision for provincial synods throughout the kingdom, and a complete system of church discipline and liturgical order. When the war began in 1561, there were, according to Beza, 400,000 Huguenots throughout France, and Condé's list of their churches, presented as an exhibit to Catherine de' Medici, comprised 2,150 names. They were distributed chiefly through the south and west. Normandy also possessed many of their societies, but in the north the Huguenots were less represented. It was arranged by Catherine that the semblance of a thorough reconciliation between the Protestants and the Roman Catholics should take place, Charles's sister was to marry Henry of Navarre, the leader of the Huguenots. Brilliant festivities were arranged, and the whole land was alive with new joy that, at last, the Huguenots and Roman Catholics could live henceforth in peace, and each worship with equal rights before the law. The marriage was celebrated August 18, 1572, but on the night of the 24th, a bell in the palace belfry gave the signal for general slaughter. This was the massacre of St. Bartholomew's Eve. The Huguenot chiefs were all in Paris, and their whereabouts was known. Admiral Coligny, an intrepid warrior and a firm Huguenot, was murdered in cold blood and cast out of the window into the stone court below. For seven days and nights the streets ran with Protestant blood. Outside of Paris, the massacre was sudden and overwhelming. The Loire and the Rhone ran red and thick with the blood and bodies of victims. The cities of Meaux, Orléans, Bourget, Lyon, Rouen, Toulouse, and Bordeaux were centers of the persecution. Not less than 30,000 Huguenots fell beneath flame and sword. The pretext for the universal murder was that Coligny had concerted a secret conspiracy against the crown. There is not, and never was, a vestige of authority for even the suspicion of such a thing. At Rome there was great rejoicing over the bloodshed. Pope Gregory ordered the ringing of the bells of the city, and a special medal to be struck in honor of his triumph. The Huguenots were not willing, even yet, to surrender. They had lost immense numbers, but were eager to renew the conflict. The struggle began again, and in 1576 the Peace of Boleo guaranteed the Huguenots once more the liberty of worship and doctrine. Henry of Navarre ascended the throne in 1589 as Henry IV. He renounced his Protestantism as the price of his crown, but by the Edict of Nantes in 1598, he gave full liberty to the Huguenots to worship in places where they had established services, and to stand equal with Roman Catholics before the law. Protestants now increased very rapidly. Henry IV granted them personal safety and the right of worship in 150 places throughout the kingdom, the chief of which were Bordeaux, Poitiers, and Montpellier. By the year 1628 they possessed 688 churches, and by 1637 these had grown to 720. For nearly a century they enjoyed comparative peace, and rapidly multiplied in every department of ecclesiastical prosperity. When Louis the Fourteenth came to the throne, he strongly opposed them. No wrong was spared to make France an unwelcome home. There were at this time about two million Huguenots throughout the country, though at one time they had numbered at least one-third the entire population of the country. In the quarter of a century preceding 1685, not less than 520 of their churches were destroyed. They were permitted to leave the country, and the exile began in 1666. It continued not less than half a century, during which time a low estimate of the number of Huguenots who forsook France places it at one million. But still many remained, and, to give a finishing stroke to them, the Edict of Nantes was revoked in the year 1685. This act destroyed the last vestige of civil and religious rights now remaining to the Huguenots. There were still about one thousand of their pastors, and of those, 
one hundred were sent to the galleys or put to death, six hundred fled the country, and the other three hundred disappeared in unaccountable ways. For a century Protestantism was almost blotted out of the country. Only at the close of the eighteenth century was there a comparative revival of the old Protestant spirit. End of chapter 13「Three, Chapter Fourteen of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Fourteen: The Reformation in Italy. The Italians were prepared by Savonarola to give hearty credence to the new doctrines. He was born in Ferrara in 1452 and was executed in Florence in 1498. In 1484 he began to preach in Brescia on the Book of Revelation. In 1489 he removed to Florence and became a monk in the convent of St. Mark. He was an eloquent pleader for the reformation of the Church and showed no mercy in declaring against the corruptions of Rome. His great error lay in having interfered with the political convulsions of Florence not for his bold protest against immorality alone was he compelled to suffer he became an object of political hostility on the part of lorenzo and pietro of the medici family who had stood in charge of the republic of florence savonarola was at the head of a revolution against them the people of florence who were witnesses of his pure and sacrificing life believed in him fully and supported him by their sympathy Pietro de' Medici, unable to resist Savonarola alone, called to his aid the Pope, Alexander VI, who was already eager to suppress the Florentine monk. The brave reformer fell beneath the power of Rome. Savonarola had wrought alone. He held a free lance, and the power of his speech and the heroism of his life long survived his death. For the moral greatness of the man there was not, and could not be, a martyrdom. Venice was at this very time in the throes of the religious revolution. The works of Luther and his coadjutors were not only circulated, but even printed, along the Grand Canal. Some little skill was needful to escape papal interdiction. For example, the loci theologici of Melanchthon, the Greek term into which he translated his name, after the usage of scholars, from his German name of Schwarzerd, or Black Earth, was translated into Italian, and published under the almost undistinguishable, but accurately Italianized name of E Principii della Theologia di Ipofilo de Terra Nigra. This work reached Rome, and was sold and read for a whole year with enthusiasm. When the copies were exhausted, an order was sent to Venice for a new supply. A Franciscan friar discovered the identity of the author with the German Melanchthon, and exposed it. Of course, Rome was not long in seeing the heresy and ordering the burning of the dangerous book. Chardon de la Rochette wrote, My hostess, the good mother Coletti, says her prayers every day before a beautiful miniature, which represents Luther on one side, and Melanchthon on the other. Zwingli's works were circulated under the name of Caricius Cogelius, and Bousset's Psalms went abroad in Italy and France as the commentary of Aretius Felinus. Melanchthon was not astray when he wrote to George, Prince of Anhalt, What libraries have been carried from the late fair into Italy, though the Pope has published fresh edicts against us? The war between the German Empire and Italy broke out in 1526, and in 1527 the imperial army sacked Rome itself, and for a long time occupied Naples. With this army there was a large number of Protestants. They carried the reform south of the Alps, and the contagion spread among the Italian peoples. We have positive proof that Melanchthon corresponded with the Venetian reformers in 1529, and that Modena was a Lutheran city. Italy was the native country of humanism, but the new scholarship was so negative, 
and manifested itself in the cultivated circles by such positive indifference towards all religious life, that the land, though rising in intelligence, drifted far from the gospel. The poems of Portano, Sanazaro, and Marcellus were nothing but fulsome praises of the gods of Greece and Rome. The clergy introduced the whole dead mythology of the pagan times into their sermons, and drew parallels between Jupiter Maximus and God the Father, Apollo and Jesus, and Diana and the Virgin Mary. The people were left in profound ignorance. Dante said of the preachers of his day, E'en they whose office is to preach the gospel, let the gospel sleep, and pass their own inventions off instead. In another place he became still more bold. The preacher now provides himself with store of jests and jibes, and, so there be no lack of laughter, while he vents them, his big cowl distends, and he has won the mead he sought. Could but the vulgar catch a glimpse the while of that dark bird which nestles in his hood, they scarce could wait to hear the blessing said, which were the dotards hold in such esteem. Of the moral condition of Rome, Petrarch exclaimed, Foul nest of treason! Is there aught wherewith the spacious world is fraught, of bad or vile? Tis hatched in thee, who revelest in thy costly meats, thy precious wines and curious seats, and all the fruits of luxury. The Protestant doctrines spread rapidly through every part of Italy. In the extreme south, or Calabria, where the descendants of some Waldensian emigrants lived, the sympathy with the new doctrines was prompt and strong. In the north every important town numbered among its people some disciples of the German reformers. Ferrara, Medena, Florence, Bologna, Padua, Verona, Brescia, Milan, Lucca, and Venice had large numbers of devoted reformers, who were reading, praying, and consulting, hoping that the same good providence which had favored their spiritual fathers in Germany would bless their country. Lucca had, perhaps, more adherence to the reform than any other city but Venice excelled all others in the distribution of the scriptures. To Florence belonged the great honor of having three of its sons, Brucioli, Marmocini, and Teofilo, prepare each an Italian translation of the scriptures. The version of Brucioli became the favorite. Among the firmest reformers were Ocino, Peter Martyr, Pagliario, Pascali, and Vergario. None were more fully the objects of suspicion than the two former, both of whom succeeded in leaving the country before the officers could arrest them. In no country of Europe were women so prominent in the advocacy of the Reformation as in Italy. There was one court, Ferrara, where the Duchess, Renata, was a firm adherent, and her court was in a quiet way a rallying place for all Protestants. Calvin visited her once, and afterwards kept up a correspondence, until the poor woman was banished for her loyalty to Protestantism. Other women were none the less true, and, either socially or by their writings, did all in their power to advance the new measures. Olympia Morata, Isabella Maricha, Lavinia della Rovere, Madonna Maddalena, and Madonna Cherbina, both of the Orsini family, the learned Duchess Julia Gonzaga, and the brilliant Vittoria Colonna, were representatives of a large class of noble and heroic women, who were among the first to welcome the doctrines from the North, and also among the first to suffer for their devotion to them. The cause of the Reformation advanced just far enough to be recognized as an opposing and dangerous religious factor, when the orders went out from Rome for its forcible suppression. There was nowhere sufficient momentum to the new cause to organize a church or establish a formulary of doctrine, but there were indications enough to begin the work of resistance. In 1542, the Inquisition, which was already in operation in Spain, was ordered to begin in Italy. Carafa was put in charge of the work, and a more competent man could not be found. 
in every city where protestants could be found they were publicly executed and without delay antonio peliario a prominent humanist but of intense religious convictions was burned the powerful little treatise the benefit of christ's death was formerly attributed to him it had an immense circulation but was suppressed and every copy as was supposed destroyed a copy was discovered in cambridge england in eighteen fifty three and it has been sent back to italy to shed its light again in sweet revenge the book issued from the reformatory circle at naples and was written by a disciple of valdez pascali suffered a like fate as a result by the end of the century nearly every trace of protestantism was suppressed the council of trent was the papal method of dealing with protestantism outside of italy it was a recognition by rome of the necessity of adopting a new course to arrest reform it convened in december fifteen forty five and adjourned in fifteen forty seven one of its first acts was to revoke the old method of the rule of the majority and to order that the pope's consent was necessary to every decree reforms in a small way were ordered the two principal reformatory measures were that better teachers and preachers should be provided by the bishops and that bishops should be punished for neglect of their duties but with these concessions the work of reform ended the general spirit of the council was relentless in its opposition to protestantism many italians escaped death owing to the difficulty of detecting them so soon as they reached the alps they were generally safe from arrest italy was an aggregation of little duchies and republics which were often at war with each other and this want of civil connection favored their escape the larger swiss towns and cities had little groups of fugitive italian protestants who received a cordial welcome and to whom avenues of trade and industry were opened the canton of the grissons in the eastern alps was almost populated by them its population consisted of three folk stems the old retian the italian and the german and when the protestants from the south took their place among them they gave their impress to the faith and language of the whole people a body of exiles from locarno settled in zurich and established a protestant service and organization there peter martyr accepted an invitation of cramner to go to england and became a professor in oxford ochino also went to england and preached in london exiles from italy likewise among whom may be named paolo di coli grattaroli corrado teglio betti salso and curio went to basel and settled there all these men were talented some being authors who had made themselves objects of suspicion at home because of their heroic devotion by pen and speech to the new protestantism End of chapter fourteen part three chapter fifteen of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen the reformation in spain and portugal no country in europe was under a more complete despotism than spain it was too far removed from the life and heart of europe to respond aggressively to any profound movement elsewhere the church and the state were attached together as by hooks of steel charles v and later his son philip the second ruled in harmony with the spirit of medieval oppression and superstition there was no need of counsel from the pope for they carried out every extreme measure which could be acceptable to rome the completeness of the hierarchical rule in spain can be seen from the statistics of the clergy and minor priesthood of this time there were fifty-eight archbishoprics six hundred eighty-four bishoprics eleven thousand four hundred monasteries twenty-three thousand brotherhoods forty-six thousand monks thirteen thousand eight hundred nuns three hundred twelve secular priests 
and over four hundred thousand ecclesiastics of other grades. With such a machinery as this, it can easily be imagined that to introduce Protestant ideas was no easy task. Still, in spite of the distance of Spain from the general intellectual activity of Europe, so powerful was the Protestant movement in the north and east, that a sympathy with it was awakened even among the people of the Spanish peninsula. Spanish mysticism, a peculiar phenomenon indicative of coming religious life, had already permeated many classes. The new prosperity that came from discoveries in America created an intellectual activity which took note of every new movement in other countries of Europe. The writings of Erasmus, and even of Luther, found their way south of the Pyrenees, and were read in secret by many persons of the more cultivated classes. A taste for them had been awakened by the mysticism, which was a popular aspiration for purer morals and ecclesiastical government. The officers of Charles II and other members of his military court came in contact with Luther's doctrines while in the German wars, and when they returned they brought this new attachment with them. As representatives of this class may be mentioned Alfonso de Virves and Ponce de la Fuente. Translations of the Bible into Spanish were a powerful auxiliary. Francis and Zenas of Burgos issued the first Spanish Bible in Antwerp in 1543. Knowing that his emperor, Charles V, was a patron of learning, some kinds, he had the simplicity to dedicate his version to that ruler. His reward was a confinement of fourteen months in a Brussels prison, on the ground that he had printed in capital letters the passage, Where is boasting, then? It is excluded. By what law? Of works? Nay, but by the law of faith. Romans 3.27 Entire cloisters, such as San Isidro del Campo, threw off the authority of Rome and adopted the Protestant doctrines. Valladolid, Seville, and Medina del Campo became centers for the distribution of Protestant writings. Rodrigo de Valero, Juan Ejidias, Agustin Cazalla, and Diaz were representatives of the new measures. Small societies were organized in many places, and public worship was held. Just as soon as the Spanish people expressed sympathy with the Reformation in an organized and public way, violent means were employed to arrest the work. The Inquisition was ordered from Rome. Fernando Valdez was appointed Grand Inquisitor. He was the very man for the work, having an indomitable will, blind zeal for Roman Catholicism, and intense hostility towards the cause of reform. Autos de fe, acts of faith, or public burnings of heretics, were kindled in twelve cities. All spectators of these scenes were granted plenary indulgences. The first prominent martyr was Carlos de Ceso. Then came Domingo de Rojas, Garcia de Arias, Montanos, and Hernandez as leaders of a great host of victims. Even women were not spared, whether from the nobility or lower classes. Maria Gomez, Maria de Borborges, and Eleonoro de Cisneros were noble representatives of their sex, in joyful readiness to endure martyrdom for their faith. Englishmen temporarily in Spain were likewise executed when known to be in sympathy with Protestantism. Portugal was much less affected by the reformatory movement than Spain. Still, there were indications enough to excite alarm. Diego de Silva was appointed Grand Inquisitor. He performed his work thoroughly, and soon all Protestant traces were destroyed. The causes of failure in the whole Spanish peninsula are not difficult to find. Protestantism was largely a measure of scholars and thinkers. No Spanish Protestant was gifted with popular powers. There was not a strong preacher or a powerful speaker among them. They were men of the study, quiet authors who thought that they could win by the pen alone. They wrote in the language of the learned, and their writings never pervaded the masses. In Spain, there was no exception to the general law 
that no reform succeeds which is confined to the educated and to the aristocracy. The persistent energy of the Spanish authorities, reinforced from Rome, made thorough work of suppression. The rights of conscience and intellectual liberty shared a common fate. Even all lectures on morals were prohibited in the universities as favoring, by implication, the Protestant cause. End of chapter 15「Part three, Chapter sixteen of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter sixteen The Reformation in Scandinavia. The groundwork of Protestantism in the three Scandinavian countries, Sweden, Denmark, and Norway, was already laid in the dissatisfaction of the people with the prevailing order of civil and ecclesiastical government. The barons and priests had long since united in popular oppression. The masses were ground down, and centuries had passed without an improvement in their condition. When the people learned of the reform in Germany, they hailed it as a blessing to them. They eagerly listened to its first representatives in their own country. Olaf and Lawrence Peterson were the first native Swedish reformers, they went to Wittenberg as students of theology, returned to Sweden, and after 1519 were devoted preachers of the new doctrines. But many of the people were reluctant to give up their old faith, which indeed was intermixed with traces of the old Gothic paganism. The king, Gustavus Vasa, was a firm Protestant, and was greatly beloved by his people. He told them that unless they would become Protestants, he would abdicate. This he proposed in public, at a great meeting held in Westnays, 1526. The people then declared in favor of Protestantism, and at the Diet of Orebro, in 1529 and 1537, and of Westnays, in 1544, the Protestant doctrines were declared to be the faith of the kingdom. The Augsburg Confession was endorsed in 1593, and the Form of Concord in 1663. Apostasy from the state Lutheran Church to Romanism, or to any Protestant sect, was punished with exile and confiscation of property, and this continued until 1877. Protestantism in Denmark and Norway was introduced by men who had studied in Wittenberg, and brought back with them the new doctrines. Christian II, King of Denmark, publicly adopted them, and took measures for their approval by the whole people. John Tanzen, who had studied under Luther, was appointed pastor in Copenhagen. The Roman Catholic bishops were deposed, and the property of the monasteries was appropriated to the national treasury. Protestantism was publicly adopted in Copenhagen in 1536, and the Diet of Odense in 1539 completed the work. In Norway, the Reformation was introduced and formally adopted in 1528. Dutch missionaries carried it to Iceland in 1551, where an ecclesiastical constitution similar to that of Denmark was adopted. End of chapter 16 Part 3, Chapter 17 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 17 The Reformation in the Slavic Lands. The Hussite preparation was a powerful aid towards introducing the new measures. John Huss was born about 1369 and burned at Constance in 1415. He became acquainted with Wycliffe's writings when at Prague, as a professor of theology and philosophy in the university, through students who had brought them from England. He eagerly adopted them. In 1402 he was appointed preacher in the Bethlehem Chapel, where he preached in the Bohemian language. He afterwards became rector of the university. He attacked all the chief evils in the church in his day, and in due time the opposition to him became intense. The king of Bohemia took his part. 
the struggle between the pope and huss was long in doubt the people being with the latter and the priesthood with the former pope john the twenty third summoned a general council which met in constance in fourteen fourteen huss was ordered thither and was promised personal safety but the pledges were violated and on july sixth fourteen fifteen he was publicly burned and his ashes cast into lake constance but his cause did not die with him his followers lived as a political and ecclesiastical party in the retired parts of the country they withdrew to the rugged mountains of moravia and lived in quiet the moravians who afterwards went from there and settled in hernhut in saxony and under zinzendorf became known as the united brethren are the spiritual descendants of john huss the protestantism of germany had warm sympathizers in every part of bohemia preachers went back and forth between bohemia and wittenberg and luther was in frequent consultation with them as to the best means of introducing the reform the calvinistic theology together with that of luther was likewise introduced so successful was the work that the greater part of the country became protestant the jesuits however made this one of their favorite fields and with the emperor on their side gradually gained the upper hand in sixteen twenty seven protestants were declared heretics and had to choose between romanism and death a universal exile was the result bohemian protestants carried the doctrines of protestantism into poland at this time a powerful and independent kingdom the crime of the partition and absorption of that country by prussia austria and russia was reserved for a later and more enlightened century being begun in seventeen sixty eight and completed in seventeen ninety five luther's writings were introduced with great success but opposed by the king sigismund i his successor sigismund augustus was favorable to protestantism but the movement was weakened by a strife between the lutheran and calvinistic confessions which was closed by the synod of sendomir fifteen seventy the protestant nobility formed a league by which a compromise between the catholics and protestants was reached in fifteen seventy three but there was no general prosperity of the protestants they grew in livonia and other parts of the baltic coast but in the interior they led a feeble existence, being ground beneath the schemes of Jesuits and the political revolutions that came from the efforts of Poland to preserve her independence. The work of Protestant disintegration was greatly added by a colony of Italians, who were so permeated with the skeptical humanism of their country that they were illy prepared for an evangelical Protestantism hungary and transylvania were early fields for the reformation many students went from those far-off regions to wittenberg and carried back with them a warm admiration of luther and an inborn devotion to his cause martin siriasi was one of the number and he began to preach in fifteen twenty four in favor of the reform matthias de ve for a time an inmate of luther's house came to hungary full of zeal for the new doctrines and mightily aided them by voice and pen he was the first to set up a printing press in hungary and the first book issued contained besides a hungarian grammar extracts from luther's smaller catechism written in the vernacular in fifteen forty one erdosi published probably from devey's press the first new testament in hungarian in 1545 the synod of erdod formally adopted a creed in twelve articles in substantial agreement with the augsburg confession as the theological standard of the country much of the fervor which was shown to protestantism came from the merchants who had attended the leipzig fair every year since luther had begun to preach when these returned they not only brought back with them books in favor of the reformation but a profound sympathy with the doctrines. Reformers went from Basel, which was in the Protestant ferment, 
and did much to aid in the good work of propagation. The kings, Louis II, Ferdinand, and John Zapolia, opposed the reform, while Maximilian I favored it. The Peace of Vienna, however, in 1606, resulted in its favor. Both the Lutheran and the Calvinist type of theology were represented. The people who spoke the German language, and heard of the Reformation from preachers who had studied in Wittenberg, adopted the Augsburg Confession, while those who were under the teaching of Swiss preachers adopted the Helvetic Confession. End of chapter 17「Part Three, Chapter Eighteen of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eighteen: Survey of Results. The fruits of the Reformation are not difficult to find. Hitherto, there had been but little liberty granted the common people. They were oppressed both civilly and ecclesiastically, and all the political convulsions were of little fruit for them. The Hans, or free cities, constituted a confederation of powerful centers, extending from the North Sea down to the Alps. They arose as a reaction against despotic measures, but no sooner did they gain independence than they were as repressive as their masters had been. The effect of the Reformation was to elevate the people to a thirst for liberty and a higher and purer citizenship. Wherever the Protestant cause extended, it made the masses more self-asserting. Social respect and order were introduced and subjected to firm regulation. Nations were taught a higher regard for each other's rights, and kings learned that their subjects were no longer mere playthings or serfs. In some countries, the aspiration for independence took organized shape. The Reformation became the mother of republics. The Dutch Republic was born of the efforts of the Protestants of the Netherlands to secure liberty of conscience. No thought of civil independence animated the Dutch at the outset. They simply fought for liberty of doctrine and worship. But once in the current, they were carried on. They builded more wisely than they knew, and so founded a nation whose commerce covered every sea, whose discoveries reached the Antipodes, and whose universities became the pride and wonder of Europe. The American Union owes a large measure of its genesis to the European struggle for reform. The Germans who came with Penn to this country were strongly attached to the doctrines of Luther, and immediately began to build churches and establish schools in that interest. The Dutch who settled in New York and the adjacent country brought with them a fervent love of Protestantism, which had been the creative force of their nation at home, and which their fathers had bought at the price of their treasure and blood. The Swedes of New Jersey and Delaware were animated with the same attachment which they had enjoyed in Scandinavia. The Huguenots, who came here and settled in many places along the coast, from Massachusetts down to Georgia, found that safe asylum which was denied them at home because of their fidelity to their conscience. The pilgrims who came over in the Mayflower, and became the strongest nucleus in the development of our northern colonies, were fugitives from oppression in their native England. All these elements, the finest wheat from the trampled harvest fields of Europe, combined on these shores and became a unit in this western planting of evangelical Christianity. Villers says with truth, after speaking of the debt which the United States owes to the Reformation, quote, Powerful republics are based on the Reformation. Republican principles, more powerful than weapons of steel, have been introduced among all nations. Great revolutions have come from this source, and those yet to come are innumerable." End quote. The promotion of learning was not the least benefit conferred upon the world by the Reformation. Cultured men were its first advocates. The universities were the cradles of Protestantism. Wherever superstition and other abnormal tendencies appeared, the reformers promptly rebuked them. 
the translation of the scriptures had the effect to formulate and solidify the languages as no other literary movement had been able to do. Wycliffe's Bible preserved the Saxon tongue, and our authorized version, or King James's version, shows its constant dependence upon his translation. Luther found the German a mere conglomeration of rude and coarse dialects, and in his translation of the Bible, he grouped the best and purest idioms, and for the first time made the German language a unit. Universities sprang up throughout Germany as an immediate fruit of the Reformation. The University of Leiden was the first creation of the new nation which was born after the siege of that city was raised and the Spanish troops left the land. Not until now, and only as a fruit of the Reformation, was the gospel generally preached in the popular language. When Eolimpadius, in 1522, began to preach in German, in the castle of Franz von Sickingen, even the friends of the Reform regarded it as a dangerous procedure. His friend, Caspar Hedio, for example, thought it hurrying matters too rapidly. In 1515, Leo X issued his prohibition against the printing and publication of all books translated from the Greek, the Hebrew, and the Arabic languages. But when the Reformation was once in progress, the printing press was free. The study of all the languages became a new fascination, which no edict could destroy. Public schools were introduced, though crudely at first, in Germany, directly through Luther's labors. The intermediate schools, between the lower and highest education, were established. The German gymnasium of our times owes its real origin to the period of the Reformation. During the centuries since the Reformation, over twenty universities, three-fourths of which are Protestant, have been founded in Germany alone. Holland has built up, in addition to the University of Leiden, five other universities, and all are the direct result of her Protestantism. Everywhere, where the Reformation triumphed and became a permanent force, the cause of education, good morals, and political liberty advanced securely and rapidly. End of chapter 18「Part three, Chapter nineteen of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter nineteen The Four Hundredth Anniversary of Luther's Birth. The memories of the Reformation have been renewed by the celebration on November eleventh, eighteen eighty three, of the four hundredth anniversary of the birth of Luther. The day was observed with becoming festivities in all the Protestant countries of the world. In Germany, as might be expected, the enthusiasm was more intense than anywhere else. In Berlin there was a procession of children, numbering nearly one hundred thousand, to whom the Emperor William distributed copies of the works of the Reformer. Services were held in all the Protestant churches, and eulogies were pronounced on Luther and his achievements in behalf of all Teutonic peoples. In anticipation of November 11th, the Crown Prince of Prussia, Frederick William, proceeded to Wittenberg, taking with him a laurel wreath, which, amid the silence of the multitude, he laid upon Luther's grave in the floor of the castle church. Immediately afterwards the people sang Luther's martial hymn, which was caught up by the throngs in the streets and along the city roads. In Eisenach, which claimed the honor of having discovered Luther's genius when a choir boy singing for his bread, the festivities were such as to attract people from every part of the Thuringian forest. In Eiselben, where he was born and died, there was a popular rejoicing not excelled in any part of Germany. The entire day was devoted to the celebration. The nobility and peasantry vied with each other in doing honor to the miner's son. Scenic representations, in which all the leading participants of the Reformation were personified, and marched at the head of a great procession through the streets, 
constituted the chief feature of the ceremonies by which the quaint town did honor to its own child even the old catholics of germany through the example and encouraging words of dollinger paid a tribute to luther's memory because of the service he had done to the language and spiritual life of the fatherland in all the slavic and scandinavian countries the same regard was paid to the memory of luther even in the very lands where his writings had been burned wherever a little protestant society exists by whatever denominational name it may be called religious services were held and tributes to the reformer pronounced such celebrations were observed in spain where the protestants in madrid barcelona seville bilboa and other cities united with their brethren in germany and the whole world in honoring luther's name and memory in paris and other parts of france where his doctrines had been despised and from which calvin and later hundreds of thousands of huguenots had been driven the same rejoicings took place in italy there was a thoroughly organized plan to celebrate the reformer's birthday wherever protestantism had gained a foothold in florence there was first an immense children's meeting which was followed by a general gathering where missionaries from foreign countries united with the waldenses and other native protestants each making an address in his own language and the people singing luther's hymn in italian forte rocca e il nostro dio in rome a large memorial service was held where a sermon was preached addresses made and hymns sung in naples there was a similar celebration where representatives of the protestantism of many countries united in doing honor to the memory of luther even as far south as sicily where in the sixteenth century it was certain death to profess sympathy with the wittenberg heretic there was a large meeting in palermo under the presidency of the venerable patriot emanuele sartorio in the united states all protestant denominations united in doing honor to the memory of luther every department of his great work and character was made the subject of special consideration in churches from the atlantic across to the pacific ocean it is a striking proof of the growing interest even in secular circles that on the morning following this unique celebration in eiselben all the details appeared in both english and german in the new york daily papers history nowhere furnishes a higher tribute to the recognition of the worth of the worker for his fellow men than in the fact that multitudes of americans gathered in the churches and public halls to recall in gratitude and love the life and service of a miner's son who was born when there was not a christian on this continent and nine years before Columbus set out on the voyage that led to its discovery. End of chapter 19. End of part 3. Part 4. Chapter 1. Of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part 4. The Modern Church in Europe a d 1558 to 1892 chapter one recuperative measures of romanism the territorial expansion of protestantism combined with its rapid organization in various confessional forms produced great alarm in rome even lands which had been supposed to be firm in their old attachments had become intensely protestant there was no criterion by which to determine where or when the moral revolution would cease the division of the german protestants into the two great bodies of lutheran and reformed did not seriously diminish the aggressive power of the protestants in the heart of europe but there was little thought taken of the propagation of the gospel in heathen lands had the protestants on the continent adopted measures for the evangelization of heathen countries especially the east and west indies they would have achieved a task which has been left for their successors in the eighteenth and nineteenth centuries to undertake even meagre beginnings would have been an expression of confidence and heroism the roman catholics in this respect 
were controlled by greater wisdom. It is natural, however, that, the work of conquest being so new, the Protestant bodies should think the consolidation of their work at home their most serious work. The Roman Catholics looked, first of all, to a general council as the best measure to arrest the increasing force of Protestantism. But a council was known to be always a dangerous experiment. It was never adopted except as a last resort. It never failed to have two parties, radical and conservative. Still, so serious was the issue that Paul III called one. It met, in 1545, in Trent, a town on one of the eastern Alpine passes between Italy and Germany. The most of the delegates were Italian, and were devoted to the conservative interests of Rome. But the Spanish and French bishops favored reformatory measures. They declared that the church must take advanced steps and adapt itself to the new needs of the times. The Pope found the council troublesome and removed it to Bologna in 1547 and dissolved it in 1549. Pius IV, however, convoked it again in 1562 in Trent and dissolved it in 1563. The result was the condemnation of all Protestant doctrines and the assumption of an aggressive attitude in every country. The doctrines of purgatory, the invocation of saints, and the worship of images and relics were reaffirmed. At the same time, the council abolished some crying abuses and brought in disciplinary reforms in regard to sale of indulgences, morals of convents, and education of clergy. In this and other respects, the Reformation produced a beneficial effect upon the Roman Catholic Church. There was no disposition on the part of the Roman Catholic Church to withdraw from even the countries whose governments had boldly committed themselves to the Protestant faith. The more devout minds in the Roman Catholic Church looked to the revival of the monastic orders as the most promising source of strength in counteracting Protestantism. The strict rules of the Franciscans were revived in the Capuchin order, founded by Matthew de Bassi. The main object was care of the poor and needy. Ochino of Italy was a Capuchin, but left Romanism and became a celebrated Protestant. The Carmelites were revived by Teresa of Spain. They devoted their attention principally to humane labors and the instruction of the young. The Cistercians were organized by Jean de Barriere. Neither these nor the restored old orders had any bearing on foreign missions, but were limited to the home field. The Theatines were founded by Gaetano de Thienne. Their chief objects were the care of the sick and criminals and the education of the clergy. Preaching was an important factor in their work. The Angelicas, founded by the Countess of Guastalla, devoted themselves chiefly to women. The priests of the Oratory, organized by Philip de Neri, were learned men for the most part and devoted themselves to biblical studies. The Barnabites were so called from the Church of St. Barnabas of Milan, which was given to them. The order was founded by Antonio Maria Sicaria. The Ursulines, a female order established by Angela of Brescia, applied themselves to the education of young women and to sufferers. The Brothers of Mercy were organized by John de Dio, a Portuguese. They devoted their attention to the poor and the sick. All these orders arose about the same time, during the former half of the 16th century. All Europe was covered by a new monastic network. No class of sufferers was overlooked. The hut and the palace were alike visited. This multiplication of societies of mercy and instruction showed the wonderful religious power which still lived in the old church. These energies seemed to be stimulated rather than weakened by the great Protestant defection. End of chapter 1《パート4》Chapter 2 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 2 
The Order of Jesuits. The Society of Jesus, or the Order of Jesuits, was the most powerful and far-reaching counteracting agency adopted by the Roman Catholic Church in this great crisis. It originated in the purpose to compensate, in distant lands, for the losses at home. But, secondarily, the order proposed to operate in all countries, even in the midst of those most intensely Protestant. The founder, Ignatius Loyola, born in Spain, 1491, was a soldier by profession, but, being wounded in battle, gave himself to religious meditation, and resolved upon establishing a new order, the Society of Jesus. He was general of the order. The members pledged themselves to poverty, chastity, and the will of the Pope. The order was confirmed by Paul III in 1540. Its avowed object was the care of the sick and the salvation of souls. The members divided themselves into the professing, the coadjutors, the scholastics, and the novices. They laid down as their ethical creed the doctrine of probabilism, mental reservation, the sanctification of the means by the end, and the distinction between theological and philosophical disobedience. This system was defended by their strong writers, Tolitus, Vasquez, Sanchez, Suarez, and Bussenbaum. Their political creed was the power of the people. They cultivated the republican element, and brought themselves frequently into collision with the rulers of the countries where they labored. The opposition to the Jesuit order arose among such rulers as found their authority and succession endangered by it. The climax was reached by the order about the beginning of the 18th century. The kings arrayed themselves against it, and the papacy was won over to their support. Benedict the Fourteenth began an attack on it, and Clement the Thirteenth suppressed it first in Portugal, where the Jesuits were banished in 1759. In France they were banished 1764, in Spain 1767, and in the Sicilies and Parma in 1767-68. In Germany there was no direct suppression, but the friends of the order were surrounded with serious limitations. In 1773, by the brief of Clement XIV, the order was abolished as a menace to the Church. But Pius VII restored it in 1814 by a decree, Solicitudo Omnium Ecclesiarum. The order speedily extended into various countries. The late Pius IX was devoted to its interest and gave it great prestige. The Jesuit missions were rapidly organized. The military character of the order, and the disposition to follow the lines of commerce, led it into all fields. A network was rapidly spread over Austria, Bavaria, Poland, the Baltic provinces, Sweden, and Great Britain. But these home missions were not of the striking character of the foreign ramifications. The lands of the long prostrate Eastern Church received early attention. Pius IV authorized Christopher Roderick, in 1562, to establish a mission among the Copts of Egypt. The Armenians also received prompt attention. The Nestorians had been divided, and their unsettled condition was an attraction to the order. Syrian scholars espoused their cause, but the mission failed despite all efforts. Abyssinia was also visited, where a mission under Beretas, with two bishops and ten Jesuits of inferior orders, was begun in 1554. This endeavor also failed because of the opposition of the Abyssinian kings. The commerce of the Portuguese in eastern Asia led to an important Jesuit mission in the new lines of trade. Francis Xavier landed at Goa in India in 1542. Bassein in the north and Goa in the south became the great distributing centers. Many churches were built around the western coast of India, and many thousands of the natives were baptized. Japan became an important field of Xavier's labors, where 40,000 natives were baptized in six years. China was also visited, and became a strong mission under Xavier's successors. 
the conditions for baptism were easy a slight disposition for renouncing heathenism was required many idolatrous practices were still permitted educational facilities for indoctrinating in the new faith were liberally provided the jesuits were successful in the philippine islands but failed in the carolines the beginning of the jesuit mission to brazil was made by king john the third of portugal who sent over emmanuel de nobrega and four other priests peter clave labored in the spanish provinces of south america where three hundred thousand negroes were baptized by him alone the paraguayan missions were very successful whole tribes were grouped into missions the guaranis were brought in by multitudes from thirty thousand to forty thousand families of these were organized into thirty-two towns the order now moved northward but with no loss of energy it had a mission in florida in fifteen sixty six and by fifteen seventy had another in chesapeake bay florida was abandoned mexico offering a more inviting field here cuno began in sixteen eighty three the french possessions of canada were overspread with a network of jesuit laborers the whole line of the st lawrence was followed westward which met the missionaries following the mississippi river from its mouth to its headwaters from mexico a chain of missions was extended northward along the pacific coast which extended as far as the columbia river but all known lands felt the impress of the tireless jesuit missionary feet an admiring poet levi bishop thus describes the boundless map of his labors with all his faults from pole to pole he spreads the truth and feeds the human soul in ethiop on chilean mount sublime in paraguay in congo's sunny clime in bactriana and in china far in japan's thousand isles in kafrara in california on the amazon in australasia by the oregon in nouvelle france in aztec mexico in iceland chill and wheresoe'er we go to earth's remotest bounds we find him there as a propagating force the jesuit order is the most powerful piece of ecclesiastical machinery ever organized by the roman catholic church its methods have varied with the environment the members have operated apart from diocesan limitations the authority for their work and for their field of operation comes directly from the pope no bishop can interfere with the exercise of their work the recuperative power of the order is an historical marvel banished or imprisoned to-day to-morrow it is again on the march and powerful alike in the audience halls of kings and emperors the repressive measures adopted by germany under the lead of bismarck after the close of the franco-german war in eighteen seventy one were in due time revoked the full favor now enjoyed by the roman catholic church in the german empire is most likely due largely to the careful and untiring labors of this order the present sympathy between the imperial court in berlin and the papal court in the vatican is an anomaly in ecclesiastical history the roman catholic members in the german parliament were needed to secure a majority for larger military armaments the price to be paid was the old liberty to romanism in germany the bargain was made and has been kept among the most conspicuous objects of the jubilee celebration of the present pope's entrance into the priesthood was the new tiara resplendent with precious stones it was the gift of the protestant hohenzollern the late emperor william to the friend of the jesuit order and the representative of roman catholic authority pope leo the thirteenth and was worn by the latter on this memorable occasion of his official career End of chapter two part four chapter three of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter three the english church under james the first and charles the first 
James the Fourth of Scotland became James the First of England, sixteen o three to sixteen twenty five. The destiny of English Protestantism had appeared so often to be dependent on the caprice of the ruler that both the dissenting bodies and the Church of England were anxious about the probable policy of the new king. It was understood that James, being a Calvinist in theology, would exhibit little sympathy with either the Roman Catholics or the new Church of England. But no man was ever wise enough to forecast the policy of James or of any other steward. With all his Calvinism, which he had brought down with him from Scotland to London, he was never known to show any favor to either the Puritans or the Presbyterians, but pursued the policy of conciliation towards the Roman Catholics in England and on the continent. Whenever there was any way to injure the dissenting bodies, he did not hesitate to do it. When Elizabeth was queen, the whole weight of her influence was given in favor of the struggling Protestants on the continent. Her aid to the Dutch, in their struggle to throw off the Spanish yoke, was one of the most brilliant deeds in English annals. But James I, the wise fool of English history, courted the favor of Catholic Spain, and was willing to make any reasonable sacrifice in that corrupt political interest. Whatever would crush the Puritans at home, and help the Catholics abroad, and aid in thrusting on Scotland an Episcopal government, was his supreme pleasure. The only hope of the nation lay in Parliament. The dissenting bodies were protected by it against the constant scheming of James I. The majority of its members were Puritans, and were distinguished for intelligence and unconquerable devotion to the liberties of the people. They knew how to watch the king with keen vision. The Puritans had little to hope from James I. The Presbyterians, however, had been his devoted friends. But for their uniting with the established church in aiding towards his securing the English crown, it is not at all likely that he would ever have sat upon the English throne. They were willing to accept a moderate episcopacy, and had full faith in James I. But he betrayed them. When on English soil he showed no regard for them, and never seemed to remember his obligation to their loyalty. The work with which James's name will be forever and honorably associated is the so-called authorized English version of the Bible. This was a revision of the Bishop's Bible, 1568, and was begun in 1607, finished in 1610, and published in 1611. It was the work of 47 scholars, 54 were originally appointed, divided into six companies, of which two met at Westminster, two at Oxford, and two at Cambridge. The work of these separate committees was afterwards supervised and brought into regularity by six persons, two from each company. Although it bears on its title the words, Appointed to be read in churches, there appears no record of any royal or exclusive authorization. It won its way at length, though against much opposition, on the strength of its own intrinsic merits. It finally superseded the Genevan Bible, which had hitherto been the most popular English version, and it has ever since been the Bible of the English-speaking race. The purity and simplicity of its style, the beauty, vigor, and charm of its diction, and its general accuracy have endeared it beyond measure to the hearts of the people. The crisis of religious oppression was reached on the reign of Charles I, 1625-49. His policy towards Catholicism was little better than that of James I. No one knew what a day would bring forth. The wife of Charles was a devoted French Catholic, and she controlled his foreign policy. His claims of extreme royal power increased with his years, and his measures became oppressive to both the conscience and the political liberty of the people. The Court of High Commission and the Star Chamber were tyrannical measures to carry out his will against the voice of the people. He saw no need of a parliament. He persecuted the Puritans at home, 
and in his sympathy with the catholics of france sent help to louis the thirteenth in sixteen twenty five to aid him in wrestling rochelle out of the huguenot hands when parliaments were called which would not obey him they were dissolved between sixteen twenty five and sixteen twenty nine three parliaments were convened and because disobedient to the behests of charles the first were disbanded his cruelty to the puritans his despotic measures to raise money without authority of parliament his violent efforts to enforce the liturgy of the established church on scotland and the invasion of england by the army of scotland led to an extended civil war on the battle of marston moor in 1644 where oliver cromwell commanded the left wing the loyalists were defeated in 1645 at the battle of nazeby where charles i commanded in person and cromwell commanded the left wing of the scotch army the king was overwhelmingly defeated he was tried by parliament and was executed in 1649 the successive failures of absolutism and catholic allegiances augured well for the full establishment of protestantism and religious liberty in england one of the most notable events of the reign of charles was the convening of the westminster assembly the parliament proceeding in its independent course and without regard to the wishes of charles i ordered an assembly to meet in 1643 it continued in session until 1647. It is known as the Westminster Assembly. The Presbyterians were in the majority. The object of the convention was to reach some doctrinal formula which should express the Presbyterian doctrines, and also to aid in securing the adoption of the covenant by which both England and Scotland should adopt the Presbyterian polity. The Westminster Confession the longer and shorter catechisms and the directory of worship were adopted and parliament endorsed these measures as an assembly for the statement of christian doctrine the westminster divines performed acts which have had ever since a most important bearing on the whole subsequent history of the church but as a political force the effort to introduce the presbyterian polity throughout england was a failure End of chapter 3part 4 chapter 4 of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 4 the english puritans the early church revolt against rome was the real origin of the later puritans and all of the nonconforming bodies of england in the fourteenth century there had been strong tendencies among the more devout to protest against all superstitions and ritualistic practices the movement crystallized in the lollards under wycliffe as leader when the reformation on the continent was in full force these people who seemed to see in the new protestant church which henry the eighth would give to england but little improvement on that of rome organized themselves into a society which bore the name of the christian brethren they did not break with the established church but held themselves in reserve to await events cambridge became their chief centre but the movement soon extended to oxford the sources of puritan strength were very important and were to be found for the most part on the continent the writings of luther and melanchthon were translated into english and read with avidity calvin by an industrious correspondence was of most valuable service he boldly wrote to the king and to the protector somerset and to cranmer his letters furnished powerful artillery for the puritan campaign erasmus lived some time in cambridge and the weight of his influence though without purpose was with the puritans the prestige of foreign reformers led to their being called to both the english universities peter martyr the pietro vermigli of italy became a theological professor at oxford martin Bousset of switzerland at cambridge and ochino of italy a canon of canterbury 
the indirect result of all these foreigners in england was against all the prelatical and ritualistic tendencies in the church of england as organized by henry the eighth and wrested from rome by him as king edward the sixth gave all promise of favoring a simple ritual and granting to the puritans a full recognition but he died after a short reign mary succeeded him she aimed at the total overthrow of protestantism death or banishment of all leading protestants was the new order elizabeth succeeded her and followed closely in the path of henry the eighth the return of the exiles was a powerful accession to the puritan party banishment had taken them to geneva frankfurt and other continental cities where their associations were with the reformed and where they adopted all the tastes of calvin fuller says they brought nothing back with them but much learning and some experience they no sooner landed in england than they began a vigorous fight against what they believed to be the fearful formalism of the church of england the thing which they attacked with most vigor was the robes or habits worn by the clergy the strife bears the name of the habits controversy the protestants declared that the compulsion to wear a certain kind of vestment was a violation of true liberty and was nothing less than a continuance of romanism the strife was bitter but the term was a misnomer behind the protest against a certain robe was the entire mass of ceremonials which the puritans opposed in sixteen sixty two the act of uniformity was passed which gave the puritans no chance according to this act all ministers must use the book of common prayer and must declare their public assent to the same book a like assent was required of all heads of colleges and schoolmasters it was a bold attempt to banish all dissent and liberty of worship in the kingdom as a consequence more than two thousand ministers were turned out of their parishes they were thenceforward called in many cases by the broader term of nonconformists in fifteen sixty six they formed themselves into a separate body and boldly advocated the throwing off of surplices and all the ceremonial reminders of the church of england the queen and her parliament resisted every measure adopted by the nonconformists a presbyterian church was organized in surrey near london in fifteen seventy two but was suppressed the new high court of commission was the government's formal method of dealing with all puritan measures their meetings were broken up their books were prohibited and imprisonment became the order robert brown was one of the most ardent puritans his followers were called brownists they were driven out of the country settled in holland and became the nucleus of the pilgrim fathers who landed in new england in sixteen twenty End of chapter 4part four chapter five of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter five the quakers the rise of the quakers was due to a latent spiritual desire to return to the primitive christian faith the long conflict between the episcopalian and the dissenting bodies promised little for the growth of christian life among the people they labored in the same general direction with the puritans and presbyterians all alike were nonconforming but they had no visible connection with any religious body and kept aloof from all political relations they increased with great rapidity their heroism was of the loftiest type the persecutions visited upon them nerved them for more daring deeds of faith and patience george fox born sixteen twenty four was the founder of the quakers or friends he was profoundly convinced that the office of the holy spirit was largely neglected and that in this regard the church had wandered from its original faith he began to preach his doctrines throughout england and many flocked to his standard he gathered his followers from every class the beautiful and calm life of his disciples 
their devotion to the fundamental Christian doctrines, and their heroic meeting of persecution, gave them an additional charm. Soon there were Quaker preachers on the continent as far east as Hungary. They spent but little time in answering the slanders of enemies. Their chief concern was a spiritual reformation of all Europe. While the principal part of the theological system of the Quakers related to the offices of the Holy Spirit, they laid emphasis on other doctrines. The divine sovereignty, the need of constant prayer, the duty of meditation on divine things, the certain general judgment, the necessity of peace and good will, the refusal to take up carnal weapons, the impropriety of oaths, and the choice of the ministry without regard to sex, were matters of fundamental importance. The persecution of the Quakers in England was violent. No class of dissenters was visited with such gross treatment. Even the women were not spared. Many Quakers were driven out of the country. Many who remained were imprisoned and persecuted. A strong reinforcement came to the body by the accession of William Penn. He was the son of an English admiral. He secured the right to a large tract of land in America, which still bears his name, Pennsylvania. The settlement in Pennsylvania under Penn occurred in 1682. Many of his co-religionists in England, with others from Germany, came to America. But even here they met with cruel oppression everywhere except in Penn's colony. Their experience in two towns in New England was of a piece with their tribulations elsewhere. Old Newbury had her fields a tongue, and Salem's streets could tell their story of fainting women dragged along, gashed by the whip accursed and gory. Though small in numbers, the Quakers have exerted a strong influence on the development of Christian civilization. Never were the rights of conscience more bravely asserted than by the original friends, and they have constantly labored for the amelioration of suffering and the abolition of injustice. They have been the bitter enemies of the slave trade, and the great trials of Penn and Mead in 1670 at the Old Bailey Courts, quote, will forever remain as noble monuments of their resistance to the arbitrary proceedings of the courts of judicature and the violent infringement of the privilege of jury. End quote. Many reforms in the treatment of the prisoner and the insane may be traced to their enlightened and uncompromising advocacy. They were the first to set on foot many movements, the beneficent results of which have spread far beyond themselves. End of chapter 5part four chapter six of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter six cromwell and the commonwealth cromwell was born in fifteen ninety nine being connected by blood with the family of thomas cromwell earl of essex prime minister to henry the eighth he was educated at sydney sussex college cambridge and on his father's death settled down to farm his own lands. He appeared first in public life as a member of Parliament as early as 1628. He had been much with the Puritans, and imbibed their principles and shared their hostility to Romanism. His appearance was plain and ungainly. He was clad in rustic and unfashionable attire. Sir William Harwick says of him, that he was inclined at first to treat him with contempt, but, quote, I lived to see this gentleman, by multiplied successes and by more converse with good company, appear in my own eye of a comely presence and a great and majestic deportment, end quote. Another of his contemporaries speaks of him in this picturesque language, quote, He was a strong man in the dark perils of war, in the high places of the field, hope shone in him like a pillar of fire when it had gone out in all others end quote. the execution of charles i was not the destruction of the royalist cause 
nor was the new parliament a unit in support of cromwell though he repeatedly refused a crown even the simple authority which he exercised as protector of the commonwealth was in constant danger charles the second son of charles the first fled to the continent and joined his mother in paris the scotch parliament was devoted to the house of stuart but the scotch were still more attached to liberty they were willing to have charles the second back again and so put an end to the commonwealth but they wanted to be sure of his conduct charles the second was proclaimed king by the scotch parliament in sixteen forty nine but it was only quote, on condition of his good behavior end quote, while the covenanters required him to sign articles of repentance he was willing to submit to indignity provided he could gain his father's crown the army which gathered about him was defeated by cromwell's army at worcester in 1651 charles escaped to france cromwell was now supreme in the land in 1653 he entered the house of commons and dissolved it in these words you are no longer a parliament in 1654 he was formally proclaimed protector of the commonwealth england's position was now entirely new while cromwell was intensely puritan the puritans did not know how soon the day of retribution would come to them all classes looked upon the period of his protectorate as a mere armistice in the hot warfare but the six years which elapsed between the proclamation of cromwell as protector and the entry of charles the second into london as king or from 1654 to 1660, was a period of intense fermentation. Never, in the annals of the world, have events moved with more astounding dispatch or the seeds of liberty ripened with greater rapidity. The colonies in America were rejoicing in their first lessons in religious liberty. The Protestants on the continent, who had ceased to look to England for sympathy and help, now turned again with confidence cromwell's great name commanded respect from calais to constantinople catholic kings feared to maltreat their protestant subjects for they knew not at what hour an english army by cromwell's order might invade their realms foreign rulers craved alliance with him when spain applied to become an ally cromwell demanded as a condition that the inquisition should be suppressed no ruler was ever more unjustly censured by his contemporaries but no hero ever moved more steadily on the path of duty to his own conscience and to the oppressed of all britain milton who knew him on all sides of his majestic character paid this just tribute to him cromwell our chief of men who through a cloud not of war only but detractions rude guided by faith and matchless fortitude to peace and truth thy glorious way hath ploughed and on the neck of crowned fortune proud hast reared god's trophies and his work pursued while darwen's stream with blood of scots imbrued and dunbar field resounds thy praises loud and worcester's laurel wreath yet much remains to conquer still peace hath her victories no less renowned than war milton served oliver cromwell four or five years as his latin secretary while he is known to the world as the greatest epic poet produced by england and the author of paradise lost he was distinguished during the stormy period in which his life was passed sixteen o eight to sixteen seventy four as the strongest defender of liberty in the land his words for liberty were as powerful as cromwell's sword strokes his areopagitica or plea for unlicensed printing was the blast of a trumpet in favor of political and religious liberty some of his other prose works were of hardly less value as an educational force for the future of the anglo-saxon race in all lands and for all times of his prose writings macaulay says quote, they are a perfect field of cloth of gold the style is stiff with gorgeous embroidery 
grave doubt was manifested on the appearance of the paradise lost in sixteen sixty seven when fifty nine years of age he sold the copy of this immortal work to samuel simmons for five pounds but with the provision that the sum should be doubled after thirteen hundred copies should have been sold he received the remaining five pounds however but it required eleven years for the publisher to dispose of three thousand copies at the restoration his prosecution as a defender of the protectorate was ordered but he escaped by the passage of the act of oblivion he died in sixteen seventy four what was of use to know what best to say could say to do had done his actions to his words agreed his words to his large heart gave utterance due his heart contained of good wise fair the perfect shape milton had been a sufferer in many ways and blindness was added to his other afflictions his supreme ambition was to help the english people to larger liberty we know him best as poet but the world will love him most as an heroic defender of human rights end of chapter six part four chapter seven of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seven the church during the restoration in sixteen sixty charles the second was welcomed to london the people gave him a cordial reception once more the religious uncertainty appeared the contrast between the simplicity and seriousness of the protectorate under cromwell and the kingdom under charles the second was great the new king married catherine of braganza the daughter of the king of portugal this being a roman catholic alliance all the old fears of sympathy with that communion were aroused the people did not have to wait long for royal developments among the most powerful agencies in bringing charles the second to the throne must be reckoned the presbyterians the scotch were devoted to his interests they could not believe that the time would ever come when their loyalty would be forgotten or visited with stripes but they were dealing with a treacherous steward charles the second placed them and the puritans in the same category for condemnation as the sworn head of the church of england he was compelled to give open favor to it but it would seem that in heart he was during the most of his reign a roman catholic he confessed towards the end of his life that he had been secretly received into that church in sixteen sixty two an act of uniformity was passed which required all ministers of english churches to receive episcopal ordination to adopt the use of the book of common prayer to pledge support to the church of england to discontinue to support the covenant and to profess adherence to the principle that under no circumstances was it lawful to take up arms against the king the enforcement of episcopal ordination drove two thousand preachers out of their pulpits immediately the episcopal form of church government was forced upon all england scotland was compelled to submit to the same yoke the presbyterians were persecuted without mercy a mile act was passed by which no minister refusing to be episcopally ordained could live within twenty miles of his former parish or within three miles of a royal borough the conventicle act which was adopted in sixteen sixty four was the culmination of violent proceedings it was hoped that if a law could be enacted by which nonconformists could be prevented from assembling for worship the whole population might be made conformists the conventicle act forbade the assembling for worship of more than five persons the slightest pretexts were adopted for imprisonment no clergyman refusing to sign the act of uniformity could even come within five miles of a borough or corporate town a system of espionage was adopted which for rigidity and minuteness could hardly have been surpassed by the ingenuity of an oriental prince the hostility of the classes during this reign increased in intensity the nonconformists were divided among themselves 
one party hoping for the best and willing to compromise with a view to even the least advantage the other party headed by the puritans were determined to accept no moderate concessions they were ready to go to prison but not to surrender to corrupt masters the king had proved unworthy of the crown he wore and of the people over whom he ruled his court was corrupt his alliance with louis the fourteenth was bought at the price of a promise that england should become a roman catholic country and that parliament always an inconvenient thing for absolute rulers would seldom be called on for its valuable services the war with the dutch was a failure without honor abroad and with dissension at home and the most conscientious people in the land in prison or in danger of it england was a pitiable spectacle her king was her curse charles the second had made some concealment of his roman catholic sympathy but his brother james the second on coming to the throne in sixteen eighty five had nothing to conceal he was an outspoken romanist he was true to england as against the french but this was the only commendable characteristic of his foreign policy he spared no pains to punish the nonconformists for their attitude of defiance the members of the church of england had no confidence in him they knew he had no friendly feeling towards them and would willingly surrender every church in the land to the roman priesthood his court of high commission was organized to carry out his plan to crush every sign of dissent throughout the land here the infamous lord jeffreys impaled for all the future by macaulay's pen was called to preside his name has become a synonym for cruelty and injustice and must ever remain a foul blot on english history his administration was destitute of a single mitigating element and hastened james the second to his merited ruin james the second in due time lost all his supporters there was no class of protestants which had the least affection for his person or respect for his authority or confidence in his justice the people in this wretched condition turned towards holland william prince of orange had married mary the daughter of james the second he was an intense protestant and represented in his own person the traditional dutch love of liberty and devotion to protestantism the revolution of sixteen eighty eight took place william and mary were invited to assume the throne and accepted the invitation amid the rejoicings of a redeemed and loyal people england for the first time was a protestant land of the devotion of all later sovereigns to protestant interests there has been no serious question asked or doubt expressed End of chapter seven part four chapter eight of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eight english deism early traces of unbelief in england can be found as far back as the beginning of the thirteenth century when the middle ages came to a close there was a strong sympathy with the free thinking of italy the humanism which was patronized cordially by the medici of florence and by the papacy and which elevated the masterpieces of greek and roman literature above the scriptures and theological writings found its strong supporters on the banks of the thames cambridge and oxford were busily engaged in utilizing the results of the new italian love for classical learning when the reformation came all other interests fell into the background the people divided into two great bodies the new protestant church of england and the old roman catholic church then the protestant dropped into two great divisions the independents or nonconformists and the conforming church of england when these adjustments had taken place the great bodies began to move on in a regular career the new philosophy of bacon and locke while abounding in practical strength was not without injurious effect upon evangelical christianity it was without proper safeguards otherwise it might have become a tower of strength to christianity 
it gave great prominence to nature and to natural laws, and allowed too small a place for the operation of the divine. By his doctrine of ideas, and by the absence of spiritual elements in his philosophy, Locke, though himself an earnest Christian, stimulated the skeptical reasoning of Voltaire and Condillac, and is charged by some with being both logically and historically the forerunner of Hume. English deism was characterized by an absence of mystical and speculative elements. God was recognized as existing, but not imminent in nature and government. The following was its creed, so far as it had one. When the natural order of the universe was first established, everything was in force which was necessary for human development. Christianity is not at all a necessity. All the good which we find to obtain in Christianity existed originally. It is only a republication of the first order. Revelation is not only not a divine thing, but is positively superfluous. There is no such thing as a recreation of the moral nature of man. His highest development is the result of the happy growth of his native forces. The deistical writers were a remarkable group. They were distinguished for rich talents, wide and varied learning, and for a large measure of moral earnestness. The first of the group, Lord Herbert of Cherbury, was a devout and earnest Christian. He claimed to have received a special divine communication authorizing him to publish his plea for a deistical faith. With Herbert, however, we find the last trace of an intense spiritual element in English deism. Not one of the entire group was of that satirical and flippant spirit for which the French school, beginning with Voltaire, was distinguished. The period of deism extended from the middle of the 17th century to the last quarter of the 18th. After Herbert came, successively, Blount, Shaftesbury, Collins, Mandeville, Woolston, Tyndall, Morgan, Chubb, Bolingbroke, Hume, and Gibbon. Of all the deists, Hume exerted perhaps the most pernicious influence. In his essays, he made miracles the object of his special attack. His History of England, which, as he had prophesied, was read like the newspapers, gave him a wide celebrity and created a broad field for his opinions on miracles. Many of the writings of the deists were translated into the continental languages and circulated widely. They were cordially welcomed in Germany, where, owing to the general religious decline, there was an atmosphere ready for their reception. The English deists, on this new field, exerted a great influence in preparing the way for the reign of rationalism. Between the deists of England and their brethren in France, there was a profound sympathy. Much of the material which had been published by the English writers had been borrowed from the French, but had undergone a process of filtration by passing through the serious English nature. The evangelical opposition was by no means wanting. There was an array of deistical learning, a persistence in the methods of attack, and a sanction of the aristocracy of the country, which gave to the new movement a remarkable degree of strength and success. So soon, however, as the evangelical mind of England awoke to the danger of this new foe, it adopted measures of defense. Deism was attacked on every side. The work of evangelical resistance had to be shaped according to the assault. Where the Gospels were assailed, their inspired origin was urged and proved. Where Hume endeavored to pull down the fabric of miracle, Paley, in his Evidences, 1794, strove to furnish a new support. Baxter, Boyle, Sherlock, Leland, Warburton, and Lardner may be regarded as representative writers in reply to the deists. The most powerful argument, however, and the one against which the deists never rallied, was Butler's Analogy of Natural and Revealed Religion, 1736. 
the new wesleyan movement lying in the twofold department of practical life and theological discussion excited a strong influence towards the final arrest of deism the masses had become thoroughly saturated with the unbelief which constantly grew grosser and more after the french type the preaching of the wesleys whitefield and their adherents reached the popular mind and proved a powerful factor in leading it back to a taste for spiritual life. The North American colonies very promptly responded to all the intellectual movements of France and England. The deists had their sympathizing friends in the new land. Many of their works were promptly republished in the obscure towns of the colonies, and awakened an interest in the subject if they did not win adherents. Tom Paine gained a wide popularity by his tracts in behalf of the independence of the colonies. He was a deist, but reflected rather the coarse and bald French infidelity than the circumspect and learned deism of England. End of chapter 8「Part Four, Chapter Nine of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nine: The Protestant Church in Germany. The charge which Bosnet made against Protestantism had all the semblance of truth so far as the German Protestants were concerned, but he overlooked one thing: that when a great system of superstition and false teaching is to be attacked, the assailants do more effective work when they attack on different sides and with a combination of varied views. The reformers differed fundamentally as a result of varied spiritual experiences and mental characteristics. But in all essentials the reformers were a unity, from Geneva in the south to Stockholm in the north, and from Dresden in the east to Scotland in the northwest. The curse of the varied Protestantism of Germany lay not in the thing itself, but in the wretched abuse. That Luther and Zwingli should differ seriously on the doctrine of the Lord's Supper was not a serious factor. The truth would have been found by patience and devout study on the part of their successors. That the doctrine of election should excite antagonism among the reformers was most natural but the spectacle was pitiable when those who inherited the great work of the reformers lost sight of the spirit and wrangled wildly over the letter. The controversies which arose within the Lutheran fold were as numerous as they were trivial. The antinomian controversy arose with John Agricola, while Luther was yet alive. He held that the laws of Moses were intended chiefly for the Jews, the adiaphoristic controversy began immediately before Luther's death. It turned upon what might be brought over from the Roman Catholic Church, the use of candles, gowns, holidays, and the like, and proposed concessions on several doctrinal points. The synergistic controversy had reference to the relations of divine grace and human liberty in the salvation of the soul. The Osiandric controversy, arising with Osiander, was a strife on the relation of justification to sanctification, or the meaning of justification in relation to the righteousness of Christ. The crypto-Calvinistic controversy turned upon the proper interpretation of the Lord's Supper. The syncretistic controversy was the best of all. It was a warfare, with George Calixtus as the leader, in favor of harmonizing all disputants on the basis of the Apostles' Creed. The Lutherans were the chief losers by these violent dissensions. The sections were arrayed against each other. There was no opportunity to make new advances against Romanism. The most of the vital force of German Protestantism was consumed in undesigned efforts towards suicide. With the Reformed or Calvinistic body, the case was different. The disciples of Calvin moved steadily on in their course. They followed the line of the Rhine, planting their doctrines on either side, and, after giving Holland their theology, proceeded to England and thence to the New World. 
there could be but one moral result to the prolonged strife, a great spiritual decline. For about one century, or down to the close of the Thirty Years' War in 1648, the strife of words and terms had been in progress. All the functions of the church had been neglected. The pulpits were occupied by warriors, who fought as though the fate of the world depended upon the verbal form of a doctrinal statement. Practical religion was forgotten. The press teemed with angry theological diatribes. When the Thirty Years' War closed, with all its waste of life and treasure, the land was ill-prepared to meet the spiritual or material needs of the crisis. Even today, the slow progress of orthodox regeneration in the German church is one of the dark legacies from the wild controversies of three centuries ago. End of chapter 9「Mysticism in Germany」There had been indications, even during the Reformation, of the reappearance of the old mystical spirit which had been so beautifully illustrated at an earlier day in the career and spirit of John Tauler and Heinrich Suso but the animation and excitement of such a period as witnessed the genesis of protestantism was not favorable to the calm and meditation of the typical mystic mysticism however much it may wander from safe paths when fully mature begins its career with the purest motives in its childhood it is always on the side of truth and wisdom one of the strongest protests during the controversial age was the rise of a new group of mystics. They declared against the universal corruption and the eclipse of the spirit through the wild search for the letter. They advocated the need of a new revival of faith in the invisible, a firm reliance on spiritual guidance, and a bringing back of the church to its purest conditions. Jacob Boehm, born 1575 and died 1624, was a plain Saxon shoemaker. He was not furnished with the culture of the universities, and yet by his original thought, pure life, and remarkably clear perception of the useless character of the controversies of his times, commanded the respect of learned and spiritual circles. In his indignation at the theological rancor which he witnessed, he came to regard the letter with too little favor. He looked upon the inspiration of the Bible as little different from that of the good man of all times, to whom God makes also special revelations. His aurora was his masterpiece. He declared that God made revelations to him in such a way that his motive to write was irresistible. He explains God's communications to him in these words. I have never desired to know anything of divine mystery, much less have I wished to seek or find it. I sought only the heart of Jesus Christ, that there I might hide myself from the anger of God and the grasp of the devil. Schlegel says that, compared with Klopstock, Milton, and even Dante, quote, Boehm almost surpasses them in fullness of emotion and depth of imagination, while in poetic expression and single beauties, he does not stand a whit behind them. End quote. John Arndt, the author of True Christianity, was less mystical and more practical than Boehm. They were ranked together. In general spiritual influence, the classification was just. In his True Christianity, he made a strong and bold attempt to divert the attention of the whole Church of Germany from the disputations and speculative theology of the times to sincere faith in Christ and devotion to his cause. This work produced a profound impression. It was entirely devoid of denominational coloring. Next to the Bible and Kempis's Imitation of Christ, it has had a wider circulation on the continent than any other work. It was early introduced into the United States and became a companion to the Bible among the Germans who followed Penn in planting and developing the colony of Pennsylvania. 
Gerhard was the spiritual son of Arndt, and did all in his power to perpetuate his work. He attempted to define the questions at issue among theological disputants, and to harmonize them. His chief work was Exegetical Explication of Particular Passages. He was revered by all classes for his profound learning and lofty type of piety. John Valentine Andrea labored in the same department. His keenest weapon was satire. He aimed to bring the still lingering traces of alchemy into contempt, but, incidentally, to show how ridiculous were the theological controversies which he witnessed. There was no immediate promise of permanent results from this mystical movement, but a spiritual phenomenon can never be judged without recognizing affinities and connections. There cannot be a question that the remarkable school of mystics, founded by Boheme, were the pioneers of the great pietistic reform. If they attached too much importance to some obscure parts of Christian doctrine, or elevated beyond measure the inward spiritual vision, or saw dimly some of the fundamental doctrines of revelation, it must be admitted that from the sixteenth century to the eighteenth they were the real bearers of spiritual truth as Luther and Melanchthon had seen it and experienced its power. The vessels may have been somewhat archaic and rude, but the treasure which they contained was priceless. End of chapter 10part 4 chapter 11 of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 11 the 30 years war the lutherans made little headway south of central germany while the reformed not only held switzerland and south germany but as we have seen occupied holland the great original leaders left no successors equal to their task. The second generation of continental Protestants were men who could see differences better than points of unity, or even of resemblance. All the sharp antagonisms of the first half of the sixteenth century became still sharper during the latter half. All possible energy was needed for the work of building up the new cause, but much of it was wasted on internal strife on election, consubstantiation, and other doctrines. Even the Protestant princes joined in the bitter struggle. The reformed prince in the Palatinate felt the throbs of his theology so keenly that he persecuted his Lutheran subjects, while a Saxon prince visited the same harsh measures on his reformed subjects. In Sweden, all Protestants who would not accept the Augsburg Confession were banished the country. In striking contrast with the division of the Protestants was the unity of Roman Catholicism. The Great Reformation had thrown it on the defensive. From Rome, as a center, to every part of the vast domain of the old church, the word was given to combine and to keep in perfect harmony. Well was the command obeyed. From the humblest mendicant monk to the Pope himself, there was one solid front against the new Protestantism. But, despite the divisions of the new generation of Protestant leaders, and the unity of Romanism, the Protestants were yet strong enough to threaten the possession of the greater part of central and southern Germany. The larger part of Bavaria was Protestant, a tide which later turned and left that country, ever since, one of the strongholds of Romanism. The antagonisms between the Protestants and the Roman Catholics grew more obstinate every day. In due time the issue was clearly seen. The combat could not be confined to books and pamphlets and councils and the universities. The field of politics was entered. The rulers saw in the heat of the times opportunities for larger territory, and, at the same time, the risk of losing what they had. Every political question had to take on a religious character. The strife went so far that the soldier was now ready to take up the cause where the theologian left it. The Roman Catholics looked after the thrones, 
and succeeded here where protestants failed from either inertia or want of vision the elector of saxony furnishes an example the natural head of the protestant party in germany says macaulay he submitted to become at the most important crisis of the struggle a tool in the hands of the papists the same author gives the following terse description of the fidelity of the roman catholic rulers to their cause Quote, maximilian of bavaria brought up under the teaching of the jesuits was a fervent missionary wielding the powers of a prince the emperor ferdinand the second deliberately put his throne to hazard over and over again rather than make the smallest concession to the spirit of religious innovation sigismund of sweden lost a crown which he might have possessed if he would have renounced the catholic faith in short everywhere on the protestant side we see languor everywhere on the catholic side we see ardor and devotion end quote. the thirty years war opened in sixteen eighteen and closed in sixteen forty eight in sixteen o nine the emperor rudolph the second granted liberty to the protestants of bohemia but his successor matthias prohibited the erection of a protestant church the bohemians declared the act a violation of the imperial liberty and resorted to violent measures the result was a victory over the protestants the war was now in full force the roman catholic rulers combined against the protestant the time during which the war lasted the number of contestants involved the countries devastated by it and the strong element of religious feeling which pervaded the whole struggle made it one of the most consuming and terrible wars in all history gustavus adolphus king of sweden took the lead of the protestant forces wallenstein the greatest general on the continent was at the head of the catholic league gustavus adolphus was intensely religious and regarded the war as holy his soldiers were accustomed to march to victory while singing luther's martial hymn ein feste burg est unser gott and that beautiful hymn composed by gustavus adolphus himself beginning fear not o little flock the foe who madly seeks your overthrow dread not his rage and power what though your courage often faints his seeming triumph o'er god's saints lasts but a little hour gustavus died on the field of lutzen in the hour of victory in sixteen thirty two the war came to a close by the peace of westphalia which was concluded by a double congress in munster and osnabruck in sixteen forty eight the territorial gains lay with the roman catholics but the protestants of central germany secured religious freedom in bavaria and bohemia protestantism was blotted out while in hungary only one half the protestants remained the palatinate later in sixteen eighty five was turned over to the rule of the catholic house of newburg both sides claimed the victory such as it was there was no direct parceling of the territory or changing of dynasties it had been a war of extermination and where the population was catholic or protestant and was extinguished the territory seemed to lie in the main with the conquerors the south remained catholic while the north was protestant the protestant rulers were granted rights as electors and both the lutheran and reformed bodies had the right of public worship and the exercise of all the functions of great religious bodies the territorial frontiers of protestant and roman catholic countries were so firmly defined that they have remained nearly the same down to the present time end of chapter eleven part four chapter twelve of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twelve the protestant emigration to america in no european country was the reformation effected and protestantism permanently established without the bloody ordeal of persecution in some instances the penalty was imprisonment 
but death often came too promptly to admit of escape to another country. Whenever a little time was allowed the persecuted, it was industriously used to get out of the country. The persecution always took the form of both political and religious oppression. The rights of person were destroyed. The thin pretext was zeal against a false religion. The underlying charge was disloyalty to the ruler and treachery to the laws. In all cases, the great hope of the oppressed in the old world was to find a safe and final home in America. The Spaniard had opened the country to the world. All Europe was filled with glowing accounts of the vast wealth on the western continent. The wars between England and Spain made England an enemy on every sea. Many of the long voyages of English captains were only a diligent search for Spanish galleons laden with the treasures of the mines of Mexico and South America. But the persecuted Protestants saw in the new lands of the north a larger field, and indulged a greater hope than had inspired the Spanish conqueror and ecclesiastic in the south. When the English furnace of persecution was thrice heated, there came out to this new continent Puritans, Presbyterians, Baptists, and Quakers. From France there emigrated Huguenots. From Sweden there came many to the banks of the Delaware, who built up a flourishing colony bearing the name of New Sweden. The religious interest prevailed in this important settlement. The Dutch, now in the first glow of relief from Spanish oppression, settled on the banks of the Hudson, the Passaic, and the Mohawk. The principal Roman Catholic currents of immigration were to Canada, Maryland, Florida, Mexico, and South America. In South America, the colonies proceeded from Spain and Portugal, while the Roman Catholic immigration to Canada was from France. End of chapter 12「Part Four, Chapter Thirteen of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Thirteen: Arminius and the Synod of Dort. Holland became an important scene of theological activity. No more certain was the flow of the Rhine from Basel to the sea than was the theological current from Geneva to the Netherlands. Calvin ruled as thoroughly the theology at the mouth of the Rhine as on the shore of Lake Geneva. But there arose among the Dutch strong evidences of divergence. During the last thirty years of the sixteenth century, there were decided premonitory symptoms of an approaching storm. James Arminius headed the reaction against extreme Calvinism. He was born in 1560, studied theology under Beza at Geneva, and returned as preacher at Amsterdam. He became professor at the new University of Leiden, where he came into controversy with Gomerus. Gomerus represented the Calvinistic theology, while Arminius opposed election and gave a large place to the operation of the human will. Soon the entire country was involved in the controversy. The Armenians and the Gomerists divided the church and the country between themselves. Theological terminology was bandied about with amazing zeal. The quiet Dutch burgher talked theology with as much ease as he rode his boat or watched his windmill or smoked his pipe. After the death of the powerful disputants, the animosity lost none of its heat. It was now not a question of the university or the quiet homes within the dikes, but of the states general. The terms Arminians and Gomerists were now too limited. They disappeared beneath the broader ones of Remonstrance and Contra Remonstrance. The Arminians were charged with being disturbers of the public peace. They presented to the states general a protest against the five articles of the Gomerists, which had been passed for their acceptance. Whiten Bogart and Episcopius, after the death of Arminius, stood at the head of the Remonstrants and fought their battle bravely. The States General ordered a discussion of the points at issue in 1613, but the effort at conference was fruitless. 
the field of politics was now invaded by the rival parties maurice of nassau thought he saw that by identifying himself with the contra remonstrance he could gain supreme power the remonstrance saw very early his ambitious designs and opposed him with all their power john olden barneveld and hugo grotius opposed him but they failed the former being executed and the latter imprisoned it was now a question of suppressing the remonstrance they had strength among the people but the whole machinery of the government was turned against them the contra remonstrance saw that the day of peace was still far distant they therefore succeeded in calling a synod through which it was hoped the armenian theology might at last be put to rest for ever the remonstrants were at a disadvantage from the very start and were summoned as defendants they were denied seats in the council and were treated throughout as accused parties the synod began november thirteenth sixteen eighteen and continued until may tenth sixteen nineteen holding one hundred and eighty sessions the main point at issue election was not permitted to be discussed at all the most able reformed theologians of europe were in attendance fifty-eight from holland twenty-eight from england and scotland and others from the palatinate hesse nassau switzerland east friesland and bremen episcopius represented the remonstrance at the twenty-second session he with twelve others appeared by request to defend their tenets he gave an eloquent and vigorous address explaining the remonstrant positions a protracted discussion followed continuing to the fifty-seventh session the remonstrants being all the time excluded from the floor the contra remonstrants were victorious the result was that the government abided by the decision of the synod when the remonstrants were condemned and banished from the country under henry frederick however the successor of maurice milder measures were adopted but the dutch theology remained strongly reformed end of chapter 13part 4 chapter 14 of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter 14 the salzburg persecution the lapse of the german church because of the controversies was deplorable the palatinate presented a dark picture of conflict between the protestants and roman catholics while the protestant bodies were almost as bitterly arrayed against each other in east prussia and poland the jesuits were very aggressive and persecuted the helpless protestants but the age of martyrdom had passed the free spirit of the new age had so far advanced that only in secluded places could persecutions be perpetrated in the austrian province of salzburg in the noric alps there had existed for a long time a quiet and earnest little body of protestants the surrounding population was intensely roman catholic repressive measures were adopted and the salzburg protestants in due time found the alternative presented either to undergo absorption into the romanism about them or to leave the country the heroic protestants took the covenant of salt and resolved on no surrender the archbishop of salzburg showed no leniency the result was banishment the protestant salzburgers now began to leave their beloved homes in the alpine mountains and on the broad and romantic plains of the valley of the salsa they gathered their wives and children and set out on a pilgrimage seventeen thirty one to thirty two they knew not whither they went northward their progress was slow for they proceeded on foot their few possessions were left behind them it was a wonderful picture of fidelity to religious convictions whenever they passed through a protestant region they were hospitably entertained the sick were cared for and all were supplied with the necessities of life when fully recuperated they again set out on their pilgrimage for liberty 
in berlin they were kindly received by the prussian elector in time they separated some remained in prussia others went to england and some emigrated to america the emigration to america was the most notable result of the salzburg oppression in austria a company settled in georgia near savannah and established themselves in a beautiful and industrious colony their chief pastor was bolzius and ulsberger was their historian the latter kept a journal of the development of the colony and his account still preserved but very difficult to procure is one of the most remarkable records of a patient pure and uncomplaining religious body in the whole history of the christian church when john wesley went to georgia to labor as a missionary among the indians he found these salzburgers among his warmest supporters while whitefield in his efforts to build an orphan house derived important help from their kindly sympathy and active aid end of chapter fourteen part four chapter fifteen of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter fifteen spenner and pietism when the thirty years war closed the people seemed as far off as ever from all true appreciation of their spiritual need most of the great national visitations have resulted in a return to a deeper religious life but in this case there were no traces of compensation the bitter controversial spirit which preceded it had produced its natural harvest of worthless tares besides there was a universal material waste the cities of germany lay in shapeless heaps churches castles and private mansions had fallen a prey to a war in which all the passions had full play many towns were as though ploughed and sown with salt the people were decimated the men of middle life had never come back from battle the most of the population now consisted of the young the old and the women these were sadly neglected the pastoral care throughout germany was now in the main only a delightful memory from the olden time the clergy of the period had no conception of the sanctity of their calling when the guns of war had ceased to fire the artillery from the lutheran and calvinistic camps was again drawn out and made to do the same service which it had done down to the outbreak of the war the leader in the spiritual awakening of germany was philip jacob spenner who was born in alsace in 1635 he began his career as preacher in strasbourg his eloquence was remarkable such as to both multiply his hearers and to lead them to a higher religious life he denounced the spiritual decline of the church and called the people back again to the old religious life which had marked the first stage of the reformation he depicted the wickedness of the generation notwithstanding the severe devastations of a terrible war with an eloquence which bordered on the fervor of a peter the hermit and the lofty spiritual enthusiasm of a towler in sixteen sixty six he moved to frankfurt where he became pastor of the oldest lutheran church he now began to influence the public mind in new directions he organized his collegia pietatis or meetings for instruction in the bible and a general religious life he published a book the pia desideria or pious desires in sixteen seventy five which exerted a powerful influence and led many to become christians he removed from frankfurt to become court preacher in dresden and died in berlin in seventeen o five spenner's relation to the religious life of europe was very important here was one who followed closely in the path of providential guidance when at strasbourg as a student he had no distinct notion of his latter career his tastes and time were absorbed in the study of heraldry but he was deeply spiritual and held himself ready for any path into which the divine hand might lead from his entrance upon the ministry 
his sympathies were tender and deep towards children. He saw the great possibilities of their nature, and spared no pains, as he gained in influence, in building them up in the knowledge of the scriptures and an intense religious life. The Bible classes which he organized at Frankfurt spread into other parts of Germany, and became the greatest force of the times in leading back the German church to a knowledge of the scriptures. Spenner was a man of such magnetic nature that, apart from the originality of his methods, it is not strange that a school should arise to follow him. From his writings and general work, the pietists arose. The name was given in derision, as Brownists, Methodists, Quakers, and the rest, but was accepted most readily and is retained until the present time. The pietists never seceded from the Lutheran church. They were simply an ecclesiola and ecclesia, a little church in a large one. They consisted of small devout circles who gave themselves completely to works of practical piety and the study of the Bible. The most important organized result of the pietistic movement was the founding of the Halle University, 1694, it was the educational response to the demand for a new spiritual life throughout Protestant Germany. The theological faculty were representatives of Spener. Of the three members composing it, Frank, Anton, and Breithaupt, the first was by far the most influential. Halle became a great pietistic center. The students were devout and were thoroughly educated in biblical knowledge. Frank taught that without works, faith is dead. He gave himself to the religious education and physical care of children. He founded the orphan house at Halle. He made no direct appeals for help, but through the care of the institution on the voluntary offerings of Christian people. Gifts came in from all directions. From the lowliest appointments at first, the institution took shape and finally became one of the most renowned humane organizations in the world. Large buildings were erected, such as lodging places for the students, while a publishing and printing house was established to aid in the support of the orphanage. From this place the celebrated Kanstein edition of the Bible was printed the first endeavor towards the now vast system of the cheap printing and publishing of the scriptures. Kanstein, a German nobleman, originated the idea of an edition of the German Bible, Luther's translation, which could be sold at just enough to cover the mere cost. The Kanstein Bible has been printed in vast numbers and is still a favorite with Germans. The religious spirit pervading the Halle University went out in every direction. Frank's orphan house was in no wise connected with the university, and was located in the suburb of Glaucha. While he had a constant oversight over the orphanage, Frank never neglected the spiritual and intellectual interests of his students. He labored unweariedly for their religious development and theological training. Naturally enough, they imbibed his spirit. Various benevolent institutions, founded since Frank's time, seem to have arisen through the example of the orphan house at Halle. Even the present vigorous orphan house of George Mueller in England is one of the many institutions which are modeled after that of Frank in Halle. Down to the present time, the Halle institution has continued its prosperous and beneficent existence. The opposition to pietism began to develop before Spenner's death. The formal element in the church confronted him on every side. He made religion too serious a thing to be compromised by worldly amusements and a gay social environment. The ecclesiastical proprieties were violated by him. He introduced too many new measures to satisfy the notions of churchly correctness. Schalvig, Karpsoff, Alberti, and the Wittenberg faculty opposed him with books and pamphlets, and endeavored to destroy the popular confidence in his work. Pietism, like all great religious movements, suffered less from its enemies than from itself. Under Spenner as founder, 
and Frank as his successor, the movement was in a healthy condition and gained new adherents constantly. But with the death of Frank, it passed out of the practical into the theosophical department. Arnold succeeded Frank and exhibited traces of a departure from a healthy view of the religious life. His History of the Church and Heretics was a plea to show how much the church owes to the men who have departed from its standards. The close study of the scriptures was not continued by the new pietistic generation. The subjective element gained strength as the objective declined. The low water mark was reached in Peterson, who traveled through the country, accompanied by his wife, and professed special illumination. The cause now lost the respect of many of its best friends. There has never been a revival of the pure and vigorous pietism of Spenner's day. It still exists, chiefly in South Germany, and yet it is neither of the Spenner nor of the Peterson type. On the other hand, the present pietists consist of highly cultured and aristocratic circles, who are within the church, but make foreign and domestic missions their chief object of endeavor. They have no aggressive power, but seem well aware of their own elevated social position. End of chapter 15「Part four, Chapter sixteen of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter sixteen The Moravians A really pure and salutary religious movement never dies. All who profess it may burn at the stake, but their cause will reappear elsewhere. The seed is sure to produce a hundredfold. The followers of John Huss, who was burned at Constance, were persecuted and driven to the Moravian Mountains in northern Bohemia. They lived there in great seclusion and simplicity for several centuries, strictly adhering to the doctrinal standards of the first generation of Hussite reformers. In 1722 a colony of these devoted Christians emigrated to Saxony. They were under the leadership of Christian David, and carried with them, as the basis of their union, the dear old Hussite doctrines. Count Zinzendorf gave the emigrants a cordial reception. He was a thoroughly spiritual character, having studied at the grammar school at Halle, where he came under the influence of the devoted Frank. His theological education was in Wittenberg. His mother was his exemplar, and inspired him with much of that intense enthusiasm which distinguished his whole career. He had already travelled largely before the Moravian Christians arrived, and was keenly alive to the religious wants of the countries through which he had passed. He gave David and his associates permission to settle on his estates, and donated to them a large tract of land. Their settlement was called Hernhut, the Lord's Hat or Protection. Here a town was built, the outlying forests were felled, and low lands were drained. The community established industries which have continued to the present time. Hernhut became not only the industrial center of the Moravians, but the heart of their religious life. Here Zinzendorf established himself, and from this place he set out on his long journeys, and hither he returned to direct the life of his companions in faith. Homes were set apart for the needy, and a theological school was established where missionaries were trained for service in far-off regions. Then, when the missionaries were aged and far spent, they returned to the beloved place to spend the small remainder of their days. This beautiful life of Hernhut has been maintained to this day. It is still the Moravian Mecca. When the Moravians established themselves in Saxony, they adopted a new form of ecclesiastical life. They called themselves the Unitas Fratrum, or the United Brethren. Their leading doctrinal writer, Spangenberg, wrote the Idea Fratrum, or the Idea of the Brethren. No new separate confession was adopted. 
the standard of faith consisted of the main features of other evangelical bodies there was intense application of christian fellowship the body was a carrying out of spenner's idea the church within the church its members had free choice between the old moravian confession as laid down in the church discipline of zerovice of sixteen sixteen and the two leading protestant confessions of germany the reformed and the lutheran strong emphasis was laid on the sacrificial death of christ the fatherhood of god was absorbed in christ in missions lies the field of the grandest moravian achievements zinzendorf regarded the work of the brethren as twofold to quicken the religious life of churches already existing and to carry the gospel to regions where christianity was unknown in this great duplex interest he travelled through various parts of the continent striving everywhere to impart a new life to the stagnant churches in scandinavia holland england and various parts of germany he visited america and made bethlehem pennsylvania the centre of operations moravian missionaries established societies in the west indies in greenland on the labrador coast in the caribbean islands and in india this missionary life has been steadily maintained down to the present time moravian missionaries have gone into the far-off regions of the earth and by their scholarship have made important additions to our acquaintance with the obscure languages Jashke's tibetan english dictionary for example recently issued in london is by far the best contribution of any time to our knowledge of the language spoken by the people living north of the himalayan mountains End of chapter 16part four chapter seventeen of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter seventeen swedenborg and the new church the spiritualistic element in the system of emmanuel swedenborg born sixteen eighty eight was a reaction against the gross materialism of his times the swedes were not given to speculation but were cool and careful thinkers adhering to the lutheran standards and giving but little attention to theological discussion the formalism of german protestantism was imitated not only in sweden but throughout scandinavia the new movement under swedenborg was in antagonism to the general religious life of the country but to this day it has never gained any real strength even in stockholm where swedenborg was born and where he elaborated his system there was nothing in the early years of swedenborg to give any indication of his latter position in the modern church his tastes were scientific he devoted himself to chemistry and other studies and became assessor of the swedish mining college he was an industrious author in mathematics natural philosophy mechanics and botany his economy of the natural world was an important contribution to the studies of the exact sciences he suddenly emerged in a new character taking science as a basis he engaged in religious speculation and hesitated not to treat the past the present and the future with equal daring in due time he discarded the scientific basis from which he had started and his religious speculations showed no trace of close reasoning having but little hope for the acceptance of his opinions by any considerable number of his countrymen he left stockholm for england here he gained a wider following though his opinions were derided with equal vigour by both the sceptics and the orthodox his literary labours were enormous the new church which arose from his opinions was furnished at the start with a theology prepared by him to which no important accessions have come since his death in seventeen seventy two swedenborg claimed to have the power of penetrating the spiritual world and of comprehending with minuteness the character of the future he believed firmly in rewards and punishments 
and held that the vocations of the present life are to be continued in the future, but with increased enjoyment or suffering according to the deeds done in this life. He rejected the doctrine of divine satisfaction. His view of the scriptures was that they are a gross representation of the divine will. Here Swedenborg was a mystic, for he claimed that there was a spiritual insight which could largely supplement the Bible. Swedenborg prophesied that between the years 1780 and 1790 there would be a great enlargement of the new church. Here he was correct. Many followers grouped themselves about the new theories. Dr. John Clois exerted a great influence in their favor, and sundry societies arose in their interest. The writings of Swedenborg were translated into German, and gained a good number of adherents in various parts of Germany. In Poland and Hungary, societies were organized. However, in all these countries there was no common bond of unity. Each society was left to develop itself as it saw best, and the result was that there was no general unity of faith, each interpreting the matter as it pleased, and wandering at will from the original standard. Some societies have arisen in the United States, especially in Boston, Philadelphia, and Cincinnati. The Book of Worship and Liturgy of the New Church is used by all of them, but the theology is varied. The Swedenborgian adherents in the United States deviate widely from the evangelical confessions and belong to the group of liberal Christians. They are distinguished for their humane sympathies and advanced culture. End of chapter 17part four chapter eighteen of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter eighteen rationalism in germany the open door for skeptical theology in germany in the early part of the eighteenth century can be clearly seen pietism had failed to produce any general impression on the religious life of the people it had so declined as to lose the favor of many of its warmest admirers. It ceased to attract even the pious. There was, besides, a decided disposition on the part of the more orthodox to ignore the progressive character of theology and to neglect its adaptation to the advance of modern science. Again, many who loved the sanctities of religion and believed firmly in the supernatural origin of Christianity, saw a lamentable stagnation in the theology of the period, and were thereby alienated from sympathy with the church. Besides, they were disgusted with the controversies between the Reformed and the Lutherans, and saw in the intense confessional spirit no hope for a brighter day. The result was a religious indifference, the ready soil for a skeptical sowing. There was a singular combination of negative tendencies. All the skeptical currents of Europe seemed to concentrate upon Germany. The philosophy of Leibniz, especially as carried forward by Wolf, was of the mathematical type. Truth must be proved to be truth. If the proof is wanting, the proposition may be rejected what cannot be demonstrated may not be true. This philosophy was reverent and had its good side, but applied to the scriptures has a most dangerous character. Wolf, who taught in Halle and had a large following, popularized Leibniz, carried his premises to unwarranted conclusions, and made the mathematical proof of all spiritual truths the demand of the common people. The very peasant soon talked of the new Illuminism, and proclaimed loudly that what the reason cannot accept need not be accepted. The deism of England was rapidly transferred to Germany, and, with German adaptations, soon became incorporated with the new rationalism. The philosophy of Descartes, combined with the more decidedly negative system of Spinoza, found each its warm admirers east of the Rhine. French atheism had but a short march to the heart of Germany. 
Frederick the Great represented in his own person the German craving for French models. He had no respect for his own language, and wrote in bad French rather than in good German. He surrounded himself with the leaders of the new skeptical tendency of France. Voltaire was a member of his court, and gave tone to the thought of the nobility of Germany. The chief agent for introducing the new rationalism directly into the domain of theology was Semler. He was a devout man, and in his life represented a pure type of Christian experience. He propounded the accommodation theory, which represented the gospel history as an adaptation to the times of our Lord, and therefore that due allowance must be made in accepting the Gospels for mistaken conceptions of real occurrences. Lessing, in his Wolfenbüttel Fragments, denied the authentic character of much of the Mosaic narrative. He, more than any other writer, was the pioneer of the revival of German literature, and because of his negative view of inspiration, contributed largely to the committing of the new and aspiring literary circles of Germany to a skeptical interpretation of the scriptures. Nikolai, an enterprising publisher of Berlin, issued a series of works called The Universal German Library, in which he gave full play to the rationalistic writers. The whole tendency of his library was to undermine the supernatural character of Christianity. The Weimar celebrities of a somewhat later date, Weiland, Schiller, and Goethe, were justly ranked in the same category. Herder, also one of the Weimar magnates, was a clergyman, and did much to clothe the Old Testament with a living reality. But, Herder accepted, the influence of the Weimar school was negative. The general position of the rationalists was antagonistic to the orthodoxy of the period. There was no subject, however sacred, which was not treated by them. The Bible was the center of attack. The reason was made the umpire in all matters of faith. The very existence of God was subject to its iron method of deciding the truth. Inspiration was reduced to impression. The fall of man, miracle, the person of Christ, and even rewards and punishments, came in for a severe decision of human reason. The whole land was covered with the new literature. It became a passion of the times. The universities were arsenals for the warfare on the sacred standards. So industrious were the apostles of rationalism in propagating their opinions, that it was not long before the very peasantry were indoctrinated. The mechanic and the plowman were made familiar with the sovereignty of reason, and, for the first time since the Reformation began, the Bible was laid aside in palace and in hut. End of chapter 18「Part Four, Chapter Nineteen of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Nineteen The Evangelical Reaction. The need of reaction can be best seen in the extent to which rationalism has reduced all the strongholds of aggressive Christianity. The preaching had undergone a sad degeneration. The most of the pulpits were occupied by clergymen who had discarded the fundamental truths. The typical sermon was on the value of a general charity, the advantage of good agriculture, the care of bees, the duty of the citizen, and similar collateral themes. The supernatural element in the Christian religion was entirely overlooked. To this came the adulteration of the pure and earnest hymns of the earlier period. The references to Christ were expunged from many of them. New hymn books were the order of the day. These rationalistic surgeons cut all the flesh from the old familiar hymns of church and home. The general ecclesiastical life underwent a great decline. The benevolent spirit languished. The application of rationalistic principles to education resulted in the banishment of the Bible from the school 
and the ignoring of religious teaching as a necessity for the young. The general tendency of the new education, under the lead of Pestalozzi, Bart, and others of the school, was to leave out the spiritual element. The plan, carefully followed, was to bring out what was in the child, and not to introduce even the general revealed truths until the judgment was mature enough to apply to them the tests of human reason. There has always been a strong sympathy between the rationalistic school and philosophy. The origin of rationalism, in the Leibnizian and Wolfian systems, will account largely for this affinity. But a closer relationship has been brought about by the latter independent schools. Kant, born 1724, the author of the Critique of Pure Reason, and during his long career a professor in the Konigsberg University, contributed greatly to the expansion of the fundamental principles of rationalism. He did not design it. He was no slave to the system, but because of the large place which he gave to the dominion of reason in matters of faith, the result was inevitable. Much of his teaching, however, was favorable to the orthodox view of Christianity. His disciples went further than himself in asserting the independence of reason, and the general effect of the master's labors in philosophy was unfavorable to evangelical Christianity. Fichte, born 1762, was the first great teacher of philosophy in the Berlin University. He was a sincere patriot, and contributed largely to revive the hopes of the German people, and to animate them with a spirit heroic enough to throw off the Napoleonic supremacy. He was one of the distant, but helpful, victors of Waterloo. Schelling, born 1775, was professor in the Munich University. His philosophy of nature was quite apart from the rationalistic sphere, he clothed the study of philosophy with a subtle charm, which attracted wide circles of cultivated people in various parts of Germany. Hegel, born 1770, was the last and most creative of the group since Kant. His system is very contradictory. The right school is more nearly orthodox, while the left approaches pantheism so nearly that it is difficult to detect a difference. These schools have undergone fundamental changes, and are fast giving way to more recent views. Schopenhauer, born 1788, became the apostle of the latest pessimism. Schleiermacher, born 1768, was the transitional character from rationalism to evangelical theology. He started out from the principle that religion has its fundamental position in the spiritual nature, and therefore that reason can be in no sense an infallible umpire in matters of faith. His was a magnetic nature. He succeeded in imparting his fervent spirit to a large number of young men who became leaders in the revival of orthodox theology in Germany. Neander, Ullmann, Dorner, Tischendorf, Tholuck, Hengstenberg, Lang, Julius Mueller, and others constituted a constellation of evangelical minds who were called the Mediatory School because they found a common ground on which religion and science could stand. Pressense in France and von Oesterzee in Holland reflected their spirit and have contributed largely towards the propagation in both these countries, of an aggressive evangelical theology. End of chapter 19。Part 4, Chapter 20 of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter 20 French Mysticism and Flemish Jansenism. Modern mysticism in the Roman Catholic Church arose in the first half of the 17th century. It was a reaction against the strong military policy which prevailed. It represented a large number of devout Roman Catholics who saw in the outward strifes a disturbance of the religious life. 
St. Francis of Sales, who died in 1622, was Bishop of Geneva. He was a man of noble simplicity of character, but withal was practical, and succeeded in winning many Protestants to Romanism. His methods, it must be confessed, were not always the most scrupulous. In his Philothea he dwells on the vanity of the world, and contends for the absorption of the soul in God. A strong tendency towards mysticism, similar to that which arose in Spain before the Reformation, again developed in that country. It crystallized into an order, the Alambrados, or Illuminated. The leader of the Spanish mystics was Michael Molinos of Saragossa, who, after 1669, lived in Rome and died in 1696. He was an object of suspicion by the Jesuits and was condemned to perpetual confinement in a monastery. His spiritual guide of souls contained his chief opinions. His followers were called quietists. Antoinette Bonrignon of France adopted the fervid theosophic opinions of the Spanish mystics. Her opinions found great favor in Holland and Germany. Peter Poiret followed the same line. Madame Guillon was the leading French quietist. She died in 1717. She held that the human soul which loves God must be totally absorbed in him and have no will of its own. She traveled in various countries and found favor with many cultivated circles. She was persecuted in France and bore all trials with cheerful and calm resignation. She did not withdraw from the Roman Catholic Church, but was charged with heresy. Fenelon defended her against this charge, and for his pains was condemned by the Pope. Bossuet represented the interests of the Church. The purity of Madame Guillon's life, her patience in trial, and her cultivated manners gained the confidence of the multitudes. There are still traces in various parts of Europe of her profound influence in favor of a deep spiritual life. Cornelius Jansen, Bishop of Ypern in the Netherlands, died 1638, was a man of profound learning and pure life. He devoted himself to the study of Augustine, and in a posthumous work, The Augustans, he brought the doctrines of Augustine into a complete and strong system. He endorsed the doctrines of that father to the fullest extent. When the book appeared, it was seen that it was in harmony with the views of Calvin. That was enough to condemn it, and all who should accept its teachings. Jean de Vergier de Anran and Antony Arnold took up the Jansenist cause, while the Jesuits championed the opposition to it. Arnold had been an ornament of the Sarbonne, but was driven out. He went to live with his sister, Angelica, who was the abbess of Port Royal, a Cistercian nunnery near Paris. She was a woman of thorough piety and of great natural ability, and shared her brother's views. Port Royal now became the great Jansenist center. People of learning and piety flocked thither from many parts of Europe. It was a stronghold, not of Augustinism simply, but of devout piety and consecrated learning. The most profound spirit developed by the Jansenist group was Blaise Pascal. He left the immediate points at issue between the Jansenists and the main body of Romanism, and addressed himself to an exposure of the whole Jesuit system. He assumed the name Louis de Montalte, and in his Provincial Letters, presented the most stinging and thorough attack which Jesuitism had ever sustained. The work was read widely. The Jesuits influenced the Pope to issue a condemnatory decree, which was done A.D. 1656. The result was an order of both the French king and the Pope that all ecclesiastics in France, and all nuns as well, must acknowledge the condemnation of Jansenism. All who proved rebellious were compelled to leave the country. They fled to Holland, and kept up their organization, and developed a retired church life. The institution of Port Royal was suppressed in 1709. The Holland community consists of an archbishop of Utrecht, 
twenty-five parishes and thirty clergy. They send their elections to the Roman see for acknowledgment, but they receive no recognition from the Pope. They occupy a singular position midway between Romanism and Protestantism. They received unexpected support from the old Catholic defection, to which they gave sanction by consecrating a bishop. End of chapter 20「Part four, Chapter twenty one of Short History of the Christian Church by John Fletcher Hurst. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty one French Infidelity. The eighteenth century in France brought nothing with it but disaster. Had the Protestants been treated with even moderate cruelty, the country would still have been enriched by their pure life and industrious habits as artisans the world has never had superiors to the french huguenots the words with which longfellow refers to the art of policy are a fit description of the huguenots love of liberty not only in france but wherever the fortunes of exile have borne him turn turn my wheel the human race of every tongue of every place caucasian coptic or malay all that inhabit this great earth whatever be their rank or worth are kindred and allied by birth and made of the same clay the persecution of the protestants by the french kings with the powerful example of such gifted and relentless prime ministers as richelieu and mazarin brought into the eighteenth century an inheritance of evil which there was no hope of resisting while voltaire lifted his strong voice in favor of toleration the main force of his example and writings was towards the infliction upon france of the stronger tyranny of infidel antagonism over both christianity and the creeds and members of the church other forces cooperated in making more successful voltaire's propagation of skeptical opinions jean jacques rousseau of switzerland wrote his rhapsodical novels and disseminated a loose communistic doctrine which spread over france like wildfire the school of encyclopedists headed by d'alembert holbach helvetins and others gave a learned air to the growing infidelity and made it more attractive to germany and england as well as to certain cultivated classes in france no evangelistic forces were invading france on the contrary the french spirit was itself the great propagating force in europe great britain was thoroughly invaded bolingbroke was a fit reflection of the general spirit voltaire was a welcome guest on the banks of the thames eastward in germany the same offensive devotion to the french infidelity prevailed in all the courts the french language was preferred all the fashions had to be french frederick the great's welcome of voltaire to his court was only a royal expression of what was the universal german rule the revolution of seventeen eighty nine was the natural result of the volcanic forces of the two preceding centuries the persecution of the protestants on the one hand and the most violent and elaborate sceptical system which the christian world had ever witnessed on the other were the two great forces which precipitated the french revolution if one desires to see what persecution and scepticism when they once join hands can do he needs only to look at that crisis of license fury and blood there was no leniency shown towards the church whether roman catholic or protestant talleyrand the chameleon of his age who was equally at home with revolutionists the bourbons or napoleon was the leading spirit in opposing the church the people were clothed with the right of electing bishops and priests the national convention proclaimed france a republic in seventeen ninety two the abolition of the roman catholic religion and the execution of louis the sixteenth followed as a matter of course the sabbath was abolished and the week was lengthened into ten days reason in the person of a woman was crowned queen napoleon bonaparte was all things to all men that he might gain new power 
he made formal concessions to the pope but was careful to yield no imperial prerogatives he adhered to the old gallican freedom of the church from papal interference and disbanded the monastic orders a truce was patched up with pope pius the seventh who came on to paris in eighteen o four to crown napoleon emperor of france afterwards there was a long and bitter quarrel between pius the seventh and napoleon the pope was at one time a prisoner and his states annexed to france but after the battle of waterloo and the treaty of vienna matters took their old shape the pope entered rome and ruled the french church as before End of chapter 21part four chapter twenty two of short history of the christian church by john fletcher hurst this librivox recording is in the public domain chapter twenty two french protestantism from the revocation of the edict of nantes down to the beginning of the eighteenth century the french protestants led a miserable existence the exiles and deaths had so weakened them that of all parts of the protestant world this was the most hopeless in all the largely populated portions of france the protestants were treated as an inferior race the oppression was worthy of the roman emperors in the age of persecution the only part of the country where the old huguenot spirit dared to assert itself was in the southeast where the mountains of the cevennes afforded some slight protection against the oppressor the Camisards led in this reassertion of the old Huguenot spirit. They were a body of Protestants who were determined to regain their old rights. They were brave soldiers when fighting was necessary, but when preaching and praying were the order of the day, they were as fearless and devoted as the English Puritans in the time of the Brownists. It is not strange that they should have been superstitious and fanatical and should have seen visions and dreamed dreams the oppressed have always imagined that the veil between them and the supernatural was very thin and often entirely removed so long as the camisards were obscure and their movements confined to a local uprising they were safe but it was clear that they were kindling the old huguenot fire in other parts of france besides the dispersed french colonies in london and various parts of germany showed intense sympathy with their kinsmen at home and the entire movement was attracting general attention and assuming a european character the alarm at the french court was great louis the fourteenth determined to crush the camisard uprising at all hazards he sent soldiers to the cevennes who hunted down the camisards as if they were wild beasts the brave protestants resisted with desperate heroism and seemed to have no fear of death so violent was the war and so great the number of louis the fourteenth soldiers that the camisards fell hopelessly beneath the sword of the oppressor they were well nigh exterminated and when the dragoons returned to paris it appeared that once more the protestantism of france was finally crushed a protestant tradesman john callis with his family was the subject of a relentless local persecution his son in a fit of melancholy had committed suicide and his death was charged on the father on the pretext that the young man was about to embrace the roman catholic religion the passions of the people became aroused and the parliament of toulouse after an investigation condemned Callas to death, 1672. He committed no political offense, was devoted to his work as a merchant of small wares, and yet he was persecuted with as much violence as though a traitor to France. It was a case of unmitigated cruelty. The simplicity and purity of the man did not save him from bitter severity. But John Callas and his family became familiar names throughout Europe, it was a case where innocence cried to heaven for justice when the cry was heard every court in europe became familiar with the act of cruelty the whole protestant world declared against the crime 
after the protests of voltaire and others the paris parliament took up the case and completely overturned the decisions of the tribunal of toulouse declared cal as innocent restored the property to the widow but did not punish the infamous instigators and unjust judges of this horrible miscarriage of justice the hostility of voltaire to christianity is the predominant factor in his career but we cannot forget his efforts on behalf of toleration when the eighteenth century opened there was no one to speak a strong word for liberty europe lay prostrate in a despotism almost universal it was the darkest period in modern history since the dawn of the reformation the divine right of kings was the charm which excused every oppression protestantism in europe was on the one hand divided by violent controversy and on the other was indifferent and secular the anglican church was thoroughly honeycombed by the worldly spirit the french ruler therefore in persecuting the few struggling protestants was acting in harmony with the general temper of the times voltaire the negative figure of his times in all religious matters entered upon a crusade for liberty his tract on tolerance proclaimed the sufferings of callus and his family and proved a watchword of the century it was a rebuke of the sword as an umpire in matters of conscience there was not a throne which was not shaken by the little pamphlet all classes were aroused to a sight of the galling chains in which the continent lay a notable effect was seen in the changed policy of the french government the protestants were relieved of many of their disabilities and were granted liberties for which they had fought in vain the new order was now in progress the tide was reversed and every decade added not only to the universal thirst for religious liberty but to the possession of the great boon End of chapter twenty two